Life of Tony Stark Anthony Edward Tony Stark was a billionaire industrialist, a founding member of the Avengers, and the former CEO of Stark Industries. A brash but brilliant inventor, Stark was self-described as a genius, billionaire, playboy, and philanthropist. With his great wealth and exceptional technical knowledge, Stark was one of the world's most powerful men following the deaths of his parents and enjoyed the playboy lifestyle for many years until he was kidnapped by the Ten Rings in Afghanistan while demonstrating a fleet of Jericho missiles. With his life on the line, Stark created an armored suit which he used to escape his captors. Upon returning home, he utilized several more armors to use against terrorists as well as Obadiah Stane who turned against Stark. Following his fight against Stane, Stark publicly revealed himself as Iron Man. Welcome to the Amagi. In today's video, we're going over the life of Tony Stark. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. It's possible that YouTube has unsubscribed you from this channel in the past if you've been subscribed. Do us a favor and double check if you're still subscribed, even if you think you might be. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Early Life Anthony Edward Tony Stark was born on Friday, May 29, 1970 in Manhattan, New York City, to Howard and Maria Stark. Stark's early life was often dominated by the absence of his father, who he would later describe as both cold and calculating. Growing up, Stark had issues with Howard, who never told his son that he loved or even liked him. Since Stark was so young, Howard could not tell his son his plans for him. Howard constantly talked about his admiration for Captain America, which caused Stark to develop hatred and resentment towards the super soldier. On one occasion, a young Stark was playing with a remote control car when he accidentally drove the tiny toy into Howard's foot. Howard slapped it out of his hand in a fit of rage and told him not to have him deal with any nonsense. Stark ran outside and repeated that he wanted to go back to school. His butler, Edwin Jarvis, comforted him, saying that a father and son relationship is difficult to maneuver from both sides. On another, his father scolded him for playing with his toys on the Stark Expo map during Howard's filming of the advertisement. However, Stark had a loving relationship with his mother, who was more gentle and nurturing. He enjoyed hearing Maria play the piano. At a young age, Stark quickly stole the spotlight with his brilliant and unique mind. When he was four years old, he designed his first circuit board. When he was almost seven, he built a V8 motorbike engine. One thing about Stark's childhood that annoyed him was the nanny who cared for him until he was 14. Stark attended Phillips Academy in Andover from 1977 to 1984. While he was in high school, Stark hacked into the Pentagon on a dare by some friends. He was admitted into Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he met James Rhodes and they became lifelong best friends. At 16, Stark won the fourth annual MIT Robot Design Award. When he was 17, Stark graduated summa cum laude from MIT. Losing his parents In December 1991, when Stark was just 21 years old, Howard and Maria prepared to go away to the Bahamas for a few days over the Christmas holiday and leave him alone, although his father remained skeptical about how responsible Stark would be while they were gone. Minutes before leaving, Howard talked with Stark, who was outside getting a tan in the pool. Howard pushed his son to start doing things in life, but Tony pushed him away, saying that he has a plan. Edwin Jarvis reminded him that they needed to go. As Howard left, Tony slipped off of his raft into the pool. Sadly, the couple was assassinated by the Winter Soldier in Long Island, and Hydra covered up the incident to be a car crash, leaving Stark in grief and struggling to process this tragedy. As he stood before his parents' caskets, he said that this wasn't part of his plan. For a few months, Obadiah Stane took over as interim CEO of Stark Industries. Sometime later, Stark's long-serving family butler, Edwin Jarvis, also died. Rebuilding the company a few months later, still at the age of 21, Stark inherited Stark Industries and took over from Obadiah Stane, becoming the youngest CEO of a Fortune 500 company in history. Having built himself a custom mansion, Stark created an AI system that helped out in the house. He named the system, just a rather very intelligent system, shortened Jarvis, in tribute to Edwin Jarvis, whom Stark had often credited for helping to raise him. Eventually, James Rhodes joined the United States Air Force and became the liaison between Stark Industries and the United States Armed Forces, successfully earning Stark billions of dollars with military contracts. 
Under Stark's leadership with the aid of Stain, Stark Industries quickly thrived and became one of the most advanced companies in the world, creating new forms of weapons technology that seemed highly futuristic to most looking on at the weapons. Creating Demons On New Year's Eve in 1999, Stark, with his scientist paramour Maya Hansen, attended a science conference in Bern, Switzerland. There, Stark got so drunk he could barely give his speech on integrated circuits and rejoin the party as soon as possible. While celebrating, he met a scientist named Ho Yinsen, who introduced Stark to Dr. Wu, although he swiftly dismissed them both. While moving through the hotel with his bodyguard, Happy Hogan, Hansen, and a group of female attendees, Stark then arrogantly avoided a gifted but crippled scientist, Aldrich Killian, who wanted his financial backing for a scientific think tank, Advanced Idea Mechanics. Once they were alone in an elevator together, Stark then purposely told the excited Killian to meet him on the rooftop of the building to discuss him working with Stark Industries with the intention of never turning up, wanting to continue spending time with Hansen. Back in Hansen's hotel room, Stark looked at her new research into a project known as Extremis, which had the potential to regrow human limbs if she could get enough funding. Stark was amazed by the concept, although Hogan was less impressed and played with a nearby plant despite being told not to. Stark and Hansen then went to her bedroom where they continued flirting with each other before then leaning towards one another for a passionate kiss. However, Hogan inadvertently caused a small explosion by breaking a plant stem, causing a brief moment of panic. Stark sent Hogan away and then slept with Hansen, leaving Killian freezing and humiliated on the rooftop. Stark was unaware of Killian's suffering and woke up the next morning while Hansen was working. He completed her formula for her to fix the combustible glitch in Extremis before discreetly walking out and returning home leaving Hansen behind. Testing Weapons in Arizona In 2009, Stark and James Rhodes went to a weapons demonstration at the Yuma Proving Ground, where Stark showed off his product's Accelerated Wave Explosion Capability, or AW. Pepper Potts then gave the weapon specifics to the generals while Stark and Rhodes went to a nightclub. Stark enjoyed the company of two girls, Celeste and Eloise, while Rhodes tried to convince him not to go to Afghanistan for a demonstration of Jericho. While dancing, Stark was attacked by a man whose girlfriend he had previously seduced, but Rhodes was able to defeat the attacker. Stark declared that he would be alright in Afghanistan thanks to his friend having his back. Stark, Rhodes, and the girls then went to his mansion to continue their party. Final Day of Freedom After a presentation of Stark's successful past, James Rhodes was given the honor of presenting the Apogee Award to him at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. After Obadiah Stane gave Rhodes a signal saying that Stark was not there to receive it, he accepted the award in Stark's honor. Shortly after the award ceremony, Rhodes brought Stark the award while he was gambling in the casino inside of Caesar's palace. Rhodes got angry at him for not being present. Stark arrogantly accepted the award, but then handed it off to a man masquerading as Julius Caesar. Right when Stark was about to leave the hotel with his entourage, Christine Everhart ran up and tried to get an interview with him for Vanity Fair magazine. Having been told by Happy Hogan that Everhart was attractive, Stark agreed to her interview. He deflected her questions on the ethics of Stark Industries' weapons manufacturing with some swift quips. Upon being morally questioned, Stark defended his actions by bringing up his father's achievements in World War II and how the company's deals with the military funded much of its scientific breakthroughs. He then turned to seducing Everhart, and the two ended up at his mansion, where they slept together. Early in the morning, Stark left Everhart in his bed to be greeted by Jarvis and escorted home while he began working on one of his cars. Stark's assistant, Pepper Potts, later arrived in the workshop and reminded him about his trip to Afghanistan. Stark remained complacent, unfazed about being late as it was the Stark Industries' private jet and would therefore wait for him. Potts then discussed matters which required his attention a Jackson Pollock he bid on, the MIT commencement speech he was scheduled to give, and a form he needed to sign. When Stark complained about being rushed out, Potts revealed it was her birthday and she had already used his money to buy a present for herself from him, much to Stark's amusement. Finishing his coffee, Stark then finally left his mansion and drove to the Stark Industries Aviation Division, followed by his bodyguard, Happy Hogan, who struggled to keep up with his boss who drove exceptionally fast. He got to the plane three hours late and found Colonel James Rhodes was still there waiting for him to finally turn up, incredibly annoyed to have been left waiting for so long, although Stark was not bothered at all. He then got onto the plane and sat down along with Rhodes, who tried to discuss business between Stark Industries and the United States Armed Forces, while all Stark wanted to do was drink and relax, much to Rhodes' continued great annoyance. Despite wanting to discuss his work, Stark managed to convince Rhodes to have a drink with him, and before long, he and Rhodes had gotten completely drunk and held a small party on the plane. 
While Rhodes reminisced on his time in the United States Air Force, Stark completely ignored his friend and focused his attention on the air hostesses who had begun undressing and dancing around a pole in the middle of the plane for both of their entertainment. Presenting the Jericho Touching down in Afghanistan, Stark was greeted by members of the military before he presented Stark Industries' newest weapon, the Jericho missile, to the military spectators and demonstrated its capability. Giving a speech, Stark explained that the missile was so powerful that it would only need to be fired once to defeat the enemy, noting that was how his father, Howard Stark, had worked and that it was a successful method for all of America. The missile was fired and Stark received a round of applause from everyone. After the successful presentation, Stark had a drink, noting that the whiskey came with every order of the Jericho missile. While all of the various members of the United States Armed Forces celebrated the New Deal, Obadiah Stane called Stark to ask how it had gone, with Stark explaining that they would be getting an early Christmas. Stark got into a convoy vehicle to leave, sending James Rhodes to another Humvee to then go and return to their military base. As they drove down the road towards the military base, Stark sat with his whiskey as three soldiers sat with him in awkward silence and attempted to make small talk. Stark teased them, noting that he would never have guessed that the driver was a woman, as he was asked all about sleeping with various supermodels before he was asked to take a selfie. Posing for the picture, Stark muttered about loving peace while jokingly asking Jimmy not to make gang signs. Becoming Iron Man as Stark's convoy drove through Afghanistan to return to the United States Armed Forces base, they were suddenly attacked by insurgents who blew up the vehicle in front, trapping them. Stark watched in utter horror as the soldiers stepped out only to be gunned down right in front of his own eyes, leaving his ears ringing from the many explosions. While soldiers were dying around him, Stark rushed outside and attempted to find some cover and call for help. While Stark was using his phone in his attempt to contact someone for assistance, one of Stark Industries' own missiles suddenly landed right by him. Stark saw this and desperately attempted to get away, however he was too slow and the bomb exploded right beside him. The resulting blast caused Stark to be thrown backward and lose consciousness. The explosion embedded several pieces of shrapnel into his chest, several fragments dangerously close to his heart. While falling in and out of consciousness, Stark felt incredible pain as an operation was performed on his chest in an attempt to remove the pieces of shrapnel and save his life. Eventually, Stark dazed away to find himself in front of a camera as some various terrorists of the Ten Rings were now reading out a ransom note to an unknown viewer, while Stark could only look on in dismay with various guns aimed directly at him. The shock of seeing this made Stark lose consciousness again. He woke up sometime later to find Ho Yinsen in his cell in a cave with him and an electromagnet attached to his chest. Hooked up to a car battery, Yinsen explained that the electromagnet was keeping the shrapnel from entering his heart and killing him. Yinsen went on to explain how they had once met in Bern during 1999, although Stark had been too drunk to remember. Just as Stark questioned where they were, someone banged on the door from the other side. As Yinsen ordered Stark to get onto his feet, they were greeted by Abu Bakar, who had Yinsen translate, as he welcomed Stark as the greatest mass murderer in the entire history of the United States of America. Bakar explained that he now wanted Stark to rebuild the Jericho missile for him. However, Stark simply refused to help them. As a direct result of refusing to help the Ten Rings, Bakar had Stark tortured by waterboarding him repeatedly. Stark was then taken outside of the cave where Bakar showed him how the Ten Rings had an incredible supply of his Stark Industries weapons, including guns and missiles which were being used against the United States Armed Forces, which clearly horrified Stark. As Bakar continued his earlier conversation, he told Stark that they had all the materials needed for him to build a Jericho missile, promising that if he began immediately, then once he was done, he would be returned home. Stark agreed to the job, although he noted to Yinsen that Bakar would never actually allow him to get away, with Yinsen confirming that this was true, while Bakar smiled at them. While Stark sat by the fire and considered his new and terrible situation, Yinsen joined him and explained that what he had seen out there, with the Ten Rings holding his weapons, was the legacy of Tony Stark. When Yinsen called on him to do something, Stark simply questioned what was the point if he was likely going to be dead within a week regardless of anything, so Yinsen told him that this only meant it was an important week for him. Building the First Armor Knowing their captors would never keep up their end of the deal, Stark began the work with Yinsen. However, he had instead begun to make a plan to escape the Ten Rings base. Stark recruited Bakar to bring in the supplies he needed into their cave, using Yinsen as his translator while he began breaking all of the various weapons apart. In order to improve Stark's condition, he and Yinsen then created a miniature arc reactor, a smaller version of the same power source previously invented by his father, Howard Stark, and Anton Vanko. 
Stark concentrated on his own technical work, all while Jensen continued to tell Stark everything he knew of the Ten Rings and what their plans were for them. Having successfully built the Ark Reactor, Stark told Jensen that he would not be using it to power his heart, but to power something larger for a brief time. With that, Stark showed Jensen his plans, hidden with multiple blueprints, to build a suit of armor which he would soon be using to finally break them out of the cave and escape the Ten Rings base. Jensen was both impressed and inspired by Stark's plan, and then assisted him in installing the Ark Reactor inside his chest to supply energy to the electromagnet protecting his heart. During their downtime, Stark and Jensen played board games to keep themselves entertained. During one of their games, Stark asked Jensen where he was from, as Jensen explained he was from a small town called Gomira where he had a family who he intended to see once he was free from the base. When Jensen then asked the same question, Stark admitted that he had no family waiting for him, with Jensen noting he had everything, but yet still nothing. Stark and Jensen then returned to their work, pulling apart pieces of the various Stark Industries weapons that were supplied to them and tearing them apart. They then fused the pieces together and turned them into plates ready to be added to the armor once that was completed. However, the pair ensured that their work was still kept random enough that the Ten Rings would be unable to figure out their deception until it was too late. Their work was one day interrupted by Raza, the leader of the Ten Rings group who told Stark to relax before admiring his arc reactor. Raza compared Stark's work to that of Genghis Khan, who had almost conquered the world. Believing they were lying to him, Raza had Yinsen held down and threatened to put a red-hot coal in his mouth until Stark told him to stop. Raza agreed and then ordered Stark to finally complete the Jericho missile by the very next day. Fearing for their lives if they did not get out as soon as possible, together, Stark and Yinsen secretly began building the final stages of the armored suit to help them escape, while Yinsen wired up the final pieces of the mechanics. Fusing together the various large parts of steel to fit his own body, Stark then fitting the armor with various missiles and flamethrowers, preparing himself for every eventuality, as he knew Raza and the Ten Rings would put all their strength into stopping their escape. Once it was almost complete, Stark placed the still-steaming Iron Man helmet onto Yinsen's desk, and they prepared to finally put their upcoming escape plan into action. Escaping the Ten Rings Soon, the pair enacted their escape plan from the Ten Rings base, with Stark being slowly fitted into the armored suit while the power from the new arc reactor was being downloaded into the suit. However, the booby trap door the pair had rigged with an explosive was set off, killing all the men who had come to check on their progress. To his horror, Ho Yinsen realized that they now did not have enough time to power the suit before the Ten Ring soldiers would arrive and kill them. With no other choice, Yinsen took a gun and held back the terrorists while Stark's suit still continued to power up. Once the suit had power, Stark waited in the shadows as the Ten Rings terrorists arrived in the room and searched for them, at which point he revealed himself and used all of his new incredible strength to punch them across the room, with the armor being unaffected by their bullets. Stark began making his way through the cave, killing any Ten Rings terrorist he came across by striking them with his armor. When Stark accidentally trapped his metal arm in a rock-strewn wall, a terrorist attempted to kill him by shooting him point-blank in the head, only for Stark's helmet to deflect the bullet and kill the terrorist instead giving Stark time to free himself and continue forward on his escape mission. Coming around a corner near the exit, Stark was mortified to find Yinsen lying mortally wounded, having been shot multiple times during the escape attempt, before Raza fired a rocket launcher at his former hostage. Stark managed to dodge the shot and return fire, shooting a missile at the Ten Rings leader which caused him to be badly burnt and trapped underneath the heavy falling rubble. Stark rushed to Yinsen's side and urged him to get back on his feet so he could go to Gomira to be reunited with his family. However, Yinsen revealed his family was already dead and he would see them at last in the afterlife. Forced to accept the inevitable, Stark thanked Yinsen for everything he had done for him in saving his life, both physically and morally. With his last words, Yinsen reassured Stark that it would be alright to leave him behind and urged him not to waste his life. Angered by Yinsen's death, Stark stepped outside to confront the rest of the terrorists who were waiting for him. The suit protected him from the onslaught of bullets, and he then used the suit's flamethrowers to kill several terrorists and destroy their stockpile of Stark Industries weapons, which he despised from being stolen from him to be used against the United States Armed Forces, causing several massive fireball explosions to erupt all around him. Due to the massive amount of bullets being fired at him, the armored suit was eventually badly damaged by the gunfire forcing Stark to escape using the jetpacks while the entire base erupted in a massive fireball. Stark soared above the blast, though his suit began to fall apart and was finally destroyed as he crashed in the desert, although it still saved Stark from the impact. With no other need for it, Stark left the suit's remains in the desert. 
Stark began making his way through the desert, using his jacket to protect himself from the intense heat, until finally a United States Air Force helicopter flew overhead. Stark yelled out for help and collapsed to his knees, wearily making a peace symbol in the air. James Rhodes then rushed out of the helicopter with the military and the two friends embraced each other. Rhodes urged Stark to ride with him next time before taking him to safety. Upon being picked up by the Air Force, Stark was then finally returned to the United States of America at long last. No more weapons. Having been rescued, Stark was brought back to the United States by the Army where he was walked onto a military airport by James Rhodes. To Stark's disgust, there was a stretcher waiting to take him to the hospital, which he rejected. Stark then met with Pepper Potts, who he noted had been crying, teasing her as he claimed she was crying for her long-lost boss, while she claimed it was simply because she was glad not to have to find a new job. Stark then sat in Happy Hogan's car with Potts, who insisted that he go straight to the hospital to check himself over in the wake of his kidnapping. However, Stark once again refused to get any medical treatment, and instead asked to be given a burger, then called for a press meeting for Stark Industries. Potts argued that this was a very bad idea in the wake of his traumatic ordeal, but Stark still remained insistent, noting that he must get his cheeseburger first. Upon arriving at Stark Industries headquarters, Stark was then enthusiastically greeted by Obadiah Stane before making his way inside. During the press meeting, Stark finished his burger and compared his experiences to how he never got to say goodbye to his father, Howard Stark. Stark finally declared that his company would now, for the foreseeable future, no longer manufacture military weapons which Stain tried to slow down to the best of his own abilities. As their company's stock began to plummet, Stark had a meeting with Stain beside the giant arc reactor. Stain advised him to reconsider the decision as he feared it would ruin the company. Stark insisted that they should take another look at the arc reactor technology based on his work with Ho Yinsen, proving this theory by showing Stain the arc reactor in his chest that was now keeping him alive. Although Stain insisted that the arc reactor was designed by Howard and Anton Vanko as a publicity stunt, he eventually agreed to help Stark, provided he informed Stain of his next intentions before calling for sudden, unexpected press conferences. While back inside his Malibu mansion, Stark called upon the help of Potts to get rid of the expired arc reactor in his chest, as Dummy and Yu were unable to assist him. Although Potts was initially skeptical about the idea, she helped him at removing the arc reactor, although she accidentally put him through cardiac arrest briefly. Once they were finished, Stark told Potts he only had her to help, and told her to bin the reactor as he no longer had any more use for it. Stark went to meet with Rhodes who was giving a speech to new members of the United States Air Force. Stark interrupted the talk and teased his friend, who then ordered the men to leave them in peace. When Rhodes questioned what Stark was doing there, he was told that Stark was working on a big new project, which seemed to delight him until Stark revealed it was not military. Rhodes then recommended that Stark get his mind straight instead. Suit Upgrades in the months that followed, Stark retreated from public view and spent much of his time in his mansion, focusing on improving the design of his new armored suit, refining its size, movement, and flight capability far beyond the first design. Stark was aided in building the new suit by Dummy and Yu, who he had constantly mocked and insulted. Recalling how the first armor had almost no flight control and had crashed upon escaping the Ten Rings base, Stark decided to create a more controlled flight capability for his suit. He arranged a test with Yu filming and Dummy ready with the fire extinguisher in case anything went wrong. Stark proceeded with the test, and although he was only on 5-10% to power, he quickly discovered it was vastly more powerful than he expected, and he was launched straight up and painfully crashed into the ceiling, prompting Dummy to spray Stark with the fire extinguisher upon him landing on the ground, thinking he caught fire. Making some redesigns to the new armor, Stark developed new stabilizers that would attach to his hands and give him a new level of control while in the air. While testing out the new designs, Stark was visited by Pepper Potts, who mistakenly believed Stark was designing new weapons for Stark Industries, which he then denied, claiming that this design was not a weapon, but it was completely harmless. However, Stark had once again underestimated the power of the design, and a single blast from the stabilizer sent him flying backward, much to Potts' horror. Shocked by this, Stark noted he was not expecting that and began making adjustments. Stepping upstairs, Stark found Obadiah Stane had joined Potts for Pizza, having returned from a meeting with Stark Industries' board of directors. Stane informed Stark that the board had decided to block Stark out of the company in the wake of his kidnapping, believing he was now suffering from PTSD. Stark argued the decision but was told it was final, with Stane then requesting to take a look at the arc reactor technology, which Stark refused to do. 
Getting back to work, Stark had the second test of his new incomplete Mark II armor, with Dummy and Yu assisting him once again while Jarvis watched. Using a lot less power than his first test, Stark hovered around his basement, struggling to maintain any control and almost damaging some of his most expensive cars. Eventually, Stark ended the test and landed, ordering Dummy not to use the fire extinguisher on him before proudly declaring that he could now fly. Outdoor Test Flight Stark eventually perfected the flight power after much trial and error, taking the silver Mark II armor for its initial test flight as Stark put on the armor for the first time with great pride and excitement. Despite Jarvis' warnings that there had not been enough tests to be safe, Stark insisted upon being allowed to fly outside and fully test its true capabilities. Stark cheered in utter delight as he soared high across the sky over California and shouted out in gratification at his success, using the mask system to zoom into the city where a young boy looked on in amazement upon seeing Stark. However, when he pushed the suit to see how high he could fly in an attempt to beat the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird's record, he learned the suit would freeze at such a high altitude, which disabled its power. Stark fell from the sky, only being able to restart the suit moments before nearly hitting the ground with Stark exhilarated at avoiding such a near miss. Having gained all of the information about the suit's capabilities that he needed, Stark flew back to his mansion where he then prepared to analyze the data to use in the next design. Stark hovered over the entrance of the mansion and prepared to land softly on the ground. However, he did not account for the suit's extra weight and promptly fell through the ceiling, destroying his piano and sports car. Upon crash landing, Dummy once again sprayed Stark with the fire extinguisher, believing him to have caught fire upon impact, while Stark leaned his head back in both pain and frustration. Exploring his lab, Stark soon found that Pepper Potts had left a gift for him on his desk. Opening the box, Stark found his original arc reactor had been framed with an attached message saying it was proof that he had a heart. Obadiah Stain's Betrayal while giving Jarvis his plans to improve the Mark III armor in order to fix the icing problems and improve the flight controls, Stark noticed a news report in which Zoriana Kitt was reporting on a new charity event at the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which Stark was now supposedly hosting. Stark questioned Jarvis if he had been invited to the event, to which Jarvis then confirmed that he had not, so Stark left his AI to complete the Mark III while he got himself ready to attend. During his first public appearance since his return back to the United States, Stark arrived at his own party to be greeted by the press, having an attractive woman trying to speak to him, who Stark quickly dismissed as he did not remember her, before complimenting the watcher informant who he had mistaken for Hugh Hefner. Stark had soon found Obadiah Stane talking to the press as Stane expressed his surprise to see that Stark had arrived, advising him not to draw too much unwanted attention to himself as Stane was still trying to get the board of directors on their side. Stark promised to do so as he stepped inside the building, but Stane was unconvinced. Once inside, Stark met Phil Coulson, who introduced himself as an agent of the Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division, with Stark noting that the name of the organization was far too long, while Coulson noted that they were now planning on shortening it. The pair soon arranged to have a meeting to discuss all the events of his kidnapping, but Stark was still not paying very much attention to him and told him to arrange it through his own team. Stark, however, was too distracted by seeing Pepper Potts, who he saw in the center of the room wearing a blue dress. Having said goodbye to Coulson, Stark went up to Potts and complimented her on her dress, which she noted she had bought as a present from Stark using his money. Despite Potts' protests, Stark took her onto the dance floor and danced with her as Potts worried about being seen dancing with her boss. They joked about Stark firing her to make it less uncomfortable, but Potts noted that Stark wouldn't be able to survive without her assistance, questioning if he knew his own social security number, which he admitted he did not. Stepping outside, Potts confronted Stark about pushing her to dance with her while in front of all her co-workers due to Stark's reputation with women and fearing that her intentions with the dance would be misinterpreted by any who had watched them, while Stark continued to argue that it was not really a big deal. As they spoke, the pair then almost kissed one another before Stark decided to go and get them both a drink, with Potts requesting a heavy drink. While ordering all the drinks for himself and Potts, Stark was then accosted by Christine Everhart, whose name he briefly forgot despite them having slept together. Everhart expressed her disgust at Stark for claiming to halt the weapons development, only to sell weapons to the Ten Rings. When Stark revealed he did not approve any shipments, Everhart informed him that his company did. Disgusted by this, Stark confronted Obadiah Stane and demanded to know if he was making deals with Raza as well as the United States Armed Forces. Stane refused to answer the question. However, he called Stark naive for not considering that this sort of thing could possibly be happening. Stane also revealed that he was the one to shut Stark out of the board while he recovered. Stane then left the party, leaving Stark in a state of utter shock and horror. Battle of Gomera 
Faced with the realization of what his company had done behind his back and Obadiah Stane's part in the deception, Stark went back into his workshop and continued building his armors, while watching an FBX news report on how Raza and his Ten Rings soldiers were using Stark's own weapons to attack innocent people. Angered by what he was seeing, Stark rose from his seat and used his flight stabilizers to smash the glass doors, realizing that they could be used as weapons. Seeking to do something good with the technology he had created, Stark weaponized his Mark III armor and flew to Afghanistan. Knowing where Raza's men were attacking, Stark headed for Golmira, the home village of Ho Yinsen. Upon arriving, Stark discovered innocent women and children were being dragged out of their own homes to become slaves for the Ten Rings, while the men were being lined up to be executed right in front of their own horrified children. Stark attacked and easily subdued all of the soldiers, using his advanced weapon systems to kill multiple terrorists with single strikes and saving the lives of innocent people. Having found his former captor, Abu Bakar, Stark ripped him through a wall and left him for the villagers to gain their own revenge. While Bakar was being punished, Stark focused his efforts on destroying the Ten Rings' entire stockpiles of Stark Industries' weapons. During the battle, Stark was shot out of the sky by one of the Ten Rings' tanks, so Stark responded by shooting his own missile and destroying the tank with ease before he then targeted and destroyed all of the Jericho missiles the Ten Rings had. The prolonged battle and massive explosions quickly drew the attention of the United States Air Force and his own friend and company military liaison, Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes, who investigated the true cause. Two F-22 Raptors were ordered by Rhodes to take out the unknown target, with Stark soon finding them directly behind him and attempting to lock on with their weapons, forcing Stark to use his new armor's upgraded flight systems to evade the attacks. As the jets continued targeting him, Stark found they had locked on with a missile, so he used flares to destroy the missile before it could hit him, being blown forward by the force of the explosion. Having managed to use his superior maneuvering systems to hide underneath the jets without being seen, Stark called Rhodes and revealed his true identity to him in an attempt to have the attack called off, with Rhodes being horrified that he had sent some of his own equipment into an active war zone without informing him. While Rhodes tried to stop the attack, Major Allen, however, ordered the pilots to take the shot when they could get a clear view of him. However, while trying to evade the attack, one of the Raptors lost its left wing when it accidentally collided with Stark during the chaos of the battle. The pilot ejected shortly afterward, but his parachute jammed. Without hesitation, Stark dived down to help the pilot release his parachute before escaping. While heading back towards the United States, Stark spoke with Rhodes about what excuse he could then use to explain what had happened. Once back at his mansion, Stark was then helped out of his armor by both Dummy and Yu, finding the experience fairly painful as they struggled to find a way to get him back out. During this, Stark was soon discovered by Pepper Potts, who had just walked into his workshop to find him still half in his armor. Stark joked that it was still not actually the worst thing she had ever caught him doing, while Potts was horrified to see bullet holes in the armor. Next Mission With the mission to defeat the Ten Rings a success, Stark went back to work in tweaking the Mark III armor and improving its performance. He was soon joined by Pepper Potts, whom he requested to go into his office in Stark Industries headquarters to hack into the database in order to find out where his weapons were being sold to the Ten Rings so that he could go in using his armor and destroy them. Potts, however, refused to help him on his mission as she feared that going into these active war zones would result in him being killed, but Stark refused to listen. Stark noted that for years, Potts had stood by his side when he and Stark Industries had been creating the weapons, and now she was planning on leaving once he finally began doing the right thing and protecting the people he had endangered like Ho Yinsen. Stark noted that since his kidnapping, he had finally learned what he was meant to do with his life. Hearing how sincere Stark was about his mission, Potts took the hard drive and agreed to help him. While inside his mansion, Stark attempted to answer a call from Potts while he found himself unable to move. To his horror, he found Obadiah Stane looking down on him while using a sonic taser. Stane confessed that he had arranged Stark's kidnapping while he ripped out the arc reactor from Stark's chest, causing him to go into cardiac arrest. Stane mocked Stark by comparing him to his father while promising to kill Potts before walking away. Having regained some control of his body, Stark desperately tried to make it to his workshop to regain his original Mark I arc reactor to save his life. However, Stark collapsed inches away from it and was unable to move and minutes from death. But to save his life, Stark was aided by Dummy and Yu, who had managed to hand Stark the arc reactor just in time. Stark was then found by James Rhodes, who he explained the situation to while being helped back up. Having been told Potts had recruited Phil Coulson and an entire team of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents to arrest Stane, Stark warned it would not be enough as Stane had his own armored suit. To combat this, Stark put his suit on and prepared to battle Stane. 
While Rhodes admired the armor, which he had called the coolest thing he had ever seen, Stark told him to keep the skies clear from the United States Armed Forces while he then flew out of his mansion. Duel of Los Angeles Stark flew straight to the Stark Industries headquarters where he discovered Obadiah Stane was attempting to execute Pepper Potts. So he charged down and knocked Stane aside, crashing into the motorway and then through a Roxon Corporation truck. Stane responded by picking up a minivan holding a family and attempting to throw it at Stark, who put all his suit's power into the arc reactor to knock Stane back. Having just caught the minivan and put it down, Stark was briefly run over by the family who were terrified by the experience. As Stark recovered, Stane struck again, hitting him with a passing motorcycle and smashing him into a nearby bus. While he was striking him, Stane still continued to mock Stark by claiming he had built Stark Industries up from nothing back when Howard Stark had been killed. Stane then fired a missile at the bus as Stark was consumed inside the fireball but was still protected by his suit, despite being launched high into the air. While Stark hovered in the air, Stane complimented him on his upgrades before noting that his armor had upgrades of its own, before flying into the air to then chase Stark down. As they considered what to do, Jarvis had warned that his Mark III armor would not survive much longer, while Stark decided to fly straight upwards, believing that Stane had not done enough tests on his own armor in order to solve all of its own design issues. As they soared higher and higher above Los Angeles, Stark soon found that the superior power of Stane's suit allowed him to quickly catch up with him. However, once Stane had managed to grab hold of Stark, claiming that his own armor was more advanced in every way, Stark revealed to him that he had not solved the icing issue his Mark II armor had encountered, causing Stane's suit to lose power and then proceed to fall out of the sky. Losing his own power in his suit, Stark quickly returned to Stark Industries headquarters where he attempted to get out of the suit, only to be immediately confronted by Stane yet again. Without one of the gauntlets, Stark found himself at a disadvantage as Stane got him in a bear hug and attempted to crush the suit with Stark still inside, until Stark managed to deploy his flares to briefly blind Stane, allowing him to get away for a moment. While hiding from Stane, Stark told Potts that all of his current attempts to defeat Stane were not working, so he decided to make a new plan. Stark ordered Potts to overload the main arc reactor inside the building and blast the roof with energy in an attempt to defeat Stane. While Potts made her way back into the building, Stark also told her to wait until he had gotten himself clear, promising to buy her some time by fighting Stane. Stark proceeded to jump onto Stane's back and ripped out important pieces of the armor, taking out his targeting system and effectively blinding Stane. However, Stane soon managed to rip Stark off of his back and then threw him across the rooftop, taking off his own helmet as a result. Stark was then left almost defenseless with barely any power left in his suit to fight back against Stane, who opened up his armor and revealed himself. While he crushed Stark's helmet, Stane began mocking Stark by claiming he had finally made his father proud before shooting at him, which Stark managed to block with his gauntlet before the glass floor underneath him was destroyed. While Stark held on, Potts told him to get off the roof. Stane noted that by trying to rid Stark Industries of weapons, Stark had inadvertently created the greatest one ever which Stane would then use to finally kill him. While Stane struggled to aim his missiles at him, Stark ordered Potts to overload the arc reactor, which caused a burst of electricity which blasted Stark out of the way while frying Stane's armor, also killing Stane inside. Stane then fell inside the arc reactor, causing a massive explosion while Stark fell unconscious from the ordeal. Stark almost died from the lack of power to his arc reactor, but Jarvis managed to keep him alive long enough to be rescued. I am Iron Man. In the wake of the duel of Los Angeles, as well as his own near-death experience, Stark was aided by James Rhodes who tried to get Stark into an ambulance to see if he had any internal injuries. However, the ambulance was a fake one sent by S.H.I.E.L.D. to retrieve him. Now that they could finally get to talk to Stark, Phil Coulson talked to him after they had dropped him off at a small theater. Coulson viewed Stark's fighting strategy from his fight with Obadiah Stane on a projector screen. He told him he needed to become a real fighter and that he would be trained by skilled S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. The next morning, news had spread of Stark's new alter ego, dubbed Iron Man by the press. Stark then held a press conference where Agent Coulson gave him a detailed fabricated cover story about his and Stane's whereabouts, and advised him to state that Iron Man was his personal bodyguard. However, during the course of the conference, in a moment of self-clarity, Stark instead announced to the public that he himself was indeed Iron Man. Meeting Nick Fury That night, Stark arrived home and was greeted by a visitor who was standing by the window. He revealed himself as Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D., and assured him that he was not the only superhero in the world, intending to discuss the Avengers initiative with Stark. However, Stark, uninterested in having the government offering him opportunities, ordered Fury out of the house. Armored Adventures 
Iron Man performed acts of heroism around the world, news outlets began crediting him as the man who stabilized East-West relations, and Stark was chosen as Person of the Year by Time magazine. When Nick Fury sent a team of United States Navy SEALs to board a ship controlled by the Ten Rings, Iron Man appeared and defeated the terrorists. Stark also helped Thaddeus Ross in saving the pilot of the aerodynamic marvel that crashed in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Palladium Poisoning Unfortunately, Stark's own life was not as good as it appeared, as he was facing a double threat. The first was in the form of his own heart. The arc reactor palladium core was poisoning Stark due to the overuse of the Iron Man armor. To maintain appearances, he was forced to drink homemade medicine to counteract the symptoms. Meanwhile, Stark was also aware that the United States Armed Forces were constantly looking to confiscate all of his technology. Starting the Stark Expo Six months after revealing his own identity to the world and helping maintain world peace, Stark appeared as Iron Man at the grand opening of the Stark Expo in Flushing Meadows, New York City, continuing the legacy his father, Howard Stark, had started. Treating the crowd to the Ironet dancers and a speech in which he boasted about giving the world its longest-running period of uninterrupted peace, Stark left the stage with a video of his father playing. Stark then left the expo, with Happy Hogan helping to keep the press at bay, signing autographs and meeting Larry Ellison and Larry King on their way out, before he was then confronted by a beautiful U.S. Marshal who was waiting beside his car. The Marshal then informed Stark and Hogan that he was now required to attend a congressional meeting in Washington, D.C. the very next day in order to discuss the future of his work as the well-known superhero Iron Man. Meeting with Senator Stern The second threat was from a Senate committee hearing, this time led by Senator Stern, demanding that Stark release the technology of the Iron Man armor for military application. Stark refused, believing it was not in the best interest of the American people for the United States Armed Forces to possess it since they would use it as a weapon that could very well be used against America if various other countries were able to recreate the arc reactor technology. Senator Stern tried to turn Lt. Col. James Rhodes against Stark in an effort to force his decision. Competitor Justin Hammer tried to plead his case on the matter. Stark took this opportunity to embarrass both Hammer and Stern with a collection of footage of Hammer Industries and other entities around the world attempting to recreate the technology. Stark arrogantly stated that it would be years before anyone would be able to successfully recreate his tech, and he had privatized world peace. Making Pepper Potts CEO Returning to his mansion, Stark was greeted by Jarvis, who updated him on the fallout from his meeting with Senator Stern. While Stark listened to the news, he pulled out his arc reactor and examined the damaged palladium core which was slowly killing him with Jarvis noting that a replacement had not yet been found that could power his many Iron Man armors and also still keep him alive. Uncertain of his chances of survival, Stark decided to appoint his former personal assistant Pepper Potts into the role he no longer was interested in, the CEO of Stark Industries, while he was still the owner of the company, but only being a figurehead. When Potts arrived in his workshop, she and Stark had an argument about his own lack of interest in his company and their resources ever since becoming Iron Man, at which point Stark informed her that he had decided to promote her. Although Potts did not at first believe that he was being serious with this idea, Stark had Dummy deliver some champagne to them as he confirmed that this would be happening and she was the perfect person to take over the job from him. While doing some boxing training with Happy Hogan, during which he used dirty boxing techniques to gain the upper hand, Stark saw the arrival of Potts and a notary from the company, Natalie Rushman, who is actually Natasha Romanoff, an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Although Hogan hit Stark around the head, he proceeded to kick him away and beat him into surrendering before inviting Romanoff into the ring. Stark looked into Romanoff's eyes before inviting Hogan to train with her instead. Stark then sat down with Potts to discuss Rushman, with him bringing up her history files and noting that she even spoke Latin and had once been a lingerie model. While they were speaking, Stark and Potts witnessed Romanoff using a leg move to pin Hogan to the floor, before she exited the ring and asked Stark to sign the paperwork, handing Stark Industries over to Potts. Once Romanoff was gone, Stark told Potts that he needed her as his new assistant. Monaco Grand Prix Just before traveling to Monaco with Pepper Potts and Happy Hogan, Stark finished work on his Mark V armor. There, Stark and Potts encountered Justin Hammer, who smugly tried to show off that he was being interviewed by Christine Everhart for an upcoming piece with Vanity Fair. Stark quickly made it clear of his own romantic history with Everhart, and noted that Hammer Industries had lost their contract with the United States Armed Forces due to Hammer's embarrassing performance at the Senate committee hearing. Taking some time away from Hammer, 
Stark excused himself to check his blood toxicity level in the bathroom. He saw that the arc reactor's poisoning of his body due to the levels of palladium was now emitting into his skin. Looking up at the mirror and seeing that he did not likely have much time left until he would eventually die from this poisoning, Stark began questioning what he would like to do with these last few months that he likely had left. Growing increasingly despondent and thrill-seeking as a direct consequence of what he believed to be his impending death, Stark decided to take the Stark Industries car intended for the track and race it at the Monaco Grand Prix. As he stepped into the car, with all the cameras now facing him, Stark gave a look which he knew would be viewed by Hammer, much to his annoyance as Stark would once again be taking the spotlight away from him. Duel of Monaco As Stark drove around the track, Ivan Vanko, who had successfully constructed an arc reactor of his own, along with whip-like energy weapons, attacked him, using the whips to cut off the front of his car and cause it to crash along with several other race cars. Stark had managed to crawl out of the car before it could be sliced in half. Despite his best efforts to fight back, Vanko's armored weapons managed to get the better of Stark, who was defenseless. As Vanko prepared to rip Stark apart, he was forced to use his own wits and cunning to escape the deadly whips Vanko was using. Managing to get behind Vanko, Stark struck him on the back of the head with a car door, but Vanko proved to be unaffected, forcing Stark to drive out of the way of his attacks. He then tricked Vanko into striking the whips onto gasoline, causing an explosion which separated the pair from each other for a brief time. With Vanko proving himself too strong to be beaten without his armor, Stark seemed to be running out of options as he was backed into a corner. However, he received aid with the sudden arrival of both Pepper Potts and Happy Hogan, who had driven their own car onto the racetrack and successfully managed to crash it into Vanko, pinning him against the wall and briefly knocking him out cold. Stark then prepared to quickly make his escape. However, while Stark moaned about Stark Industries' seeming lack of security at the event, Vanko continued to fight despite still being pinned to the wall and began ripping Hogan's car apart with furious strikes from his electric whips. This forced the terrified Potts to then hand Stark his portable briefcase armor, allowing him to don the Mark V armor ready to do battle against his would-be assassin in the middle of the track, with Iron Man having the upper hand. Using his new suit, Iron Man attempted to subdue Vanko by firing his repulsor rays at his attacker, but Vanko was able to block those blows with his own armor before using his whips to strangle Iron Man. Vanko flung him across the racetrack into Hogan's car and then back the other way, tightening the whips around Iron Man's neck and shocking him with volts of electricity, which were slowly destroying the suit. Not allowing himself to be defeated, Iron Man managed to build up his own strength and began wrapping the whips around himself in order to get closer to Vanko. Once he was close enough, Iron Man punched Vanko in the face a few times before ripping the arc reactor out of his chest and crushing it. As Vanko was being dragged away by the police, he laughingly claimed that Iron Man had now lost while Iron Man studied Vanko's arc reactor, crushing it in shock. Meeting with Ivan Vanko Afterward, Stark decided to pay a visit to Ivan Vanko personally while he was being held in France to learn how he had acquired the arc reactor technology, being led there by Lemieux. Once they were alone, Stark commented on Vanko's armor and even suggested ways he could improve it, thinking that he would never actually get a chance to. Stark wondered why Vanko would use the technology to kill him rather than for more tangible personal gain. Vanko revealed that he was the son of Anton Vanko, who had collaborated with Howard Stark on the first arc reactor, but was deported back to the Soviet Union and died in poverty. Vanko blamed the Stark family for his family's fate and sought revenge, warning that Stark would die now that he proved Iron Man was not invincible. Stark retorted that Vanko would still be in prison either way. As he left, Vanko mentioned Stark's current blood poisoning, taunting that it was a terrible way to die. Ivan Vanko's Attack Aftermath Despite Ivan Vanko having been in prison for his crimes, the response to another man using the arc reactor technology was immediate, with many people, including Senator Stern, commenting on Stark's failure. While on his private jet returning to the United States, Stark made breakfast for Pepper Potts as they discussed the aftermath of the attack. Stark even suggested that he quit being Iron Man from now on and almost confessed to Potts of his current state, but backed out. Stark returned to his mansion where he and Jarvis continued searching for a new arc reactor power source while looking over records of Ivan Vanko and his father, Anton Vanko. Stark learned that Anton had worked for Stark Industries in the 1960s before being deported under the orders of Howard Stark, whilst Vanko was a Soviet physicist arrested for illegal weapons dealing. He was later visited by James Rhodes, who came to warn Stark about the military's wish to take his suits. However, he recognized Stark's unwell state and assisted him by changing the arc reactor's palladium core. Rhodes then tried to convince Stark that he did not have to go through this journey alone, but Stark remained skeptical. The next night, 
Feeling more depressed about his future as the poisoning neared its peak, Stark considered canceling his birthday party after learning that he only had a week left to live. He was then visited by Natasha Romanoff, undercover as Natalie Rushman, who prepared Stark a drink and gave him a choice of watches to wear. He posed these questions to Romanoff, asking what she would do on her final birthday. Romanoff replied that she would do whatever she wanted with whomever she wanted to do it with. Birthday Party Stark decided to attend what could very well be his last ever birthday party and quickly got himself very drunk, partying with the many guests who had come to celebrate. He invited Natasha Romanoff, still known to Stark as Natalie Rushman, to wear one of his gauntlets and fire it at an ice sculpture taking great pleasure in the destruction before joining the other attendees. Stark then drank even more alcohol shots to become further intoxicated and even harder to keep in control. While wearing the Mark IV Iron Man armor and indulging in many dangerous activities such as using his repulsor blast to destroy a watermelon, Iron Man was watched by Pepper Potts, who attempted to make him stop, being advised by James Rhodes that this was a terrible time to be acting so reckless. Despite Potts taking the microphone away from Iron Man and trying to tell the guests that it was time to go home, Iron Man would not listen to reason and instead insisted that his party keep going, as he continued to misuse his suit to entertain his drunk guests within his mansion, much to Potts and Rhodes' dismay as they looked on in concern. In the end, Iron Man's actions became more and more dangerous and foolish, forcing his friend Rhodes to intervene. Rhodes donned the Mark II Iron Man armor and ordered the guests out of the room before demanding that Iron Man get out of the suit. Iron Man ignored him and instead requested that Adam Goldstein put on a good song for the incoming fight. The pair clashed as they flew through room to room, using whatever weapons they could find to try and subdue the other, including throwing heavy weights at each other before Rhodes managed to throw Iron Man into his upstairs bedroom. Eventually, after almost destroying the entire mansion in the resulting fight, Iron Man managed to subdue Rhodes by smashing his head down on the kitchen counter, before roaring at the onlookers to force them to flee the scene. After Rhodes recovered and knocked him against the fireplace, Iron Man dared his friend to take his shot as they both fired their repulsors at each other, causing a massive explosion. With Iron Man weakened in the fight, he could only look on while Rhodes flew away to deliver the armor to the United States Armed Forces. Rediscovering the Element In the aftermath of his fight with James Rhodes, Stark took the Mark IV Iron Man armor and flew to Randy's Donuts in California buying himself a box of donuts and aimlessly enjoying them in the middle of the sign above the shop. While he was relaxing in the morning sun, Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D., approached Iron Man and ordered him to come inside. Taking a seat inside, Iron Man once again informed Fury that he was not interested in joining the Avengers, before rudely asking if he should look at Fury's eye or patch. Changing the subject, Fury then revealed to Iron Man that Natalie Rushman was in fact undercover agent Natasha Romanoff in her Black Widow outfit who Iron Man tried and failed to fire from Stark Industries. As he and Fury continued their conversation, Black Widow injected Iron Man with lithium dioxide to slow down the poisoning in his veins caused by his arc reactor. Fury reassured Iron Man that somewhere there was a cure and he had simply not discovered it yet, despite Iron Man insisting that he had already looked everywhere and found nothing. Returning to Stark's mansion, they discussed the history of Anton Vanko, who had been working with Howard Stark in creating the arc reactor before he was deported for selling secrets on the black market, where he then raised his son, Ivan Vanko, in Siberia. Before he departed, Fury revealed that Howard was one of the founders of S.H.I.E.L.D. and left a skeptical Stark to go through his father's belongings to find the cure, with Agent Phil Coulson watching over him. Researching his family Nick Fury gave Stark some of his father's old material to aid in finding a cure for the palladium poisoning. Stark found several items, including Howard's notebook with drawings of a hypercube, and two Captain America comic books. He remained dismissive and bitter over these past relics until watching an old tape of his father in which Stark discovered a hidden message where Howard told him that he was proud of his son and viewed Stark as his greatest creation. Stark then drove to the Stark Industries headquarters, buying some strawberries along the way, and met with Pepper Potts, though Bambi Arbogast tried to inform him that she was too busy to talk. Once Stark got her attention, he attempted to apologize in his own way, which Potts struggled to believe and insisted she needed to focus on Stark Industries' future. They were interrupted by Happy Hogan and Natasha Romanoff, who were both now working only for Potts. As Potts and Hogan left the office, Stark spoke with Romanoff and questioned how she could keep this lie going, and she subtly insulted him before leaving. Stark prepared to leave the office, dumping the strawberries into the bin. But first, he thought he saw a hidden message in the diorama of the 1974 Stark Expo, which proved to be a diagram of a new element's atomic structure. Stark disassembled the model and drove it back to his mansion for further study. 
Putting the model on his desk, Stark ordered Jarvis to make a scan of the model, removing all the trees and buildings from the holographic image so he could focus just on the model itself. As Jarvis questioned what Stark's plan was, he explained that he believed he had found a hidden message. Eventually, Stark realized that the new element was inside Expo Globe in the center and thanked his father for gifting him with it as it would soon save his life. A new element. As Stark put the final pieces together to begin his experiment, he was greeted by Phil Coulson, who asked where he had been before discovering a prototype for Captain America's shield, which Stark took and used to straighten some of his machinery. Coulson then informed Stark that he was leaving to head to New Mexico to investigate a mysterious object that had been found there. With the aid of Jarvis, Stark put his experiment into action, assembling a large laser in the center of his workshop in his mansion. Stark pushed the laser into position, struggling to hold it in place as it shot through the walls while he aimed it at his target. As the laser hit the newly designed arc reactor that Stark had made, it finally synthesized the new element. As Stark picked up his creation and studied it, Jarvis confirmed that the new element would indeed be a suitable replacement for palladium and be able to keep him alive while powering his Iron Man armors for the foreseeable future. Stark then continued upgrading the reactor and his next suit. Afterwards, while Stark continued his work on his new suit, he received a call which turned out to come from Ivan Vanko, despite having last been heard from dying in a prison explosion, revealing he was still alive and bent on revenge. While Stark attempted to trace the call and locate the dangerous terrorist, Vanko promised that he would soon have his revenge for what Howard Stark had done to his father before hanging up the call. As Vanko had warned that he had taken Stark's scientific advice and improved his own armor to be ready for their next battle, Stark donned the Mark VI Iron Man armor. Despite Jarvis' objections, Stark wore his new arc reactor and commented on how it felt putting it on for the first time, noticing he got a distinct taste of both coconut and metal. Remembering Justin Hammer's new presentation for the military at the Stark Expo, Stark suited up and flew off to then confront Vanko and stop his evil plans. Battle at Stark Expo Iron Man arrived to confront Justin Hammer, who was busy unveiling his Hammer drones, captained by James Rhodes in a heavily weaponized armor suit, which was a modified version of the Mark II Iron Man armor. While trying to keep the audience calm, Iron Man demanded to know where Ivan Vanko was although Hammer denied all knowledge of him and tried to play off the incident to the audience. Iron Man then approached Rhodes, warning him that Vanko was still alive. Suddenly, Vanko seized control of both the drones and Rhodes' armor, directing them all to attack Iron Man, who then flew across the expo in a desperate attempt to lose his attackers and cause them all to crash, while ordering Jarvis to regain control of Rhodes. During the battle, Iron Man did all he could to save the hundreds of attendees fleeing during the chaos, including Peter Parker, who was mistaken for him by a drone for wearing an Iron Man mask. Quickly running out of options as Rhodes continued to fire upon him using Hammer Industries weapons, Iron Man tried his best to take out the drones, flying them all away from the civilians before leading them straight into the Unisphere. Then using his Mark VI armor's superior maneuvering abilities, Iron Man had managed to escape and caused the bulkier hammer drones to crash into the globe and explode altogether in a massive fireball. However, before Iron Man could relax, he was knocked out of the sky and into an Oracle Corporation dome by Rhodes, who was still being controlled by Vanko. Iron Man attempted to block Rhodes' attacks, holding his minigun at bay until Black Widow successfully overrode Vanko's programming, having broken into the Hammer Industries headquarters with a little help from Happy Hogan, despite failing to arrest Vanko. Showdown with Ivan Vanko Iron Man knocked James Rhodes back before Black Widow confirmed that he was safe at last and in control of his own armor. She also complimented Iron Man on his new element which had now stopped his palladium poisoning, causing Pepper Potts to confront Iron Man for not telling her he was dying. While Potts had Justin Hammer arrested, Iron Man helped Rhodes back onto his feet. Knowing that the remaining Hammer drones would be coming to their location, both Iron Man and Rhodes then came up with a plan to battle them. However, this only led to an argument between the two friends over who should take the better position in the area, with both of them believing that they had the superior armor and skills. However, before they could make up their minds, the drones then arrived and surrounded Iron Man and Rhodes. With nowhere to escape to, the pair donned their own helmets and prepared for battle, firing their weapons at the attacking drones. As the battle then commenced, Iron Man and Rhodes found that although they could easily defeat each drone, the numbers began to overwhelm them. While Rhodes used his impressive weaponry provided by Hammer Industries to destroy the attackers, Iron Man used his top-of-the-line armor to fight back and destroy multiple targets at once, eventually using his lasers to slice all of the remaining drones in half and finally win the fight. Upon eliminating the drones, Iron Man and Rhodes were then informed by Black Widow that they had a new enemy coming in, who she warned appeared to be much stronger than all of the previous ones. 
This was revealed to be Ivan Vanko in his new, more powerful suit of armor. Attempting to kill Vanko before the fight could even begin, Rhodes armed the ex-wife missile only for it to fail and not even dent Vanko's armor, with Iron Man then noting that it was clearly a Hammer Industries weapon due to being useless in battle. Iron Man then engaged in a fierce battle with Vanko, with himself and Rhodes throwing all they had at defeating him or damaging his armor enough to cause him to surrender. However, they both found that not only was Vanko's armor too strong, but he had upgraded his whips to the point where they were more dangerous than ever before. The pair soon found themselves overpowered by Vanko's improved technology and weapons. Vanko soon managed to gain the upper hand in the battle when he succeeded in wrapping his electrified whips around Iron Man and Rhodes' throats and slowly tightened them, hoping to break their necks. With no other choice, Iron Man called on Rhodes to use the technique they discovered during the duel at his mansion and fired their own repulsor rays at each other, triggering an explosion in front of Vanko and knocking them all back. Recovering from the shockwave and getting back onto their feet, Iron Man and Rhodes found Vanko lying on the battlefield, with not only his Mark II armor, but his own body damaged beyond repair. Too injured to continue in the fight, Vanko claimed that Stark had in fact lost this fight before he ignited his and all of the Hammer Drones' self-destruct bombs, including one in his own armor. Knowing that these drones were littered across Stark Expo, since he had shot many of them out of the sky, Iron Man quickly flew to the rescue anyone remaining there before the drones exploded and caused major casualties. Iron Man raced to save Potts amid the series of explosions, pulling her away just in time. Seeing the chaos that he brought with him, Potts quit her position as CEO of Stark Industries. But Iron Man only teased her about the concept of leaving him, before finally confessing how important she was to him. And the couple then kissed each other. Rhodes then revealed that he was on the roof too, before departing with his armor without serious objection from Iron Man, leaving them where he refused to accept Potts' resignation. Not a suitable candidate. At a debriefing while showing news footage of another superhuman event, Nick Fury informed Stark that while Iron Man was a suitable candidate for the Avengers Initiative, Stark himself was not. S.H.I.E.L.D. wanted Stark as a consultant, but Stark claimed that Fury could not afford his help. Stark thought about the position for a moment, and he agreed on the condition that Senator Stern present himself and James Rhodes with their medals for bravery in defeating Ivan Vanko and Justin Hammer. A couple of hours later in exchange, Stark got his wish and took the job as a consultant. He took great pleasure in Senator Stern's annoyance at being forced to give him a new medal, smiling for the pictures and offering a peace sign to the crowd of onlookers. Consultant for S.H.I.E.L.D. Keeping with his job as consultant for S.H.I.E.L.D., Stark was tasked with preventing General Thaddeus Ross from releasing Emil Blonsky onto the Avengers Initiative, ordered by the World Security Council. Stark arrived at the bar where he found a drunken Ross who was still dealing with losing Hulk despite his own prolonged search for him. The two exchanged insults about each other's recent battles before Stark told him that a team was being put together. Stark annoyed Ross so much that the latter tried to have him removed from the bar, but Stark had already bought and arranged for it to be demolished later on, of which Stark informed Phil Coulson and Jasper Sitwell. The task was then completed with Ross refusing to release Blonsky from his custody out of pure spite. Chitari Invasion Stark retrieved the James Rhodes Mark I armor and stripped it of all the new Hammer Industries weapons and turned it back into the Mark II Iron Man armor. When Rhodes then arrived, Stark informed him that he would never wear that armor again because he made him a new one with improved technology and weaponry. With that, Rhodes became a superhero who dons armored suits like Iron Man, known as War Machine. Stark focused his efforts on Stark Tower in New York City, which was powered by pure clean energy, with Stark admiring that his own name was lit up. Upon arriving at Stark Tower, he and Pepper Potts began celebrating the successful creation of their newest clean energy source for the entire city, with Stark telling her that she could have 12% of the credit for Stark Industries' newest breakthrough. Stark was then informed by Jarvis that Agent Phil Coulson had arrived and now wished to speak with him, which he refused and even claimed to be a life model decoy, but Coulson still insisted that he needed to speak to Stark urgently and then led himself into the tower much to Stark's dismay as he blamed Potts for the security breach. Coulson informed Stark that the Avengers Initiative was now active in the wake of the destruction of Project Pegasus at the hands of Loki, and as Guardian, who had attacked some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, stolen the Tesseract, and took Eric Selvig and Clint Barton as his mind-controlled slaves with the power of his scepter. Coulson explained that they needed him to come in despite having previously been rejected from the Avengers, handing Stark holographic screens with information about Captain America, Thor, Hulk, and Loki for him to study. While Potts and Coulson left the tower, Stark began examining the Tesseract design. Capturing Loki 
Stark quickly suited up in his current Mark VI armor and then traveled straight to Stuttgart, Germany, where he then quickly found his old acquaintance Natasha Romanoff in a Quinjet overlooking the newly unfrozen Captain America in the middle of a battle with the hostile god Loki. Iron Man jetted right in and blasted Loki with his repulsors and stood tall next to Captain America, aiming every weapon he had and forcing Loki to surrender as they took him into custody. Escorting Loki onto the Quinjet in handcuffs, the team headed back towards the S.H.I.E.L.D.'s helicarrier. Iron Man commented on Captain America's fighting skills and subtly mocked his lack of knowledge of modern society since returning from World War II, questioning if he had taken up Pilates. As they were discussing why Loki had surrendered, a sudden thunderstorm had occurred, seemingly unnerving Loki. The Quinjet was then attacked by Thor, the adoptive brother of Loki, who broke in and subdued Iron Man before he could fight back before ripping Loki out of his seat before flying away, leaving Iron Man and Captain America behind. While Thor threatened Loki atop a mountain in order to learn exactly who Loki's master is, Iron Man blasted straight into him, hurling him onto the forest floor away from Loki. While Thor got his bearings, Iron Man revealed himself and was warned not to touch Thor again, to which he told him not to take his things, referring to Loki. Thor then informed Iron Man that he did not understand what was happening, and Iron Man mockingly claimed that Thor looked like he was in a William Shakespeare production in the park, telling him that he looked like he was wearing his mother's own clothing. The two began to battle as Thor demanded to be allowed to take Loki to the Asgardian dungeons as he struck Iron Man who defended himself. During the fight, Thor summoned lightning to his hammer and electrocuted Stark. However, this only succeeded in supercharging Stark's suit. Jarvis informed him that his suit was at 400% capacity, allowing him to blast Thor off his feet. When Thor attempted to charge at him, Iron Man charged back and managed to push him straight into a mountain but Thor continued to fight back and caused them to crash land back in the forest where they continued fighting each other. Iron Man's armor took a beating during the battle as Thor easily began to crush one of the gauntlets with just his bare hands. Fearing his arm would be shattered, Iron Man responded by shooting Thor in the face, which merely knocked his head back before headbutting him with his helmet. However, Thor's own Asgardian strength allowed him to withstand all of Iron Man's blows and be unaffected, as they continued their fight, with Iron Man using all the advantages of his suit to try and subdue Thor without killing him so that he could then take him and Loki back into S.H.I.E.L.D.'s custody. Their fight was broken up by Captain America, who demanded that they stop fighting and questioned what Thor was doing on Earth, in which he explained that he had come to put an end to Loki's schemes. Captain America then insisted that Thor prove he was on their side by putting down his hammer, to which Iron Man noted that that was a bad move as Thor loved his hammer just before he was struck with it and knocked through a tree just when Thor attacked Captain America. After Captain America matched Thor with his shield, the three managed to calm and Thor got recruited, recapturing Loki and taking him away. Meeting the Avengers They took Loki back to the helicarrier, where Stark had a talk with Agent Phil Coulson, and promised to lend him his private jet to meet with Audrey Nathan in Portland. Stark then joined the group, complimenting Thor on his fighting skills and pointing out an agent playing Galaga before noting that Loki needed Iridium in order to control the Tesseract's power. As Stark explained why Loki needed Eric Selvig and Clint Barton, he was questioned about his newfound experience by Maria Hill and revealed that he had done his research the night before, noting that all Loki needed was a power source to control the Tesseract. Stark was introduced to Bruce Banner, who understood all of his own theories, delighting Stark who then complimented Banner on his own intelligence and ability to turn into Hulk. Director Nick Fury then suggested Stark and Banner work together to try and understand Loki's scepter, with Captain America comparing it to a Hydra weapon. While Captain America still struggled to understand a lot of the team's new modern references, Stark and Banner departed for the lab to begin their research, but not before Stark planted a hacking device and allowed Jarvis to begin searching S.H.I.E.L.D.'s database to find out its secrets about why the Avengers were assembled. Stark talked with Banner in their new lab as they discussed all of Selvig's work, and invited him to come work at Stark Tower for a stress-free workplace, despite Banner claiming that he broke Harlem the last time he was in New York City. Stark then tried once to annoy Banner by poking him with a prod in order to test his ability to resist his transformation, only to get no response apart from pain before Captain America entered and demanded he stop, as Banner's transformation would put all the lives on the helicarrier at risk. Stark wondered if Banner used jazz or marijuana to keep his cool, which Captain America found less than funny, telling Stark he was risking the lives of everyone on board the helicarrier and should be focusing on the issues at hand. Stark, however, suggested that Fury might have other motives for restarting the Avengers initiative, although Captain America was unconvinced. Banner noted that Loki's comments could have been referring to Stark Tower and the power it supplied. 
Captain America once again told Stark to remain focused on locating the Tesseract, only for Stark to insult his uniform and send him out of his lab. Stark rudely commented on how his father had so often admired Captain America, having worked with him back in World War II. Team Tension When Stark noted that he wanted Bruce Banner to be in the fight with them when it came time for it, Banner insisted that he couldn't, calling Hulk a nightmare. Stark then told Banner about how his arc reactor was keeping the shrapnel he gained from his kidnapping away from his heart, calling it a terrible privilege, with Banner claiming his situation was not the same. Stark noted all the gamma radiation Banner was exposed to should have killed him, and maybe Hulk saved his life. Stark and Banner learned that S.H.I.E.L.D. was trying to harness the Tesseract's power to begin Phase 2 and create weapons of mass destruction. Nick Fury soon learned of their schemes and challenged them both, with them soon being joined by Captain America, who had also found out that S.H.I.E.L.D. was using Hydra's technology to learn how to harness it, based on the Red Skull's designs. Just as Fury tried to defend his actions, Stark contradicted him, forcing Fury to confess they were building the weapons in response to Thor and the recent battle of Puente Antiguo which they were unprepared for. While Banner called their new team a time bomb, Stark got into a heated argument with Captain America, who claimed that Stark was not a hero but a selfish man in a suit of armor. While Stark noted that Captain America was only a hero because of the super soldier serum given to him by Stark's father and Abraham Erskine, leading to Stark challenging him to a fight. During an ensuing argument between the Avengers, Banner inadvertently picked up Loki's scepter, revealing Loki's control over him. All of Loki's troops then arrived, led by the brainwashed Clint Barton, and attacked the Helicarrier in order to free Loki. Attack on the Helicarrier When one of the Helicarrier's engines was destroyed by Hawkeye, Stark quickly suited up in the Mark VI armor and rushed outside to try and assist in its repair. Iron Man arrived and soon assessed the damage, recruiting Captain America to help him by checking all the main controls, while Iron Man went inside the engine. However, Iron Man was soon frustrated when Captain America struggled to understand the modern technology that he was currently looking at due to his lack of exposure to any of it. While Iron Man and Captain America were working together by the damaged engine, Nick Fury and Maria Hill were unable to stop Hawkeye using one of his arrows to shut down the helicarrier's power causing it to fall out of the sky, dramatically shortening the time Iron Man had to save the day. Upon arriving at the engine itself, Iron Man used his laser to cut through the damaged propeller and decided to use his armor's arc reactor to restart the engine by hand, telling Captain America to pull a lever in order to free him from the engine before he got shredded inside when it moved too fast. Iron Man put all of his might into pushing the engine in order to get it spinning fast enough to lift the helicarrier back up into the air, saving all of the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents on board. However, Iron Man soon found it was beginning to move too fast for him to keep up, and then asked Captain America to pull the lever, only to learn Captain America was now busy fighting Loki's mind-controlled soldiers. Iron Man was briefly trapped and badly damaged by the propeller, until Captain America managed to free him just in time. Iron Man then flew to Captain America's location and subdued the soldier attacking him before his suit lost all power. Something to Avenge with the Helicarrier now safe thanks to their efforts, the duo then learned that during the chaos, Bruce Banner had transformed into the Hulk, and caused mass destruction before he had escaped from the ship, as well as Thor being ejected from the Helicarrier by Loki, who escaped but not before mortally wounding Agent Phil Coulson. When medical assistance was called in for Coulson, it was soon confirmed that he had in fact died from all of his wounds, news which shook Stark to his very core. Stark and Steve Rogers were then gathered together in the control room where Nick Fury expressed his own deep regret for Coulson's death, presenting Rogers with the Captain America card collection he had asked him to sign. While Stark listened in silence, Fury then explained why they could not locate the Tesseract, confessing that he was planning on recreating Hydra weapons with its power before he informed the two that the Avengers initiative was started so that the isolated individuals could become something more and that Coulson died still believing this. Hearing this, Stark got to his feet. Visiting the site of Coulson's murder at Loki's hand, Stark began talking with Rogers about how Coulson didn't have family, but was dating Audrey Nathan. When Rogers called him a good man, Stark called him an idiot for challenging Loki with the destroyer armor prototype gun on his own. Stark began claiming that they were not soldiers in a war and he would not be following Fury any longer, noting about how Loki made it personal to draw them in. Rogers went to dismiss the comment, but Stark noted that making it personal was Loki's plan to rip their new team apart. While rambling on about the theatrics that Loki had pulled off as part of his grand plan for world domination, Stark began to draw closer to finding out where the Asgardian god of mischief would set off the portal to bring his alien army forth, commenting on how Loki wanted his victory to be seen by the world. At that moment, Stark realized he had built something out of ego, Stark Tower, 
and it would provide both the perfect source of energy to open the portal and serve as a taunt. Stark then informed Rogers of his epiphany before quickly walking out of the room. With this new lead, Rogers put on his uniform and regrouped with the other available Avengers while Stark repaired the Mark VI Iron Man armor so it was battle ready again. Fueled by a desire to avenge Agent Coulson's death, Stark soon got his armor ready to go into battle, while Captain America, Black Widow, and Hawkeye, who had now been freed from Loki's mind control, left on board a Quinjet which they had stolen from S.H.I.E.L.D., Iron Man flew himself straight to New York City in order to finally confront Loki and end his attack, although he found the armor still lost some power along the way. Confronting Loki Iron Man soon arrived at Stark Tower where he found a device had been installed on the roof powered by the Tesseract that was now being operated by the mind-controlled Professor Eric Selvig. Iron Man ordered Jarvis to cut the power from the tower, only to learn that the portal device was already self-sustaining. Failing to convince Selvig to shut down the device, Iron Man blasted it. However, the barrier around the device bounced the blast back. Iron Man saw that Loki was watching in amusement from the balcony of Stark's penthouse, and seeing that there was now nothing else he could do to stop the invasion, Stark decided to change tactics, land on a platform, remove the Mark VI Iron Man armor, and face off against Loki without any defenses. In a sense of hospitality, Stark offered Loki a drink, but he declined before Stark threatened Loki. To buy time to put on his two Colon Tate bracelets, Stark then promised Loki that he would be stopped by the Avengers no matter how long it took them, although Loki still remained unintimidated by the concept. Stark listed off all the Avengers members to show what Loki was up against, seeing Loki cringe at the mention of Thor. Loki insisted that his Chitari army would overcome them with ease, so Stark then noted that they had a Hulk on their own side. Stark then promised that even if the Avengers failed to protect the Earth, they would at least avenge it by defeating Loki. The now furious Loki promised that the Avengers would have no time for him when they were fighting a brainwashed Stark. When Loki attempted to enthrall him, the arc reactor in Stark's chest was blocking the scepter from Stark's heart. Making a performance joke, Stark was suddenly attacked by Loki who vowed to destroy the Avengers before Stark was then thrown out the window hundreds of feet above the ground. However, Stark just managed to call for the Mark VII Iron Man armor. It was rocket propelled to him and formed the suit around him by connecting to the Colon Tate bracelets he had put on right before he could hit the ground. Iron Man flew back up to Loki and told him there was one other person Loki had pissed off, Phil Coulson, and blasted Loki backwards before he could even react to the name of the late Agent Coulson. Battle of New York Iron Man was, however, confronted by Loki's device, which opened a portal into space where Loki's army of Chitari flew into New York City and began their war against Earth. Amazed at what he was witnessing, Iron Man charged upwards and fired all of the Mark VII Iron Man armor's weapons upon the attacking alien forces. Iron Man recruited the help of Hawkeye by flying the Quinjet and having him shoot the aliens out of the sky behind him, while mockingly asking if they had stopped for drive through as they were so late to the fight. Iron Man fought off the Chitari and tried to call War Machine, who told Iron Man that he was too busy fighting soldiers working for the Ten Rings. Iron Man then began to chase after a Leviathan, a giant flying alien serpent, and the warship to dozens of Chitari. When he was notified of the arrival of Bruce Banner on the field, Iron Man led the flying serpent toward him, saying he was bringing the party to the others, so that Banner would transform into Hulk and defeat it, with Iron Man firing a tank missile at the Leviathan to destroy its body and finally kill it. Iron Man landed on the ground alongside his fellow Avengers. The team were then confronted by hundreds of Chitari, who flew in through the portal as well as several more Leviathans. Captain America gave out orders and instructed Iron Man to take to the skies and fend off more Chitari, as well as keep them within New York City. Captain America then ordered Hawkeye to get onto the roof of one of the skyscrapers in order to inform them of the Chitari's movements during the battle, while also sharpshooting them. So Iron Man flew him up there while Captain America gave out his orders to the other Avengers. As the Battle of New York began, Iron Man focused on his task of ensuring that the Chitari forces did not leave the city and wreak havoc elsewhere. He soon found himself being chased down by multiple Chitari chariots which attempted to shoot him out of the sky, until Hawkeye advised Iron Man to fly towards a tight corner as he noted the Chitari weren't as good at maneuvering their craft as he was. Iron Man did as recommended and successfully caused the Chitari chariots to crash into nearby buildings. However, despite Thor's best efforts to block the portal, they still continued coming through. Charging through the entire battlefield, Iron Man came to the aid of Black Widow, who was currently riding one of the Chitari chariots, to try and reach Stark Tower, and Iron Man soon shot the pursuing Chitari out of the sky to ensure she could get there. Iron Man then charged through multiple aliens to team up with Captain America, 
as they used his shield to deflect Iron Man's gauntlet blasts across the multiple enemies, increasing its power as a result. Iron Man then aided Hawkeye by knocking several Chitari off of the building he was on before they could get to him as he continued flying. Having been told by Jarvis that all of his lasers were not cutting through a Leviathan's armored skin, Iron Man took inspiration from the tale of Jonah by taking out the Leviathan by flying headfirst into its mouth and launching missiles from the inside, tearing it apart before crash landing on the street. However, Iron Man soon got battered by numerous attacks. Iron Man asked Thor if he had ever seen Game of Thrones, saying he reminded him of it. The Nuke As the Battle of New York continued, the Avengers found themselves still outnumbered and learned that Black Widow had now found a way to close the portal. Iron Man hindered this, as Nick Fury had instructed him that Gideon Malick and the World Security Council had fired a nuclear missile to blow up Manhattan in hopes of ending the invasion. Iron Man soon intercepted the missile and demanded that Black Widow keep the portal open, despite Captain America wishing to close it as soon as possible to end the invasion while they still could. Iron Man flew it up through New York City and up alongside Stark Tower and finally straight through the portal as he was taken into deep space. Iron Man looked on in amazement at what was before him, all while he lost contact with Jarvis and the oxygen swiftly ran out. As he lost consciousness, Iron Man released the nuclear missile and blew up the Chitari command center, which resulted in the deaths of the Chitari and the Leviathans across the city. However, Iron Man lost power in the Mark VII Iron Man armor in the process and fell unconscious back through the portal just before it closed. As Iron Man fell back to Earth, he was caught mid-air by Hulk, who landed with him back on the ground. Captain America and Thor ran over to Iron Man who appeared to be dead, only for Hulk to scream in his face, waking him up. Iron Man said they should get some shawarma to celebrate, despite not knowing what shawarma was. Captain America told him they'd do that later, since Loki still needed to be apprehended. Battle Aftermath Iron Man and the rest of the Avengers returned to Stark Tower, where they found the defeated Loki. As Loki asked if he could have the drink Iron Man offered earlier, Iron Man merely told the other Avengers to apprehend Loki while noting the mess around him. S.H.I.E.L.D.'s strike team then showed up to take possession of the Scepter, while Stark focused on safely securing the Tesseract in a silver case, with Thor intending to bring it back to Asgard. Stark, Thor, and Loki, along with a few S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, began to take the elevator down the lobby, but as Hulk moved to join them, Stark reminded him that the elevator had a weight capacity and motioned that he should take the stairs instead, angering Hulk. As Stark and Thor made their way through the lobby, they were halted by Alexander Pierce of the World Security Council, which oversaw S.H.I.E.L.D. Pierce demanded that Thor and Stark relinquish custody of Loki and the Tesseract to him, although Thor refused, citing that Loki would be returning to Asgard and would be punished by Odin. Pierce then ordered Stark to hand over the Tesseract, citing that it had been S.H.I.E.L.D. property for 70 years. After Stark and Thor refused to relinquish the Tesseract, Pierce attempted to grab the case when Stark would not comply. Pierce's efforts were in naught, as Thor was allowed to take Loki and the Tesseract back with him to Asgard. Following the altercation, Stark and the other Avengers went into the Shawarma Palace where they all ate silently. They were soon interrupted by War Machine, who arrived from the Battle of Hong Kong and too late to aid Stark and the rest of the Avengers in the battle. After their meal, the Avengers met in Central Park, witnessing Thor and Loki's return to Asgard using the Tesseract. The team then went their separate ways, with Stark saying goodbye to Steve Rogers and shaking his hand before he drove away in his Acura 2012 Stark Industries supercar with Banner by his side. Stark was later with Pepper Potts in Stark Tower, ready to rebuild after the damage that was done. Feeling all the guilt of his recent actions involving the Battle of New York, Stark invested in the United States Department of Damage Control in order to clear up the wreckage left behind by the Chitari and the Leviathans that now littered New York City. Putting Anne-Marie Hogue in charge of the newly established damage control, Stark had Hogue take control away from Adrian Toomes' crew to work on the clear-up of the battle's aftermath, much to Toomes' great dismay. Stark would go on to focus his efforts into creating the Iron Legion in order to protect the Earth from the next threat from the Nine Realms. Stark showed Rhodes several Iron Man armors that could be remotely controlled. Mandarin Threat Seven months after the Battle of New York, Stark continued building up the Iron Legion, creating new suits for all possible eventualities. While in his Malibu mansion, Stark tested out the new Mark 42, which was built so that he could now activate and summon various pieces of the armor when needed using micro-repeaters implanted in his body. Stark ignored Jarvis' concern about his lack of sleep and the armor's safety briefing, 
recruiting Dummy and Yu to assist him in filming the newest test to Bombay Dub Orchestra's Jingle Bells. Stark successfully summoned both of his gauntlets, deciding to have the entire armor assemble at once. However, due to glitches, the pieces started coming too fast to properly attach, forcing Stark to dodge the flying projectiles as they damaged his workshop, with the face and crotch plates hurting him if they impacted by themselves. After slowing down the armor assembly, Stark only had the faceplate left and noticed it was upside down, so he flipped it over himself to help it fit. Just as Stark celebrated, a final piece for his backside knocked him over, causing the entire suit to fall apart. Right after testing the new armor, Stark watched the television, only to see that the terrorist, the Mandarin, had made yet another attack on the United States. At the same time, James Rhodes had his own suit rebranded as Iron Patriot under President Matthew Ellis' direct orders. Mental Struggle Stark met with James Rhodes at Neptune's Net for lunch, where he spent much of his time mocking the new Iron Patriot identity, being told that it had tested well with focus groups. The government felt that War Machine was too violent a name, which would send the wrong message. Stark then asked Rhodes about the Mandarin's attacks, wanting to know the facts regarding the terrorist. Rhodes revealed the explosion's origins were unknown due to no bomb casings left behind. Stark argued that he was more than capable of helping with the mission thanks to his advanced Iron Legion, though Rhodes worried that his friend's recent actions were negatively impacting his health. Two children then approached and asked Stark to sign a drawn picture which he agreed to. The picture showed him in the Battle of New York diverting the missile into the portal above Stark Tower. As Rhodes continued insisting that Stark let the Pentagon handle the Mandarin since the public is still on edge from the Chitauri invasion, Stark suddenly lost focus and scribbled a message for help on the drawing, reminded of his near-death experience. The boy asked how Stark escaped the wormhole, leading him to experience a severe anxiety attack as he recalled what he had seen in the battle. Stark rushed to put on his Mark VII suit to test for any faults in his physiology, only to learn nothing was wrong. Taken aback, he then left to return home and resume work on his suits. After completing and storing away the Mark 42, Stark called Happy Hogan to get an update on what was happening at Stark Industries, where Hogan was now head of security. After Hogan complained about all of his experiences and embarrassments as Iron Man's bodyguard, he told Stark that Pepper Potts was currently having a pitch meeting with Aldrich Killian at his headquarters, although he failed to flip the screen to show Stark their conversation. Having discussed meeting Killian in Switzerland back in 1999, Stark and Hogan then conferred if Hogan should follow him, as he did not trust Killian nor the man's bodyguard, Eric Savin. While Hogan advised Stark to pay more attention to Potts, Stark said he missed his friend, with Hogan noting that he missed him too, but also how Stark spent more time with the Avengers now. Stark promptly hung up the call and left his phone inside the wine cellar to continue working. Anxiety Confession as Christmas was nearing, Stark decided to show Pepper Potts his love for her by buying a large stuffed bunny as her gift. Unfortunately, it was too big to fit through his mansion door, so he would need to have the wall taken down to get it inside. Deciding to test his new remote control unit, Stark had his Mark 42 armor sit on the sofa and wait for Potts to come home. Once she arrived and greeted him, Stark lied that he was breaking in the armor. However, his ruse fell apart when Potts wanted to open the armor to kiss him, she went down to Stark's workshop, catching him watching news reports on the Mandarin. Stark managed to quell Potts' anger by explaining how he's been feeling like an amateur in the big leagues since the Battle of New York. He's just a man in a suit against Asgardians, portals to other worlds, and the Chitari coming through. Stark then admitted that probably the only reason he had not snapped is because Potts moved in with him, for which he is greatly thankful. However, he has also been plagued by nightmares about these hostile forces attacking what he loves most, her. Because of this, Stark spent most of his time, even when Potts was asleep, building more and more of the Iron Legion to help protect her. Potts comforted him, understanding why he'd been so distant from her since getting involved with the Avengers. As she then left to wash up for bed, Potts turned around and offered to have Stark join her in the shower to cheer him up. Stark agreed, hoping not only to lighten his mood, but try closing the gap forming between them. Later that night, Stark attempted to have a good night's sleep, but suffered visions of himself in the Chitari invasion causing him to go into distress as he recalled almost dying while destroying the Chitari Command Center. Potts tried to rouse Stark until the Mark 42 armor came to his aid due to responding to his brainwaves, seeing her as a threat. Stark awoke and deactivated the armor before apologizing to a terrified Potts, who left him alone in bed. Threatening the Mandarin Happy Hogan was caught up in the destruction of the Chinese theater, 
seemingly caused by the Ten Rings working under the orders of the Mandarin. Stark visited his friend at the Los Angeles Mercy Hospital, ensuring that the nurses kept Downton Abbey, Hogan's favorite program, on television, and that they all wore ID tags since Hogan was a stickler for those. Having ensured that Hogan's health recovery was as comfortable as it could be, a distressed Stark prepared to return home while he was mobbed by the press who had requested a statement about the true cause of the blast. Stark ignored all of the questions and made his way to his car until he was stopped upon being asked if he would kill the Mandarin and put an end to his war against the United States. Stark immediately turned around upon being asked this. He then issued a public threat to the Mandarin, calling him a coward who hid behind the Ten Rings and would not dare face him alone. Without a second thought due to his rage at Hogan's injuries, Stark revealed the address of his Malibu mansion so they could face off. As he left, Stark smashed the reporter's phone and told him to send him the bill. This resulted in numerous news choppers flying around Stark's home waiting to film Iron Man vs. the Mandarin. Mandarin Research Stark ended up fighting with Pepper Potts over leaving the Malibu mansion for their own safety, since he carelessly gave up his real address. Stark spent his time in the workshop creating a database on the Mandarin and recreated the explosion which left Happy Hogan in a coma, searching for any clues that he could find as to what caused the fireball that had killed several people. With new information from S.H.I.E.L.D. databases, Stark tried to learn who the Mandarin really was. Viewing the holograph of Hogan, Stark found that he was pointing at a dog tag belonging to Jack Taggart near the center of the explosion. Using this clue, he looked for records of similar explosions of 3,000 degrees Celsius. Ruling out the Mandarin attacks, Stark eventually found one case in Rose Hill, Tennessee, seemingly caused by Chad Davis committing suicide with a bomb vest. To Stark's surprise, the doorbell rang. Jarvis informed him that there was only so much he could do since Stark had told the world his address. Donning the Mark 42, Stark confronted his visitor only to find Maya Hansen instead of the Mandarin. Stark eventually realized she was the botanist he met in Switzerland, but initially mistook Hansen's comments about needing to get him alone as an offer for sex. Stark turned her down, explaining that he was now in a happily committed relationship with Potts, which amused Hansen. At that moment, Potts dropped luggage from the second floor. Stark nervously asked Hansen if their one-night stand had resulted in a child. After teasing him by hinting this might be true, Hansen assured Stark that it was not the case and she needed to talk to him about the Mandarin, bluntly warning that he would be killed otherwise. As Hansen met Potts, Stark continued protesting her desire for them to leave the city, insisting he needed to confront the Mandarin and could better protect Potts if they stayed. When Hansen tried to help move them out, Stark stopped her and ended up yelling in frustration about the rabbit he had bought Potts. Destruction of Tony Stark's Mansion However, as Stark and Pepper Potts were still arguing about what action they should take next, Maya Hansen turned their attention towards their television, which showed a missile currently heading straight towards the mansion fired by Eric Savin. Before they could react, the missile struck the side of the mansion and sent the pair flying back. With seconds to spare before hitting the wall, Stark signaled his Mark 42 armor onto Potts, protecting her as they slammed into it, with Stark taking the brunt of the impact. Having been winded by the impact of striking the wall hard, Stark attempted to crawl away but noticed a large chunk of the ceiling was about to fall and crush him. However, Potts appeared wearing his armor and saved his life. Stark claimed to have always said it was not safe to stay in the mansion and told Potts that they needed to get out. Upon being separated as the mansion fell apart, Stark ordered Potts to get an unconscious Hansen to safety outside. While Potts pulled Hansen from the rubble, Stark was forced to avoid the helicopter's attacks as they tried to shoot him down. Once Jarvis confirmed that Potts and Hansen made it outside, Stark summoned the armor back to himself. Still avoiding the gunshots, Stark collected all of the sections of the Iron Man armor, getting saved from a bullet in the back just in time, before triumphantly rising to his feet as he prepared to fight back against his attackers. Iron Man was unable to call upon the Iron Legion due to the mansion falling apart around him and trapping them under rubble, so he was forced to defend himself using the new prototype armor which lacked the offensive abilities of his battle armors. Despite being warned by Jarvis that both the suit's flight and weapons protocols were not ready and needed time to charge, Iron Man continued fending off the helicopters surrounding him. When a missile had failed to fire, he then simply threw it at the helicopter and shot it with his repulsor, destroying the helicopter in the resulting explosion while the others still fired. Taking out a second helicopter by launching his grand piano at it, Iron Man had another missile fire at him and fell through the floor into his workshop. Iron Man helplessly watched as Dummy and Yu were destroyed, along with his armors from Mark 1 to Mark 7, which were consumed in fireballs. 
Having been outgunned, Iron Man was pulled into the ocean while his home and possessions were all demolished over him, as the suit was still without adequate power to fly himself to safety. As the Mark 42 began filling with water causing Iron Man to begin drowning, Savin and the other attack choppers circled above the wreckage looking for any signs of life. Iron Man was saved when Jarvis took control of his gauntlet and used it to pull him out of the wreckage and fly away just in time as the power had been restored. Escaping, Iron Man lost consciousness from the strain and left Jarvis in charge of the suit's flight path. Back to basics. Stark found himself in Rose Hill, Tennessee after Jarvis followed his initial flight plan to locate the Mandarin. Unfortunately, since the Mark 42 was still a prototype and highly damaged from use, it lacked the link to the arc reactor to sustain its own power. Therefore, Stark awoke just as the suit crash-landed in the middle of rural Ross Hill and lost power, including the link to Jarvis. This left Stark in the cold with nothing left but his own genius to help him find a solution. Lacking the power to return to California and with the world at large believing him to be dead from the destruction of his mansion, Stark dragged the Mark 42 behind him as he looked for shelter. Finding a phone booth, Stark called his system back home, leaving a private message for Pepper Potts, apologizing for putting her in harm's way. Stark stated that he still had to find the Mandarin and therefore he could not return home just yet, urging Potts to protect herself in the meantime. Stark broke into a garage belonging to the family of a 10-year-old Harley Keener, where he laid down the Mark 42 and attempted to fix the damaged parts until he was discovered by Keener. Despite being threatened with a potato gun, Stark found that he got along well with Keener, who soon reminded Stark of a younger version of himself, a child genius. Keener admired the Mark 42 armor and had recommended using the new retro reflection panels to create a stealth armor, although he claimed to prefer the Iron Patriot name over War Machine for James Rhodes, which Stark highly disagreed with. Having discussed Keener's home life where he was growing up without a father, Stark mocked him by noting his own father was not there for him. Stark then requested that Keener find him a digital watch, a cell phone, a map of town, a big spring, and a tuna fish sandwich. Stark offered Keener a flash grenade from his suit in exchange, recognizing the signs of a kid being bullied, which Keener accepted while Stark demanded he get his sandwich. Stark enlisted Keener's help in finding the truth behind the terrorist bombings seemingly involving the Ten Rings and the Mandarin. Upon examining the site of the explosion, Stark realized something was amiss as there was no ash imprint of Chad Davis, who died, and the blast was similar to the destruction of the Chinese theater, with no bomb parts being found. However, when Keener started asking him about the Battle of New York, the Avengers, and whether or not the Chitauri would return, Stark started having another panic attack. At this point, Stark admitted that he should have been on medication to deal with his post-traumatic stress disorder. Having pulled himself back together and thrown a snowball at Keener, Stark asked where Mrs. Davis could be found, with Keener directing him to a local bar. Battle of Rose Hill Seeking information, Stark set up a meeting with Mrs. Davis, the mother of recently killed extremist-infected soldier Chad Davis. Arriving outside Walker's where he had been told he could find Davis, Stark bumped into Ellen Brandt, who complimented his Door the Explorer watch, which he proudly noted was limited edition while also complimenting Brandt. Inside, Stark soon found Mrs. Davis, offering her his condolences for the death of her son. To Stark's surprise, Davis handed him a file on her son's work with AIM, which he had not asked for and held key information regarding Chad's death, showing that he had worked along with Jack Taggart. Stark told Davis that he believed her son did not commit suicide, but was instead used as a weapon, at which point Davis realized Stark was not who she expected. Stark and Davis were then interrupted by Brandt, who revealed she was the one that contacted Davis and attempted to arrest Stark. When the Rose Hill Sheriff tried to stop this and questioned what was happening, Brandt claimed to be from Homeland Security before she suddenly used her extremist powers to murder the sheriff while Davis hid the file and Stark ran out, still handcuffed. Outside, Stark encountered Eric Savin, forcing him to run for his safety. Harley Keener briefly distracted Savin before he could shoot Stark. Pursued by Brandt into a restaurant, Stark was forced to fight against the highly trained soldier with no weapons to defend himself. As they fought, Stark noticed that Brandt could heal from most injuries and superheat anything she touched. Stark bought himself time to set up a bomb by igniting some fuel with his cuffs to block Brandt's way. While Brandt walked through the flames, Stark put Chad's dog tags in the microwave and opened a gas valve. As she stepped inside the kitchen, Stark joked that he had dated hotter girls than Brandt, who is currently on fire and she questioned if those would be his final words. Stark replied that they could be the title of his autobiography before fleeing outside and hiding behind an ice machine. 
An explosion then erupted, killing Brant. As Stark recovered from his fight with Brant, he suddenly witnessed Savin using his own extremist powers to bring a water tower crashing down, trapping Stark underneath all of the debris. Savin then held Keener hostage in order to regain Davis' file, but Stark reminded Keener about the flash grenade he had given him from the Mark 42 armor. This allowed Keener to escape, allowing Stark to then blast Savin with a secret spare repulsor. Stealing Savin's car keys from his pocket, Stark commandeered his car, taking off with the file from Davis. As Stark prepared to leave, he was followed by Keener, who insisted that Stark thank him for saving him from Savin. But Stark insisted that Keener instead go home to his mother and protect the Mark 42 armor until Stark contacted him. As he left, Stark did thank Keener for all his help, but teased him as he drove out of Rose Hill. Locating the Mandarin While driving Eric Savin's car, Stark called James Rhodes, who was overseas hunting down the Mandarin as well. Stark reminded Rhodes how last time he had vanished, Rhodes had searched for him before requesting the login to his commsat. Rhodes eventually revealed that his password was War Machine Rocks, much to Stark's great amusement and Rhodes' own embarrassment. Stark found a nearby pageant and broke into a WZPZ van in order to use their computers to find out what he needed to know. While inside, Stark was confronted by the cameraman Gary, who froze upon realizing who was there as he was a huge fan of Stark and the Avengers, noting that he had not believed Stark was killed in the destruction of his mansion. Stark amused all of Gary's requests to show his tattoo of Stark and recruited his help. Stark used Gary's own satellite connection to hack into Ames' systems, which the file reported was responsible for Chad Davis' death. He watched footage of Aldrich Killian recruiting Davis along with Ellen Brandt and Jack Taggart before they were injected with Extremis, which enhanced their strength and regrew their limbs. Upon seeing one test subject exploding, Stark realized Killian must have sold his technology to the Ten Rings to use as human weapons. Stark called Harley Keener to check on how the suit was doing. The armor was now 58% charged, and Jarvis kept saying the wrong word at the end of each sentence. Asking for the Mandarin's location, Stark heard Miami was it. Thinking Jarvis had misspoke again, Stark asked Keener to read it aloud. To Stark's shock, the location was correct. This sent him into a panic attack as he did not have any of his armors or a way to call in the Avengers to help. Trying to keep Stark calm as he recalled the Battle of New York, which made him panic even more, Keener suggested that Stark build his own gadgets if he would now have to defend himself when he would confront both Killian and the Mandarin. The sudden thought of being independent and focusing on his work snapped Stark out of his panic attack as he drove away towards a gardening store to buy some supplies, MacGyvering them into makeshift weapons. Aldrich Killian's War With all of his new homemade gadgets now ready, Stark prepared to infiltrate the Mandarin's home and finally confront and possibly even kill the terrorist in revenge for all of the lives he had endangered, including Happy Hogan. Taking position outside the walls, Stark used binoculars to spy on the compound, spotting several guards watching the entire area as he planned to get past them. Jumping over the wall, Stark infiltrated the mansion as quickly as he could. Using all of his wits and fighting skills, Stark successfully and swiftly knocked out several of the guards, using his newly made gadgets to gain the advantage as he fired knockout darts at the guards and used an electrified glove and homemade grenades to get past them all. Stark eventually made it inside the building, where he continued to search through the rooms for the Mandarin. Stark eventually found a large bedroom filled with movie props, along with the Mandarin's wardrobe. There were also signs that someone was living inside and Stark came upon two half-naked women in the bed. Hearing someone enter from the bathroom, Stark then hid. The Mandarin entered, speaking in a British accent. Stark ambushed him, holding the Mandarin at gunpoint, and was surprised by the sudden cowardly reaction from the terrorist, demanding answers. To his horror, Stark soon learned that the Mandarin was nothing more than a character that the actor, Trevor Slattery, had been hired to play. Slattery was given endless amounts of drugs and anything else he desired in return for taking the blame for the explosions. The person who had employed him was Aldrich Killian, who needed to cover up the failures of his extremist program. Just then, Stark was knocked unconscious by Eric Savin, who took him hostage. Aldrich Killian's Hostage Upon awakening in captivity at Aldrich Killian's mansion, Stark was shocked and angered to learn that Maya Hansen was working for AIM. She had used the formula he wrote down in a drunken daze after their night together to better stabilize extremists, but needed money so she joined Killian. Although having forgotten all about that equation, Stark refused to help Hansen better understand it, and expressed his disgust over losing her soul since he remembered her as a woman who used to have a moral psychology and a sense of right and wrong. Stark tried to appeal to what remained of Hansen's humanity to make her help him escape. 
Their conversation was interrupted when Killian arrived and revealed the reasons behind Aim's actions, and how he was grateful to Stark for teaching him that he needed to control the chaos from behind the scenes. Killian expressed that since Stark left him behind on the roof in Switzerland, it gave him a sense of desperation, which changed his life. Killian went on to discuss Trevor Slattery's role as the Mandarin, acknowledging his over-the-top personality. Killian compared Slattery's Mandarin performance to him creating a terrorist like Osama bin Laden or Muammar Gaddafi to blame his failures on. Expressing his desire for Stark to suffer desperation, Killian revealed he had captured Pepper Potts and was infecting her with extremists, leaving her in danger of exploding. Stark would be now forced to help improve extremists in order to save Potts' life, with Killian cruelly noting how much pain she was currently in. While Stark struggled to look at the video feed of the woman he loved suffering, Killian offered to pay him for helping them and began to strangle Stark. Hansen, realizing he had gone too far, demanded Stark's release by threatening to kill herself with an overdose of extremists and wound Killian in the blast, while depriving him of his chief researcher. Stark watched in horror and sadness as Killian murdered her without any remorse. As Killian left Stark to think about his next move, Stark angrily called him a maniac for killing Hansen, while Killian claimed to be a visionary. Breakout. Stark was left guarded by two of Aldrich Killian's henchmen, one of whom broke Harley Keener's sister's watch. Once he learned the correct time, Stark worked out that his suit would be charged by now and offered the henchmen, one of whom he nicknamed Ponytail Express, a chance to escape, believing it would arrive in seconds. However, this led to an awkward period of Stark awaiting his suit, which took considerably longer than he expected to arrive. The reason being that the doors to Keener's barn the pieces were being kept in were chained shut and therefore the rest of the armor was trapped. Summoning his Mark 42 all the way from Keener's home, Stark was given one of his gauntlets, which he used to shoot Ponytail Express and free himself. A boot then attached itself onto Stark's leg to give him the advantage in the fight against his captors, although Stark still questioned where the rest of the armor was. Having escaped captivity, Stark was forced to battle several guards from AIM, despite only getting a hand and a leg part of his suit for the duration of the fight. Stark found that this greatly affected how he could fight, as he struggled to maintain control of flying while wearing only the pieces of armor that he had. When one guard grabbed Stark from behind, Stark used the boot's repulsor to launch himself backwards and knock out the guard, stealing his gun in the process. Keener soon freed the rest of the parts of the Mark 42, knowing that Stark was in need of his armor. Once the guards were all knocked out, Stark prepared to shoot the last one, only to be amused when the man quickly surrendered to him as he claimed to hate working for Killian and AIM. The rest of the suit arrived and Stark made his way through the facility. He greeted Jarvis while seeing the Iron Patriot armor fly off, with his own suit failing to fly. To Stark's surprise, he ran into James Rhodes, who he thought was in the armor. It turned out that the Iron Patriot suit was stolen by Eric Savin in order to kidnap President Matthew Ellis. Needing a way to go after Killian, Stark and Rhodes interrogated Trevor Slattery, waking him from another drunken stupor. Seeking to save the President, Stark remembered that Slattery had been given a speedboat from Killian and demanded it. On board Slattery's boat, Stark called Vice President Rodriguez to warn him that President Ellis was about to be attacked by Savin, posing as the Iron Patriot, with Rodriguez informing them that Ellis was about to board Air Force One. After Rodriguez promised to handle the situation, Stark and Rhodes next discussed who they had time to save, Pepper Potts or President Ellis. Stark decided to remote control his armor so that they could save both of them. Saving the Air Force One Crew to protect President Matthew Ellis, Stark remote-controlled his armor to Air Force One, where Eric Savin had already forced President Ellis into the Iron Patriot armor and sent it away. Fighting Savin, Iron Man's armor was briefly disabled by the man's extremist powers, but he soon managed to shoot directly through Savin's chest and kill him, though at the cost of the plane falling apart around him. To his horror, Iron Man witnessed all of the passengers on board being sucked out of the plane through a hole caused by a bomb Savin had planted and now plummeting thousands of feet to the ocean below. With everyone else falling, Iron Man flew out of Air Force One just before it exploded, asking Jarvis how he could save them all. Jarvis informed him that the Mark 42 could not carry that many people at the same time. Iron Man grabbed a hold of Heather and told her, in turn, to grab whoever she could reach, explaining that he would send a shockwave through her body so that Heather could not let go of them. Iron Man saved two other passengers while diving down to collect the others, quickly running out of time as they fell toward the ocean. Forming a human chain by the passengers grabbing each other, Iron Man dove for the final passenger once everyone was linked. With everyone now connected, Iron Man used his thrusters to give them more height before he then safely deposited them in a river. As the people cheered in celebration, Iron Man ensured that they were all okay and complimented the group before turning around to return the boat and save Pepper Potts. 
However, when Iron Man was not looking, the armor was knocked apart by an incoming truck, smashing into pieces across the road. Still back on board the boat, Stark took off his Mark 42 telepresence headset and confirmed to James Rhodes that he had indeed saved the passengers. As they prepared to move on to find Potts and Aldrich Killian, Stark was then informed by Jarvis that the rubble had been cleared out from his Malibu mansion, finally allowing him to reactivate the Iron Legion. Stark ordered Jarvis to send the suits to him, ready for the next battle against Killian's soldiers. Battle on the Norco Stark and James Rhodes had eventually traced Aldrich Killian to an impounded oil tanker called the Norco, where he now intended to kill President Matthew Ellis on live television. Sneaking in, they were attacked by several extremist soldiers. Stark fired his gun at the soldiers, but was unable to stop them due to poor aim, which Rhodes mocked him about. Taking out a light from a long distance, Rhodes quickly proved himself to be the superior marksman due to his training in the armed forces, which greatly annoyed Stark. Outnumbered, Stark summoned the Iron Legion to their aid, all of which were currently being controlled by Jarvis, except the Mark 42, which was running late after trying to save the President in Air Force One. Rhodes looked on in amazement as all of the armors flew in together and lined up, awaiting the orders of Stark. Taking delight in his achievements, Stark then wished Jarvis a Merry Christmas before sending all of the armors into battle, ordering them to target the extremist soldiers with extreme prejudice. Stark watched the battle unfolding, ordering Mark 38 to hold up the platform under them, and Mark 17 to assist Mark 35 in the fight. Stark donned the Mark 33 suit and prepared to fly into battle, as Rhodes requested his own armor to fight in. Stark, however, revealed that the armors were only coded to himself, and therefore, he had to send the Mark 17 to carry Rhodes to find both President Ellis and the Iron Patriot armor, much to Rhodes' annoyance. Stark then flew across the battlefield in search of Pepper Potts so that he could take her away from the battle towards safety. While his suits continued to fight all of the enhanced soldiers, with several of the armors being torn apart by their extremist powers, Iron Man eventually found Potts unharmed underneath wreckage from a recent explosion. He mocked her about all of this happening because she spent time with Maya Hansen, while trying to get her out without risking the structure falling and crushing her. Reaching out, Iron Man and Potts were able to grab each other's hands. However, before Stark could free Potts, Aldrich Killian unexpectedly attacked him and damaged the armor's arc reactor. Pinning Iron Man down, Killian began slowly burning through his suit with his finger, taunting that Stark should close his eyes and die. Refusing to give in, however, Stark was forced to cut off Killian's arm with the armor's hidden blade and eject from the suit, only for Killian's still red-hot severed arm to burn through the floor underneath Potts. Seeing that Potts was trapped and being pulled towards a sheer edge, Stark charged through the battlefield as he demanded that Jarvis provide him with a new suit. As he ran across the Norco, Stark failed to get a new armor and was informed that Rhodes had rescued President Ellis and was taking him to safety. With all of the extremist soldiers being kept at bay, Stark began catching up with Potts and leaped from one platform to the other to get to her. Approaching as close as he could, Stark was still unable to quite reach Potts and begged her to reach out for him as he stretched as far as he could to try and save her life. However, Stark was then forced to watch in utter horror as a jolt from the platform Potts was on caused her to lose her grip and she fell into a pit of fire 200 feet below to a certain death. Stark looked on with complete heartbreak and devastation as he failed to protect the one person he could not live without. Showdown with Aldrich Killian While Stark continued to react in horror, Aldrich Killian then appeared and mocked him, claiming that if he was in Stark's position, he would have caught Pepper Potts. Infuriated, Stark then ran forward in order to engage in a final fight with Killian. When Killian leaped into the air to strike Stark, he then dived underneath him and donned the Mark 16 armor. Even with his armor on, Tony found Killian was the superior fighter and the situation was made even worse by his extremist abilities, which could penetrate any armor with relative ease. Killian used his red-hot limbs to cut through the metal armor and attempt to kill Iron Man. As their duel continued, Iron Man did all he could to subdue Killian, but found that the man could withstand and heal from any strike and his strength also surpassed Stark's, even tearing off part of the armor from Stark's left hand and healing from having his own left hand broken when they clashed their fists. When he was pinned down, Iron Man again exited his suit to avoid Killian's burning fist. Having launched himself off the edge of the platform, Iron Man then donned the Mark 40 in midair and attacked Killian once again. Iron Man flew Killian across the battlefield but was still unable to tire him out, as all of his attempts to stop Killian were met with superhuman combat attacks and his armor was once again cut to pieces by Killian's extremist powers. Killian almost cut off Iron Man's leg before Stark was finally able to gain the upper hand. Iron Man was able to avoid death once again by ejecting out of his suit seconds before Killian ripped it apart with his bare hands, falling hard on his back to the platform below. 
Standing alone on the platform, Stark, now armorless due to the rest of the Iron Legion being preoccupied with his command to destroy all of Killian's extremist soldiers, awaited the arrival of the Mark 42 but was soon deflated when it crashed and disassembled once again. Amused at Stark's failed attempt to don another armor to continue fighting against him, Killian mockingly spoke to Stark about him not deserving pots and claiming that he was close to making her perfect in his eyes by experimenting on her with extremists. Stark agreed that Killian was right and that he did not deserve pots, but he retorted that she already was perfect before sending the Mark 42 onto Killian, trapping him with all the thrusters on full power, eventually pinning him against the wall. As Killian yelled out in anger at seemingly being defeated, Stark then ordered Jarvis to activate the armor's self-destruct protocol while he escaped. Diving off the platform, Stark avoided the massive explosion behind him, which seemingly destroyed Killian once and for all. As the fireball continued to grow and destroyed most of the Norco, Stark summoned the Mark 15 to catch him as he jumped to safety, only for the armor to fail on the way down by crashing into the platform, causing Stark to crash land, barely avoiding all of the flames and the debris that followed him down from the explosion. Suit Destruction Lying on the ground, a battered Stark watched as the Mark 42 helmet fell into the fire before him and broke apart. Suddenly, Aldrich Killian emerged from the flames with most of his own skin destroyed seemingly beyond extremist ability of reconstruction, and still intent on Stark's death. Stark was now powerless and at the mercy of Killian, who proclaimed himself the Mandarin, saying that he was from the start. During this tirade, Pepper Potts, still alive due to the extremists in her system, struck Killian to the ground with a large metal pipe, to which Stark was left speechless. The Mark IX armor flew downward in an attack position, and Stark failed to tell Jarvis to disengage due to losing his earpiece. Potts then jumped off his knee to impale the suit and don one of its gauntlets. Stark watched as Potts sent Killian flying backwards and threw a missile at him, blowing it up with a repulsor blast. With Killian and all the extremist soldiers now dead for good, Stark approached the confused Potts, who took a minute to realize the violence of what she had done while under the influence of extremists. Stark and Potts teased each other about how she had thought she was dead while she joked about who was the bigger hot mess now. Stark apologized to Potts and promised to find a cure for her powers, joking that a relationship with him would always be a mess. Seeing that Potts was still worried about their future together, Stark decided to give her another early Christmas present and finally ordered Jarvis to destroy all of his remaining Iron Legion armors in operation. Clean Slate Protocol Surrounded by the firework-like explosions in the sky, the couple embraced, with Stark asking if Potts was enjoying the show, which she said she did, as he accepted a life without such an obsession of being Iron Man. A Step Further Stark was able to use his vast resources to cure Pepper Potts of the extremists, removing her superhuman abilities. Stark used the cure to develop a method to extract the shrapnel within his heart without dying, and two days later, Stark underwent surgery from Dr. Wu in Hong Kong to have it removed. He used the pieces of shrapnel that had been removed by Dr. Wu to make a necklace, which he gave to Potts. Since Tony Stark's mansion had been destroyed by Aldrich Killian and Eric Savin, Stark and Potts moved in together at Stark Tower, which he had now redesigned and renamed Avengers Tower, ready if he would ever again need to rejoin the Avengers for a future mission to save the world. Returning to his home's wreckage, Stark threw his arc reactor into the ocean, vowing that he was still Iron Man. He took the remains of his dummy and you to repair. Stark retired from the hero business for at least a year, but continued to work on as a consultant for S.H.I.E.L.D. and to run Stark Industries. He began helping S.H.I.E.L.D. by making repulsor technology for their three new helicarriers, to avoid the issue that happened during the attack on the helicarrier. Therapy Session in the wake of his battle with Aldrich Killian and all of the stress he had endured from the Battle of New York aftermath, Stark retold the entire story to Bruce Banner in the Avengers Tower. Much to Stark's great annoyance, Banner had fallen asleep during the tale, telling his friend that he was not that kind of doctor. Stark ignored this comment and then began telling more stories of his life, much to the dismay of Banner, who proceeded to go back to sleep. Project Insight Tony Stark was listed as another potential target of Project Insight by Hydra. Luckily, Captain America was able to stop Hydra in time to save all of Hydra's intended victims. In the wake of the fall of S.H.I.E.L.D., Stark hired Maria Hill, utilizing his army of lawyers to protect Hill in order to help him fill the void left by S.H.I.E.L.D.'s absence by privatizing global security. As a result of Hydra's return, the Avengers were reassembled and Iron Man signed up. Attack on the Hydra Research Base As they tracked down Hydra's current leader, Baron Strucker, the reassembled Avengers came into conflict with Dr. Jensen in Sudan as she was using Chitauri weaponry. Working as a team, the Avengers defeated Jensen. 
With the help of Phil Coulson and the newly rebuilt S.H.I.E.L.D., Iron Man and the other Avengers attacked Strucker's Hydra research base to battle Hydra's leadership. While the other Avengers fought the soldiers on the ground, Iron Man worked on destroying the base's shields to allow the team access. When Iron Man swore during the mission, Captain America told him to watch his language, much to Iron Man's amusement. When the people of Slovakia began being targeted by all of Strucker's guns, Iron Man ordered Jarvis to send out the Iron Legion in order to get the innocent people back to the safety of their homes. Iron Man soon managed to disable the shields and entered the base, subduing all of Strucker's soldiers with ease. Once inside, Iron Man killed List, who was attempting to delete his files before making his way through the hallways. Removing the Mark 43, Stark scanned the room in order to find a secret hallway, hoping to find all of Strucker and List's secret experiments while being informed that during the battle Hawkeye had been badly injured. While Captain America had successfully captured Baron Strucker, Stark located inside the base the corpse of a Leviathan, which Hydra had stolen after the Battle of New York, and the Scepter, which had last been seen in S.H.I.E.L.D.'s hands having been taken away from Loki. While Stark was looking at the Scepter and prepared to take it back into the Avengers' custody, Scarlet Witch snuck up behind him and gave him a vision of the future with her powers. In the vision, Stark saw the Avengers lying dead after a mysterious battle against a powerful enemy. As Stark explored the battlefield, he saw the deaths of his teammates, with Captain America's shield lying broken in half. Going to Steve Rogers, Stark was surprised when Rogers grabbed his hand, telling him that Stark could have saved them before dying. Stark looked up and saw the Leviathans and Chitari heading to Earth through a portal in space. Shaken by what he had seen, Maximoff allowed Stark to retrieve the scepter, knowing its power would ultimately cause his own downfall. Unaware that he was now being watched by Maximoff and her twin brother Pietro, Stark reclaimed the Mark 43 gauntlet and used it to snatch the scepter away, originally planning on giving it back to Thor to take back to Asgard to keep the Earth safe from its power, but Stark now had some new ideas about using it. With Baron Strucker now in the custody of the United States Armed Forces, Stark flew the Avengers away from Slovakia on board the Quinjet. Along the way, Stark asked Bruce Banner if it was okay for Dr. Helen Cho to set up all of her own equipment in his lab, so that she could begin the operation to save Clint Barton's life in the wake of his injuries during the battle. As they came closer to their destination, Stark had put Jarvis in charge of flying while he spoke with Thor and Captain America about what was to happen with Loki's scepter, now that they had finally recovered it from Hydra. Stark requested that he be allowed the chance to study the scepter before Thor returned it to Asgard to be kept safe, which Thor agreed to before they all discussed having a party to celebrate the capture of Baron Von Strucker. Upon arriving at Avengers Tower, Stark was greeted by both Dr. Cho and Maria Hill, with Stark correcting Hill when she called him boss, claiming that Rogers was the boss despite Stark paying for everything they did. While the Iron Legion returned to the tower, Stark checked on Barton's condition while Cho used the regeneration cradle to repair his damaged skin tissue, with Stark teasing Barton that he was dying while Barton insisted that he would now live forever. Continuing his mindset toward protecting humanity while realizing the void that the downfall of S.H.I.E.L.D. created, Stark created an intelligence with the mandate to ensure global peace at any cost. The intelligence, Ultron, who in turn took control on the Ultron sentries to defend humanity as a sort of makeshift army and allow the Avengers to retire. Seeking to push the Ultron program forward, Stark recruited Banner by pitching the program to him and showing him a detailed breakdown of the Mind Stone inside the Scepter, claiming that they could use its detailed brainwaves to give life to Ultron, something they had failed to do in all of their past experiments. When Banner expressed his doubts about the Ultron program, Stark argued if they were successful they could finally retire and Banner may not have to worry about facing Veronica. Claiming that with Ultron the next Chitauri invasion would never happen again, Stark told Banner that he had a vision of a suit of armor around the Earth. When Banner claimed that this sounded like a cold world, Stark said he had seen colder, referring to Scarlet Witch's vision. With Banner now on board, he and Stark spent the next three days before they returned to Asgard to attempt to sink the Mind Stone from the Scepter into the Ultron program, in order to finally give life to Ultron. However, after three days of constant experimentation with the system, Stark and Banner admitted defeat, believing that there was no way for Ultron to be given life. Jarvis recommended that Stark leave the project and attend to his party guests. The Avengers Party at a party hosted at Avengers Tower, celebrating their recent defeat of Hydra and the capture of the Scepter and Hydra's current leader Baron Strucker, Stark welcomed not only his own teammates but also several allies of the team, such as Sam Wilson and Maria Hill, with Dr. Helen Cho agreeing to attend the party as she had heard that Thor would also be attending. Stark also decided to invite several World War II veterans to the party who spent their time with Thor and Steve Rogers, drinking ancient Asgardian alcohol which got one attendee too drunk to walk. 
While attending with Thor, Stark listened as James Rhodes attempted to impress them with stories of how he had secured a tank while in his war machine armor, with nobody impressed. Stark and Thor then began debating if either Pepper Potts or Jane Foster was the more impressive girlfriend, with Stark noting all of Potts' work with Stark Industries, which caused Rhodes to walk away with Hill, leaving Stark and Thor to continue the girlfriend debate alone. As the party went through the night, many of the attendees returned home, including Wilson leaving Stark and the Avengers along with Hill and Cho as the only remaining non-team members there. As the remaining group joked and drank together around a table, they began to discuss Thor and his power to lift his hammer. As the debate went on, Clint Barton decided to try to lift it himself, with Stark joking about him not being able to get it up. Stark then stepped up, joking that he wanted to rule Asgard if he picked it up. Stark initially tried to lift it on his own. When that failed, he called for the help of James Rhodes to no more avail, even with the Mark 43 gauntlet. All of the other Avengers then each decided to have a go at lifting the hammer, with Bruce Banner joking about hulking out, and Steve Rogers only slightly moved it, while Natasha Romanoff refused to even try. Upon his defeat, Stark looked for fingerprint recognition software on the hammer, which Thor still denied. Attack on Avengers Tower As the group laughed, a sudden loud ring echoed through Avengers Tower, and they turned to see one of the Iron Legion robots stepping out of the darkness to confront them. While Stark tried to get Jarvis to shut down the robot, it introduced itself as Ultron, claiming that it was there for peace in their time. When questioned about its true intentions, Ultron told them it intended to destroy the Avengers in order to achieve peace as they listened in horror. Ultron then sent out all of his sentries to attack the Avengers. Without his Mark 43 armor to defend himself, Stark was quickly separated from James Rhodes and was forced to use whatever had come to hand to battle the robots. Grabbing a knife, Stark jumped onto the back of one of the many attacking robots that he had once designed himself and attempted to damage its inner wiring in mid-air eventually succeeding as they fell to the floor together. In the wake of the brief battle, which concluded when Hawkeye had handed Captain America his shield which he used to destroy the final robot, Stark and the Avengers were faced with the main Ultron form. Refusing to listen to the robot's threats to them any longer, Thor then destroyed Ultron's robot body with his hammer, although one of its own sentries had already escaped with the scepter in its hand and claimed that it would attack all of the Avengers again. Team Argument with the Avengers now all gathered together, Stark began examining the Ultron robot to understand what caused it to attack them all. He listened closely as it was soon learned that Ultron had successfully accessed Avenger Tower's files and escaped through the internet, with James Rhodes and Maria Hill worrying that he may also gain access into the nuclear codes. When it was noted that Ultron had claimed to have killed somebody, Stark revealed that he had learned that Ultron had destroyed Jarvis' mainframe in a rage. While Stark and Helen Cho discussed Ultron's possible motives for turning against him, Thor then stormed in and grabbed Stark by the throat, accusing him of bringing destruction onto the Earth. Thor explained that he had lost the scepter, claiming Ultron was created by Stark messing with something he did not understand. As Stark started to laugh, despite Bruce Banner telling him to stop, he claimed it was funny that they did not understand why it was needed. Stark defended himself, claiming that he was coming up with a new solution to end the war that would destroy the Earth based on the vision recently given to him by the Scarlet Witch. Stark then recalled the Battle of New York, claiming that what was out in space would destroy them if they all did not plan ahead. As Steve Rogers claimed that they could beat that threat as a team, Stark claimed they would fail, with Rogers telling him they would still be a team. Seeking leads, the team began searching for wherever Ultron was heading next, and later learned that Ultron had built himself a new body and had murdered Baron Strucker in his prison cell and had recruited the aid of Wanda and Pietro Maximoff. Upon learning of Baron Strucker's death, it was noted that this was likely a smokescreen to throw them off, with all of their own information on Strucker having been deleted off of their computers. Forced to use old S.H.I.E.L.D. files, the team researched anyone who was connected to Strucker who may be able to find a new lead. Stark soon pointed out Ulysses Clow, noting that he had almost done a deal with him to sell Stark Industries weapons. Stark explained that Clow was known for having a brand on his neck that marked him as a thief of Wakanda, the land where vibranium was made, so they all assumed that Ultron would go to him for the medal. Hunting Ultron Stark led the team to Johannesburg where they found Ultron, along with Pietro and Wanda Maximoff, taking the vibranium having just cut off Ulysses Clow's arm in a fit of rage. Confronting Ultron, Iron Man attempted to talk him into surrendering, but Ultron refused with the Maximoff siblings backing him up and insulting Iron Man's legacy. When Iron Man questioned what the vibranium was for, Ultron responded by suddenly attacking Iron Man. 
They engaged in a fierce battle, with Iron Man taking on Ultron alone, while Thor and Captain America fought the Ultron sentries and the Maximov twins, and both Hawkeye and the Black Widow fighting against all of Klaus' soldiers, who had come to defend their own employer following Ultron's assault on him. As their battle continued, Iron Man and Ultron flew out of the Churchill and across the salvage yard, still firing all their own weapons at each other. Eventually, Iron Man brought down Ultron and threatened him with a missile. However, Ultron revealed that he had already transferred his mind into another sentry body and explained that the team had been mentally taken down by Scarlet Witch, who had proceeded to cause Bruce Banner to transform into Hulk in the middle of South Africa and had started to destroy everything he could. Responding by destroying Ultron, Iron Man then went after Hulk. Duel of Johannesburg Knowing that many innocent civilians would undoubtedly be killed in Hulk's rampage, Iron Man was forced to leave Ultron behind and called on Black Widow to try and calm Banner down, only to be told by Hawkeye that Romanoff was unable to go into battle. Iron Man called upon his Mark 44 and Veronica in an attempt to subdue Hulk himself. However, despite soon being trapped inside Veronica's enforced and electrified metal cage, the enraged Hulk soon managed to break himself free. Ordering the South African police to stand down from the fight, Iron Man tried to get through to Bruce Banner by telling him that Scarlet Witch was messing with his mind telling him that Banner was stronger and smarter than her. However, the mention of Banner's name only seemed to enrage Hulk even further. When all of Iron Man's attempts to calm Hulk down had failed, the two began to fight. Hulk launched a car at Iron Man, knocking him back, so Iron Man responded by flying to Hulk and dragging him face first through the concrete. When Hulk damaged the armor, Stark called for extra parts and used its many capabilities to try to knock Hulk down. With Hulk charging at him, Iron Man kept him at bay with his gauntlet beam while his arm was repaired. Hulk charged forward and the pair smashed their fists into each other, causing a shockwave through Johannesburg. Pinning Hulk to the ground, Iron Man began repeatedly punching him in the face and begging him to go to sleep and finish their fight. However, Hulk's rage only continued to build. Iron Man attempted to trap his arm with the Hulkbuster armor and fly him out of the city in order to protect the people, with Hulk still fighting back. As Iron Man attempted to fly Hulk out of the city, he continued to fight back and forced Iron Man to crash land on the side of a large building. As Hulk tried to rip him apart, Iron Man pushed him against a wall and tried spraying gas in his face, although this tactic had almost no effect. As they continued fighting, Iron Man was aware that behind him an elevator filled with people were standing just feet away from the battle as they attempted to escape. When he was kicked back with incredible force, Iron Man crashed into the elevator filled with innocent people forcing him to catch it before it hit the ground as he ordered everyone to get out while they still could. Iron Man then proceeded to use the elevator as a weapon as he slammed it down onto Hulk's head. Once Hulk was stunned, Iron Man hit him across the face, knocking out one of his teeth, an action which Iron Man then soon regretted. The enraged Hulk then proceeded to smash Iron Man across the city, attempting to rip out the arc reactors powering the Mark 44 armor. Despite trying to get assistance from Veronica, Hulk proved to be too strong as he tore the armor apart. Eventually, Iron Man resorted to dropping Hulk through a building still going through construction. This massive impact seemingly calmed Hulk enough that Stark could knock him out with a final massive punch to the head. The Barton Home With the battle over, the Avengers were flown away on the Quinjet. Stark spoke with Maria Hill who told him of all the reactions to the Avengers' actions in South Africa and talks for Bruce Banner's arrest. Hill also suggested that they should go somewhere to rest. Clint Barton told Stark to get some sleep because they would land soon. When Stark asked him where they were going, Barton responded that they were going to a safe house. They landed in a countryside and entered into a small house. The team was surprised to learn that it was Barton's family home and that he has a wife and children. Although Stark at first assumed it was a lie as Barton was a S.H.I.E.L.D. spy, Barton explained to them that the reason the team was still unaware of his family was due to director Nick Fury helping him to have the second peaceful life just outside S.H.I.E.L.D., where his family could be safe. Stark and Steve Rogers went outside and chopped wood together. They discussed how Scarlet Witch had been able to use her new powers to pull the team apart. When the conversation moved to how Stark and Banner inadvertently created Ultron, they then proceeded to argue and debate on simply whether or not Stark should have ever experimented on Loki's scepter. Stark explained his action by using the argument that the reason they fight is to end the fight. Just as Rogers was making his point, Laura Barton then asked Stark if he could help to fix their tractor. While Stark examined the broken tractor, Nick Fury revealed himself. Stark realized that Maria Hill had called him. Fury tried to convince Stark that Scarlet Witch had just tricked him, but Stark said that the vision he had seen where all of his friends are dead would be in the future. 
if Stark would not do everything he could to save them and all of humanity. Having gathered together the entire team, Fury then showed himself to the rest of the Avengers and started to discuss their next move to stop the Ultron Offensive. Fury told them that his contact people in Nexus in Oslo had informed him that Ultron had attempted to get America's nuclear codes, but somebody was changing the codes all the time. While Stark played darts, being outplayed by Clint Barton, he told the group he would go to Nexus to find Ultron's new enemy. When Natasha Romanoff noted she had hoped Fury had more to offer, Fury gave them a speech to inspire them to get up and fight against Ultron, telling them to stand up and fight as a team once again. This led them to discussing Ultron's motives, which at this point, Bruce Banner then realized that Ultron always wanted to improve his body, so he needed Helen Cho in a regeneration cradle device to create his ultimate body, which he could use to become unbeatable. Hacking the Nexus Stark then made it clear to Steve Rogers that if Ultron succeeded in uploading himself to the synthetic body, he might be stronger than any of them. Nick Fury then told them that he would take Bruce Banner to the Avengers Tower and said to Stark that he needed Maria Hill. As the Avengers flew to Seoul, Stark was inside the Nexus Internet Hub searching for the person who prevented Ultron from obtaining launch codes for nuclear missiles. While hacking into the Nexus to find Ultron's new enemy, Stark was shocked to find out it was Jarvis, who erased his memory and scattered himself all across the Internet to block Ultron. It turned out that Ultron was afraid of Jarvis and of what he could do. So Jarvis went underground and prevented Ultron from getting the codes. Restoring Jarvis' memory, Stark then sent his own programming back toward Avengers Tower. Birth of Vision Having learned what he needed to at the Nexus, Stark then went back to Avengers Tower where Bruce Banner and Clint Barton were waiting for him. Greeting Stark upon his arrival at the Tower, Barton was with the Regeneration Cradle with the synthetic body inside it. Barton informed Stark that Ultron had also successfully kidnapped Natasha Romanoff during the Battle of Seoul, so Barton began his search for her. Stark then told Banner everything he discovered, and he asked for his help to upload Jarvis to the synthetic body. Banner was against the idea of messing with the body, finding the situation to be a time loop they were all now stuck inside since first activating the Ultron program. However, Stark argued that this was the right move and they did not have time for the decision to be argued by the other Avengers. Stark was able to convince Banner that the new being Ultron had created could be a benefit by giving it Jarvis as a core persona and prevent megalomania. As the two were almost finished preparing to upload Jarvis into the cradle, Steve Rogers with Wanda and Pietro Maximoff came and ordered him to shut it down. Stark and Banner refused, shocked that Rogers had recruited the Maximovs as they recalled how Wanda's powers had caused the duel of Johannesburg. When Rogers tried to convince them, Stark argued that whatever had already happened was nothing compared to what was still incoming. To try and end the dispute before it got out of hand, Quicksilver then responded by speeding around the cradle and unplugging all of the cables until he was then subdued by Hawkeye's quick thinking. This action then led to a brief clash between the group, with Stark calling on parts of his Mark 43 armor and shooting at Rogers, who in turn threw his shield at Stark, while Banner and Wanda Maximoff had a brief fight in which she knocked him back with her powers. Just as their fight was getting underway, Thor suddenly charged straight into Avengers Tower and revived the synthetic body with a massive bolt of his lightning, as Stark and the others looked on in shock and horror. The living body then jumped out of the cradle and looked at its surroundings while the group looked on. The being then briefly attacked Thor until he looked out over New York City and calmed down as the Avengers moved down to speak to it. The living body apologized and called itself Vision, and claimed to wish to assist them in their fight against Ultron. Thor explained that while in the Water of Sight, he had seen Vision in his dream and the Mind Stone, one of the six Infinity Stones that is in Vision's forehead. At first, the team did not trust Vision's motives, but as proof of his honor, Vision handed Thor Mjolnir. A shocked Stark was congratulated by Thor for creating a new worthy ally. Having successfully tracked down Ultron to Sokovia, where he was planning on using Baron Strucker's former base to begin his schemes, Stark and the other Avengers got themselves prepared for what could possibly be their final battle. As Stark was talking with Rogers and Banner, he noted that if any of the Ultron sentries got away, they had lost. When Stark noted Ultron was waiting for him, Vision confirmed that Ultron hated Stark most of all. Getting on board the Quinjet in order to fly to Sokovia and confront Ultron for the final time, Stark and the other Avengers listened as Captain America gave a speech, in which he told the team that their priority would be to get the people of Novigrad to safety before fighting Ultron's army. Looking at Stark, Rogers noted that Ultron believed the Avengers were what was wrong with the world, and that this was their chance to prove that he was wrong. Battle of Sokovia 
The Avengers had eventually tracked down Ultron in Sokovia, where he had taken Natasha Romanoff to be held in a secret cell. Before leaving, Stark first installed a new AI, Friday, into his newest suit, as he no longer had Jarvis to assist him. As the rest of the Avengers helped to evacuate the civilians out of Novigrad and Bruce Banner went to free Romanoff from her cell, Iron Man confronted Ultron in the city's church right in the center of Sokovia. Ultron revealed himself to Iron Man, showing that he had created a new, near indestructible body for himself, made from the vibranium he had stolen from Ulysses Clow, and a drill that had emerged from the center of the church which dug deep underground, also revealing a vibranium detonator with a mechanism located underground. As the machine was activated, Iron Man went to understand how to stop it, while Vision then came to confront Ultron himself. As Vision proceeded to disconnect Ultron from the internet, Ultron activated the drill and a part of the city flew to the sky. Friday informed Stark that if the city got high enough, the impact of its fall to the ground would cause a global extinction. While all the Avengers fought against the Ultron sentries and made sure that the civilians were safe, Stark and Friday debated about a way to make sure that the city would not be able to hit the ground. While flying around the still-rising Novigrad, Iron Man witnesses one building falling off the edge of the drop, with Friday informing him that there were still people trapped inside. Without a moment to spare, Iron Man flew into the building to find a terrified family, so he ordered them to get into the bathtub as he flew them down to the ground to safety. Iron Man warned Captain America of more sentries heading his way, although Rogers was hit regardless. Eventually, through lots of planning with Friday, Iron Man came to the idea that he and Thor could destroy the entire city in the air by attacking it from the top and the bottom. With it seeming there was no hope of saving all of the civilians, Nick Fury and Maria Hill arrived with a new helicarrier and a fleet of lifeboats, helping all of the Avengers with evacuating Novigrad, while War Machine helped with the battle as he and Iron Man fought the sentries together. As Iron Man did all that he could to keep the lifeboats filling with civilians safe, he continued discussing how to destroy Ultron's core, coming up with a plan to supercharge the inside from below. When one lifeboat was damaged, Iron Man flew up and pushed it the rest of the way to the helicarrier. Iron Man was informed by Thor that Ultron was now heading toward the core, so Iron Man called on the Avengers to come together and stop him from activating it. Protecting the Drill The Avengers came together to guard the Vibranium Drill in order to keep the Ultron sentries from activating it to prevent the city from falling. As they prepared for the battle and destroyed the nearby sentries, Iron Man mocked Black Widow for taking too long to arrive and joked she was messing about with Bruce Banner while she noted that not every member of their team could fly. With all of the Avengers assembled around the core, Iron Man looked on as Ultron gathered his army of sentries, with Thor challenging his might by questioning if this was the best he could do. Having shown off his entire army, Ultron questioned how they could possibly hope to stop him, with Iron Man then quoting back Captain America's earlier words by telling Ultron that they would do it together, which caused Ultron to send in his hordes of Ultron sentries. As the army of Ultron sentries charged into the church in an attempt to rip the Avengers apart and activate the key, Iron Man and the rest of the team used all of their might to fight back against the hordes of robots. As Iron Man flew around the church in his Mark 45 armor, he assisted Scarlet Witch and all of the other Avengers by shooting the sentries, cutting down their numbers swiftly. Using teamwork, the Avengers soon began defeating the entire Ultron army. With Ultron seemingly defeated, Iron Man ensured that the civilians were evacuated onto the helicarrier while he went under the rock to overload the core. However, while Iron Man was cutting through the metal, Quicksilver was killed by Ultron before one sentry caused the city to fall. Iron Man and Thor succeeded in exploding Sokovia before it hit the ground. The Ultron offensive was then ended when the final Ultron sentry was destroyed by Vision. Leaving the Avengers Following the Battle of Sokovia, Stark chose to retire as an active duty member of the Avengers. Although he continued to support the Avengers financially, having converted his father's old warehouse in upstate New York into the Avengers compound. Stark drove to the facility to personally oversee it in action and say his final goodbyes to the whole team. Stark met with Steve Rogers and Thor at the facility where they all discussed Vision keeping the Mind Stone inside his head. Thor insisted that he could as he had proven himself worthy by managing to lift Mjolnir, although Rogers questioned if this counted as Vision was a machine. Thor informed the pair that he intended to return to Asgard to learn more about the Infinity Stones and who had been recently manipulating them into locating the stones. As he bade farewell to Rogers, Stark mentioned that perhaps he would build Pepper Potts a house in the country like Clint Barton did, and told Rogers that one day he too would retire before driving off. Later, Stark was asked by the media about the Hulk incident, to which he responded that public concerns about Bruce Banner were baseless and irresponsible. Because of his activities as Iron Man, Stark and Potts took a break from their relationship while Stark continued his own work. 
Through YouTube, Stark soon became aware of the existence of a masked superhero in New York City named Spider-Man, who was strong enough to catch a speeding vehicle with his bare hands. Impressed, Stark noted that Spider-Man's strength was stronger than some of the Avengers, and began looking into him. He then discovered that he was a 14-year-old student named Peter Parker who resided in Queens, and that he had gained his abilities after being bit by a spider. Stark was further impressed after discovering that Parker had created his synthetic webbing and web shooters on his own using over-the-counter materials, and wondered what Parker could do if he had access to the resources the Avengers had. As a result, Stark considered Spider-Man as a candidate for a potential future Avenger, and created an upgraded suit for him. Facing the Consequences Stark gave a guest lecture at his alma mater, MIT, where he demonstrated to his students his latest device, the binarily augmented retroframing created by Quentin Beck, which aimed to recreate and relive traumatic memories to help with regret. The demonstration of the technology included Stark's last meeting with his mother and father. Then he followed with a speech where he introduced the September Foundation grant and announced that every student had been made an equal recipient of it, giving them all the proper funding to move forward with their own inventions and ideas. He then read from the teleprompter and was shocked to read that he should be presenting Pepper Potts to the stage. Seeing this made Stark briefly pause as he and Potts had broken up due to his own previous commitments to the Avengers and obsession with building new Iron Man armors. Stark then said his final words before stepping off stage where the MIT liaison then attempted to get some money from Stark Industries for the school's funding. As he walked outside, he encountered a woman who complimented his funding. She reached to her purse and Stark, thinking she was about to pull a gun, grabbed her hand. But instead, she pulled a photo of her son and told him that he had been killed during the Battle of Sokovia. She then told Stark her son's name and that she did not actually blame Ultron for her son's death, but blamed Stark instead, which deeply unnerved him. Avengers Civil War On May 5, 2016, Thaddeus Ross presented to Stark the Sokovia Accords, a document which required the Avengers to operate under the supervision of a United Nations panel. Stark, haunted by the massive damage he had caused by creating Ultron, agreed to sign the Accords. One month after the incident on Lagos involving Crossbones, both Stark and Ross went to the Avengers compound, where he tried to convince the Avengers to sign the Accords. The Avengers were briefed on the Accords by Ross, who explained that the Accords were created as a result of the catastrophic events in which they were involved, including the Battle of New York and the Battle of Sokovia, with Ross presenting them with both the number of casualties caused and the expense of the damages. While the presentation was stopped for upsetting Wanda Maximoff, Ross told them that the Accords would be signed in just a few days. With Ross gone, the Avengers moved into another room to read and debate the Accords, with Sam Wilson and James Rhodes almost immediately clashing on their different views. Vision then noted that perhaps their own existence had caused the conflicts they were fighting. As all the Avengers debated whether to sign it or not, Stark remained silent, with Steve Rogers realizing that Stark had already chosen his side, which was to be pro-Accords. Stark gave them the story of Charlie Spencer and how he had been killed in Sokovia. He pointed out that the group needed to be put in check, or they were no better than the bad guys, while also pointing out his role in Ultron's creation. However, Rogers saw the Accords as a block to keep the Avengers from where they needed to be, while Stark noted that if they did not decide to make this decision themselves, it would be done to them soon with far graver consequences for all of them. Stark and Rogers both argued with each other, and then Stark even got surprising support from Natasha Romanoff, who had previously expressed her disdain for this kind of government oversight in the wake of the Hydra uprising and the battle at Triskelion. Their argument ended when Rogers left the room upon hearing news that Peggy Carter had died in her sleep, while Stark remained unchanged in his opinion that signing was the right decision. Fighting with a friend Seeking to continue supporting the Sokovia Accords, Stark went into the Joint Counter-Terrorist Center where he assisted with the fallout from the bombing of the Vienna International Center. When Stark was informed that Captain America and Falcon had tried and failed to save the Winter Soldier from being arrested, Stark greeted them both upon their arrival, noting that Secretary Thaddeus Ross wanted them both prosecuted for all of their actions. Having also asked Vision to keep Wanda Maximoff inside the Avengers compound in order to protect her, in the wake of her accident in Lagos had resulted in her U.S. visa being removed. Sitting down with Steve Rogers, where he once again attempted to convince him to sign the Accords, presenting Howard Stark's pens which had been used by Franklin D. Roosevelt to sign the Lend-Lease Bill, hoping this could help to change Rogers' mindset on the Accords. When Rogers asked about Pepper Potts, Stark revealed that now they were taking a break from their relationship, with Rogers then apologizing for bringing it up, as he did not know. As Stark noted how after Aldrich Killian's war he had destroyed the Iron Legion for Potts, 
but since had armored up again and again to stop Hydra and Ultron, admitting that Ultron was his own doing and that he did not want to stop being Iron Man, and he had hoped signing the Accords could win Potts back. They then briefly discussed his own father's relationship to his mother before Rogers admitted that he could not ignore bad situations from happening. Begging Rogers to sign, Stark promised that Bucky Barnes would not be sent to a Wakandan prison. As Rogers seemed to consider signing, they discussed adding safeguards to the Accords. However, when Stark noted that Maximoff was locked up, Rogers confronted him about locking up a child, something Rogers saw akin to Japanese internment during World War II, with Stark insisting that he was just doing what needed to be done for the Avengers until Rogers walked out. Escape from the JCTC During Bucky Barnes' psychological assessment, Stark watched closely as the psychiatrist questioned him about his time as an assassin for Hydra. During the questioning, however, a power failure occurred and Barnes freed himself and tried to escape. While Everett Ross tried to sort out their situation, Stark contacted Friday and went to confront Barnes himself without his Iron Man armor to defend himself from the furious Barnes. Stark engaged Barnes, backed up by Natasha Romanoff and Sharon Carter. Stark used his gauntlet to fight him by first firing flash beam towards the Winter Soldier, which briefly blinded him before blocking a gunshot with the gauntlet and then ripping the gun apart. However, Barnes managed to overpower him. Barnes escaped, but Stark knew Barnes was most likely still with Steve Rogers, who, along with Sam Wilson, had also managed to escape from their custody. While the base recovered from the Winter Soldier's escape, Stark was greeted by Secretary Thaddeus Ross, who informed him that due to his involvement in helping their target escape, a special force unit would deal with Rogers. Stark, however, convinced Ross to let him bring them in, promising to wear the Mark 46 to bring him in, which Ross accepted. As he left the base, Ross gave Stark 36 hours before lethal force would be utilized. As Stark considered what to do, Romanoff reminded him that they were understaffed, with Stark questioning if she knew where Hulk was, despite Romanoff noting that Bruce Banner would not be on their side. Thinking of possible allies, Stark informed Romanoff that he knew of someone, and as Romanoff approached T'Challa to ask for his help, Stark flew to New York City to recruit Spider-Man. Recruiting Peter Parker Having deduced Spider-Man's true identity as Peter Parker, Stark decided to pay him a visit at home. He waited for him to return from school where he openly flirted with his aunt, May. As Parker returned, Stark persuaded him to trick his aunt into thinking that Parker had applied for Stark's scholarship. Stark entered his room with Parker and was soon impressed by how Parker used the technology he had retrieved from the trash to build himself computers and other technology. When Parker attempted to explain that he had not applied for the grant, Stark stopped him before he then showed Parker videos of him as Spider-Man saving civilians, complimenting him on his powers as they watched footage of him stopping a car with his bare hands, stating that the car was 3,000 pounds and going 40 miles per hour when Parker stopped it. Parker denied that the person in the video was him, claiming it was edited footage, but Stark quickly found his Spider-Man suit and equipment, forcing him to admit the truth. Stark asked him if anyone knew who he was, to which Parker informed him that nobody else knew. Stark then complimented Parker on his web shooters and was surprised to learn that Parker had built the webbing himself before Stark joked about Parker's suit and told him he needed an upgrade. Stark questioned why Parker became Spider-Man, being told that he only wanted to use his powers for the benefit of the people, noting that he believed that if he did not do the right thing with his powers, then good people would get hurt as a result, which Stark understood completely. Believing that Spider-Man could now be of great benefit during the upcoming Clash of the Avengers, Stark sat next to Parker and decided to officially recruit him onto his own team. Impressed, Stark asked him if he wanted to go to Germany and jokingly told Parker that he would tell his aunt that he was taking Parker on a field trip, to which Parker responded by webbing Stark to the door. When Parker agreed to help him, Stark tasked Happy Hogan with delivering Parker his new suit and accompanying him to Germany. Failed Negotiations Stark learned of Steve Rogers' plan to escape from the Leipzig Hall Airport so he and his teammates evacuated the airport and waited for Rogers and his team. Rogers soon showed up in Stark with his newest armor and attempted to convince him to turn over the Winter Soldier to the authorities and surrender before Secretary Thaddeus Ross ordered that lethal force would be taken. Rogers insisted that Helmut Zemo had posed as the psychiatrist interviewing Bucky Barnes and was behind everything. Iron Man noted that Barnes was responsible for the bombing of the Vienna International Center, which had killed Chachaka and many others and therefore needed to face justice, while Rogers claimed that Zemo was planning on unleashing more of the Winter Soldiers. Stark soon found that their negotiation was going nowhere. As a result, Stark called in Spider-Man to steal Captain America's shield and to tie Rogers' hand using his web shooters. 
Much to Iron Man's annoyance, Spider-Man was more concerned about meeting his hero, Captain America, and therefore acting immaturely during the encounter, forcing Iron Man to tell him to calm down. With Rogers now trapped, Iron Man ordered him to listen to his views on the Sokovia Accords, but Rogers remained uncompromising. Before they could take in Rogers, Hawkeye used an arrow to free him before Ant-Man returned the shield to Captain America. As the Mark 46's sensors then detected the rest of the Renegades making their way towards the Quinjet, Iron Man flew off to confront Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch, telling War Machine to take on Captain America before ordering Spider-Man to keep his distance and web up his foes from afar. Iron Man quickly caught up with Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch, managing to block their path with missile strikes. With his two former allies now seemingly trapped, Iron Man began joking that Scarlet Witch had hurt Vision's feeling as she escaped from the Avengers' compound, with Scarlet Witch expressing her disgust at being locked away while Iron Man claimed it was for her own protection after the Lagos catastrophe. Iron Man then casually greeted Hawkeye and asked about what he had been up to during his retirement from the Avengers, asking if he played golf. As they were talking, Hawkeye then deliberately fired an arrow to miss Iron Man, which he shot out of the sky and joked that Hawkeye had finally missed a shot. Hawkeye, however, then revealed that this was a deception, as it had now left Iron Man open to being pinned under several cars by Scarlet Witch. With Iron Man now trapped underneath all of the crashed cars, Friday alerted him that he was in danger, which Iron Man noted he was already aware of. Freeing himself, Iron Man helped Black Widow up after she, Black Panther, and War Machine had nearly been killed by Captain America and Ant-Man, using the Pym Particles discs to throw a truck at them. Seeing the single-mindedness that was driving Rogers, Iron Man was left with no choice but to call in his trump card, Vision to come into the battle and give them the advantage they needed to finally bring all of Captain America's team members into their custody. Clash of the Avengers Eventually, Vision fired a powerful burst from the Mind Stone to attempt to cow Captain America into submission before offering him a final chance to surrender. Regrouping his team, Iron Man stood across from Captain America's team to try and force his ally to stand down. However, Captain America refused again, forcing Iron Man to order his team into battle with the directive to capture their renegade teammates alive. Iron Man engaged Captain America in one-on-one -on -one melee combat before Hawkeye fired an explosive arrow towards the Mark 46 to no other effect than knocking him back. As the Avengers all fought each other across the airport, Iron Man later chose to attack Falcon in a mid-air battle before Hawkeye fired a volley of arrows toward Iron Man. The Mark 46's systems were able to easily trace the path of the arrows and destroy them all one by one. As Iron Man prepared to take down Hawkeye with a carefully aimed shot, the left repulsor failed. Demanding an update from Friday, she tracked the problem to Ant-Man having entered the suit and was disabling it from the inside, teasing him that the voice he could hear was his conscience. Iron Man and Ant-Man continued to mock each other before getting fed up, Friday ejected him via the usage of fire retardant foam, sending him falling back to the ground. When it became clear Iron Man's team would win the battle, Ant-Man inverted his powers and grew to 60 feet in height, turning himself into Giant-Man. Iron Man looked on in amazement as Giant-Man grabbed War Machine out of the sky. As Iron Man ordered Giant-Man to free War Machine, he was then attacked by Falcon, who fired the Red Wing drone to stun Iron Man in mid-air. While the drone threw off Iron Man's flight plan, it shattered apart against the armor. Working with War Machine and Spider-Man, the three attempted to find a way to stop Giant-Man while he helped Captain America and Bucky Barnes get away. Spider-Man soon came up with an idea to recreate a moment from The Empire Strikes Back, calling it a really old movie which caused War Machine to question Iron Man on how old Spider-Man really was. While Spider-Man used his web shooters to tie up Giant-Man's legs, Iron Man and War Machine flew up and hit him hard in the chin. While they succeeded with knocking down the giant Ant-Man, as he fell, Ant-Man had managed to knock Spider-Man out of the air and onto the concrete from a great height, prompting Iron Man to fly down to check on him. When he was satisfied with Spider-Man's state, he decided it was time to send him back to New York City, threatening to call his Aunt May if the enhanced youth did not listen to him. Despite protesting, Spider-Man soon collapsed from exhaustion. Iron Man flew off to chase after the now hijacked Quinjet containing Captain America and Barnes, who managed to get away with the assistance of Black Widow, who had subdued Black Panther for them. Iron Man was backed up by War Machine in his pursuit before Falcon began following them. Rhodes ordered Vision to destroy Falcon's flight gear with the Mind Stone, but the android miscalculated and shot out War Machine's arc reactor, taking the power out of the suit hundreds of feet above the ground. As War Machine fell towards the ground, Iron Man changed direction and tried to save his friend, but was just unable to catch him in time before he crashed. 
He immediately ordered Friday to scan for life signs, and she contacted emergency medical personnel when she found out War Machine was still alive, but is left paralyzed. Falcon also landed and told Iron Man he was sorry, but Iron Man vented his rage by blasting him with a repulsor beam, decisively ending the extended fight. Clash Aftermath With the Clash of the Avengers over, Stark arrived at the Columbia University Medical Center, checking on James Rhodes' current state as his body was x-rayed. Stark then questioned exactly how Vision could make a mistake like that, and Vision admitted he had been distracted by Scarlet Witch, which neither he nor Stark had known could happen. Stark then stepped outside of the operating room where he was approached by Natasha Romanoff, to whom he then explained Rhodes' condition before he told her that he was disappointed she allowed Steve Rogers and the Winter Soldier to escape, inadvertently leading to Rhodes' accident. Although Romanoff insisted that they had made all of the wrong actions in trying to resolve their situation, Stark then insulted her by calling her a double agent for assisting Rogers. Stark told her that T'Challa had informed Thaddeus Ross about her betrayal, and that the government and the Joint Counter-Terrorist Center would likely come to arrest her. When she insisted that they went about this wrong, he then commented that betraying people was something Romanoff seemed unable to help. Stark then watched as she fled the facility to go underground, showing that he was losing faith in all of his former teammates. The Raft In order to find Steve Rogers, Stark went to visit the Raft, where his teammates were imprisoned. On his way to the prison, Friday informed Stark that the therapist who was supposed to do Bucky Barnes' psychological evaluation had been killed by Helmut Zemo from Sokovia. She told him that Zemo had framed Barnes for the terrorist attacks as Stark realized he had been wrong all along. Upon arriving at the raft, Thaddeus Ross greeted Stark who tried to immediately organize the hunt for Zemo in order to bring him to justice. However, Ross noted that in the wake of the Clash of the Avengers, he would not be taking orders from Stark claiming that Stark was lucky not to be arrested himself. Although Ross did not believe Stark, he allowed him to speak to the prisoners, with Stark being noticeably disturbed at how Scarlet Witch's powers were being kept under control. As Stark walked through the cell block, Clint Barton got to his feet and expressed the fact that he was enraged at Stark's supposed betrayal of his former Avengers teammates. Stark argued that he did not know that Barton would end up there, but Barton noted the place was for criminals, which Stark had made them all. Stark argued that Barton had walked away from his wife and children to break the law, accusing Barton of choosing the wrong side to fight for. As Stark walked away, Barton slammed his hands against the cell wall and accused him of being willing to break their backs, referring to James Rhodes' injuries during the recent fight. Stark then walked past Scott Lang, who said Hank Pym was right not to trust the Starks, due to his relationship with Howard Stark. Stark, however, calmly asked him who he is as he walked past, much to Lang's disappointment. As he approached Sam Wilson, who asked about Rhodes' condition, Stark asked him to tell him where Steve Rogers had gone. Wilson didn't want to do it, but Stark admitted that since learning about Zemo, he knew he was wrong not to listen earlier, and that he wanted to help Rogers. Stark knocked out the audio feed, so Wilson then told him that Rogers was heading for the Hydra base in Siberia, telling Stark to go alone to assist Rogers in stopping Zemo. As Stark made his way toward the helicopter, Ross questioned if Wilson had given him intel about where Rogers was, but Stark denied it and promised not to answer all of Ross's calls if he contacted the Avengers compound while he departed. While on board his own helicopter, Stark then considered how he would approach Rogers in the wake of everything that had happened, before he donned the Mark 46 in his helicopter and flew to Siberia, using the rain to cover his movements in the hope that Ross would not follow him and arrest Rogers. However, Iron Man was unaware that Black Panther was actually following behind him while on board his own jet to find and kill Barnes once and for all. Helmet Zemo's Secret Entering the Hydra Siberian facility, Iron Man pulled open the doors and saw Captain America and Bucky Barnes were waiting for him, ready with their defenses. Greeting the pair, Stark noted that Rogers seemed defensive, with Rogers noting it had been a long day, before Stark told Barnes that he was not currently targeting him because he had decided to listen to Rogers' points. Noting that Thaddeus Ross did not know that he was there, and he wanted to keep it that way as he was currently violating the Sokovia Accords by even talking with Rogers without Ross's approval, Stark agreed to put aside the arrest warrant for the two to help them find Helmut Zemo before he could unleash the Winter Soldiers, with Stark calling Barnes the Manchurian candidate and asking him to put down his weapon as he promised they would not fight. Upon reaching the main room, however, all of the Mark 46's thermal scanners revealed that Zemo had killed the soldiers instead before the man revealed himself within a bunker, where he explained that he had successfully managed to bring Stark to the base after a year of planning. 
Rogers realized that Zemo was from Sokovia and wanted revenge for the Battle of Sokovia. Blaming the Avengers for the loss of his family, he had orchestrated a plot to tear them apart. Zemo then played video footage of the night that Stark's parents died, revealing that Hydra used the Winter Soldier to assassinate them in order to steal the Super Soldier Serum inside their car trunk. Stark watched in complete horror as the footage showed the Winter Soldier brutally killing Howard Stark by using his prosthetic arm to crack his skull before breaking Maria Stark's neck without emotion before shooting the camera that captured their deaths. Having finally learned the truth of what happened to his parents, Stark processed everything that he had just been shown before he then demanded Rogers to tell him if he had known that Barnes had killed his parents. Rogers responded that he had known their deaths had been ordered by Hydra, but was unaware that Barnes had been the killer. Stark instantly saw through the lie and demanded the truth, forcing Rogers to reveal that he had known it had been Barnes for years, but hid that fact. Horrified that his friend and fellow Avenger had been lying to him for years, Stark took a step back to consider his next actions in response to this news. Battle at the Hydra Facility Already enraged by the fallout of Captain America's questionable and biased actions over the past few days, Iron Man snapped and attacked Bucky Barnes to avenge his parents. Iron Man struck Captain America in the face and shot the gun out of Barnes' hand before flying him across the facility and pinning him down by forcing his foot against his arm and aiming his blaster shot at his skull. While they fought, Helmet Zemo made his escape from the facility. Iron Man attempted to shoot Barnes point-blank in the face, but Captain America ran to his aid and threw his shield at his to deflect the attack before he attempted to push Iron Man off Barnes. Acknowledging their friendship, Iron Man tried to force Rogers out of the fight using the leg clamps with Rogers soon broke free of. Iron Man grabbed Barnes and flew him into the wall. Barnes managed to use his prosthetic arm to damage Iron Man's repulsor beam in his hand by crushing it. In response, Iron Man aimed a missile directly at Barnes' face, which he managed to push out of the way, causing it to destroy much of the entire Hydra Siberian facility around them. While the pair became separated, Barnes regrouped with Captain America while Iron Man was briefly trapped under all of the debris. As Barnes made his way toward the exit, Iron Man freed himself and chased after him, only for Captain America to stand in his way. Captain America insisted that Howard and Maria's deaths were not Barnes' fault, as Hydra had control of his mind, but this falls on deaf ears as Iron Man ordered him to move. Captain America damaged Iron Man's leg stabilizers before Iron Man used the laser to trap Captain America while he went for Barnes. While Iron Man quickly caught up with his target, who attempted to climb up the building to reach the helicopter hatch in the roof, Iron Man kicked him across the facility and took aim at him yet again with a deadly kill shot. However, Captain America refused to stand down from the fight, deflecting a lethal repulsor back at Iron Man, disabling the Mark 46's targeting system and using a wire to pull him down when Iron Man continued to chase after Barnes. When Captain America threw his shield at him, Iron Man was able to shoot it out of the air, leaving Captain America now defenseless and unable to aid Barnes. As he could no longer target Barnes with his missiles, Stark opted to trap Barnes within the bunker for their final showdown. With Friday informing him that his weapon systems could not target him, Iron Man used his own eye to aim and shoot at Barnes, destroying the main hatch and trapping him inside. With Barnes now trapped inside, Iron Man charged toward him as they engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat until Iron Man began crushing him under the Mark 46's weight. Holding him there, Iron Man then questioned if he even remembered killing his mother and father, with Barnes insisting that he remembered everyone he killed for Hydra. Captain America jumped at the pair, knocking himself and Iron Man back down to the ground floor. Final Showdown As Iron Man and Captain America faced each other, Captain America insisted that nothing would change what happened all those years ago. Here, Iron Man stated in no uncertain terms that he was done listening to Rogers as the Winter Soldier had killed his own mother which he could not forgive, before Stark then charged forward and attacked his former friend, willing to even kill him in order to get to the Winter Soldier. Iron Man quickly overpowered him in melee combat before Bucky Barnes intervened by striking him with Captain America's shield, turning the fight into a two-on-one brawl. Iron Man responded to the uneven odds by blasting Captain America with a repulsor before he was forced against the wall by Barnes. Barnes attempted to remove the suit's arc reactor with his robotic arm to which Iron Man unleashed a unibeam that disintegrated the majority of the arm. A recovered and enraged Captain America then stormed at Iron Man in order to defend Barnes from being executed, deflecting repulsor fire with his shield before forcing Iron Man back against the wall and pummeling him relentlessly. Despite having the Mark 46 to protect himself from all the attacks, 
Iron Man soon found himself outmatched due to the super soldier serum that had given Captain America all of his strength and his superior fighting skills. Realizing he was incapable of competing with Captain America in close quarters hand-to-hand -hand combat, Iron Man ordered Friday to analyze Captain America's movement patterns to find weaknesses to exploit. Iron Man overpowered Captain America in combat and then blew away the shield and brutally beat him into submission, using his suit's strength and repulsors to give himself the advantage and attacks Captain America. Unable to counter them all, Rogers is overwhelmed. Exhausted from the fight, Captain America tried once again to reason with Iron Man, defending Barnes as his friend, before Iron Man commented that he had also once been his friend. Iron Man then beat Captain America down even more and tossed him aside. When Captain America got to his feet to continue the fight, claiming he could do this all day, Iron Man aimed his repulsor beam directly at his face and gave Captain America a final chance to stand down and end the fight. As Captain America stood unyielding, Iron Man realized he would never stand down and charged a repulsor. A wounded Barnes grabbed Iron Man's boot, distracting him, and Iron Man kicked Barnes in the face. This diversion allowed Captain America to turn the tide of the battle, using his own shield to destroy the Mark 46's helmet. Instead of killing Iron Man, however, Captain America smashed his shield into the main arc reactor, destroying it and leaving his armor now completely powerless. Left covered in blood and now running purely on the suit's backup miniature arc reactors, Iron Man was unable to continue fighting as Captain America reclaimed the shield and helped Barnes onto his feet. But as he watched them leaving, Iron Man claimed that Captain America did not deserve his shield, since his father had made it in World War II. Captain America reluctantly drops his vibranium shield, returning it to the Stark family, and left the scene with Barnes, leaving Iron Man behind alone. Spider-Man's Beginning after his battle in Siberia, Stark and Happy Hogan dropped Peter Parker back off at his apartment in New York City, and told Hogan to give the Spider-Man suit to Parker. A shocked Parker asked if he was allowed to keep it, which Stark confirmed. He also advised Parker not to do anything rash and not to stress Hogan, who would monitor all of his activities. Parker then asked when their next mission would happen, with Stark assuring Parker that someone would call him up. Stark then hugged Parker, covering up by saying he was getting the door for him, and he and Hogan drove off. For two months, Parker would report to Hogan about all his activities as Spider-Man, telling him about the crimes he stopped, which Hogan would then send to Stark himself along with Parker's activities. Picking up the pieces. With his friendship with Captain America seemingly done for and the rest of the team either on the run or locked away, Stark had started searching for a new purpose for the Avengers in the wake of their leadership falling apart all around them. Having taken Peter Parker to his home, Stark returned to the Avengers compound where he began considering what the Avengers could become without Captain America. At the same time, Stark also helped develop some new technology in order to help James Rhodes walk again in the wake of his injury during the Clash of the Avengers. When Rhodes fell while testing the technology, they discussed the fallout of the Sokovia Accords and Rhodes' belief that they had done the right thing. Stark then received a package from the mailman, who misread his name as Tony Stank, to Rhodes' amusement as he began mocking Stark. Stark found a phone and letter from Steve Rogers, apologizing for keeping the truth about Stark's parents from him, telling Stark if he would need Rogers' help, he and the rest of his team were just a phone call away. By this time, Rogers freed the imprisoned Avengers team from the raft, and Thaddeus Ross called Stark for help. Stark put Ross on hold by pretending to be busy with something else, thus letting Rogers and his Avengers team escape successfully. Sometime later, Stark was contacted again by Ross in regards to Natasha Romanoff, but he put him on hold once again. Advising Spider-Man When Stark was attending a party in India, Spider-Man tried to stop illegal smugglers working for Vulture, but only to end up being dropped and drowned in a lake. Stark used the tracker he installed in the Spider-Man suit and sent Mark 47 remotely to save him, arriving just in time to pull Spider-Man out of the lake before he could drown. Taking Spider-Man to a nearby park to calm down, Stark then asked him what he had been thinking trying to take those criminals instead of letting other people handle it. Parker questioned if he had put a tracker in the suit, to which Stark admitted that he had put everything in his suit, including the heater which dried him. Parker asked if those other people were the Avengers, only to be told by Stark that it was below their own pay grade to go after Vulture. Stark asked Parker to forget about Vulture because he said so, accidentally screaming in the middle of the party. He then said to him to continue helping the little people, but Parker was convinced he was ready for more now, claiming that Stark also thought so when he took on Captain America during the Clash of the Avengers. Stark assured him that if he wanted to, Captain America would have defeated him with some ease during their previous fight. Stark finished the call by telling Parker that if he saw the weapons being sold by the Vulture's crew again, 
he was not to get involved himself and to immediately call Happy Hogan and let him deal with the situation. Having given Parker this advice, Stark then hung up the call and sent the Mark 47 back to the Avengers compound while he drove away from the party, leaving Parker then to consider everything that he had just been advised to do by Stark. Ambush at the Staten Island Ferry Deciding to take Peter Parker's information seriously, Stark alerted the FBI to Vulture's illegal activities. Days later, Stark called up Parker to apologize and praise him for his actions in saving his classmates in Washington, D.C. Parker, however, was in the middle of trying to stop Vulture's crew in the middle of a weapons deal at the Staten Island Ferry and spent the phone call trying to distract Stark before he eventually hung up on him, much to Stark's annoyance. Suspicious, Stark decided to suit up in his Mark 47 and arrived just in time to see the ferry. Parker was about to be torn apart thanks in part to Spider-Man's and Vulture's recent battle, during which a rogue Chitari gun had lost control and fired all the way down the ferry. As Spider-Man had already defeated both Shocker as well as Mac Gargan, Iron Man then proceeded to fix the ferry by pushing it back together while Spider-Man could only just watch on. By using his own Stark Industries technology and the lasers in his armor, Iron Man used them both to meld the cut in the ferry back together. When Spider-Man had asked if there was anything he could do to help, Iron Man simply told him he had done enough before finishing saving the ferry. Iron Man then ordered Spider-Man to meet him in New York City so that he could chastise Spider-Man for disobeying him and putting his own and other people's lives at risk by his own actions. Parker accused Stark about not caring what was happening with the stolen weapons, only for Stark to step out of his suit and tell Parker that he did listen to him and that he was the one who contacted the FBI. Furthermore, Stark revealed that he was in fact the only one who believed in Parker's potential, despite his age, and that if someone had died there due to his actions, it would be on his conscience, and if Parker himself died, then his death would be on his mind forever. Parker told Stark that he was just trying to be like him, only for Stark to tell him that he wanted him to be better than him and demanded Parker give the Spider-Man suit back, much to Parker's dismay as he claimed that he was nothing without the suit. Stark replied that if he was nothing without the suit, then he shouldn't have it, while noting that he's starting to sound like his own father. Parker, much to his reluctance, gave the suit back and Stark sent him home to his Aunt May with some clothes Stark had brought him. Spider-Man's Offer in the wake of Spider-Man successfully stopping Vulture and his crew from stealing an entire plane full of the Avengers' weapons and technology directly from Avengers Tower, Stark decided to send Happy Hogan to Peter Parker's school in order to take him into the Avengers' compound. Upon arrival, Stark met up with Parker and apologized for being so harsh on him previously, and told him that his actions in stopping Vulture proved he was ready to be a hero. Stark explained that he had gathered together reporters to meet him before showing Parker the new version of the Spider-Man suit, Stark told him to put it on so he could introduce him to a bunch of reporters as the newest member of the Avengers, noting he would have a room by vision. However, Parker declined, wanting to stay on the streets and look out for the citizens of New York City as a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, much to the great surprise of Stark. Stark, although a little disappointed, accepted Parker's decision, still offering him one last chance to take his offer, which Parker said no to, telling Hogan to take Parker back home. Before leaving, Parker then asked if that was a test, to which Stark lied and said it was. However, as soon as Parker exited the building, Pepper Potts came through asking where Parker was, as all of the reporters were waiting, only for Stark to say that he was now not going to be there after all. Now wondering what they were going to tell the press, Stark asked Hogan for the engagement ring which he had been keeping for years. Potts, however, assured them that they would be able to come up with something better and kissed Stark before they went out to meet the press although Hogan still threw Stark the ring as a last resort. Stark had the second suit delivered back to Parker, believing that the young hero had earned the right to wear it again. Return to Stark Industries Months later, working at the Avengers compound, Stark, guilty that he got distracted, began work on a suit that could be used by him to defend the world by himself. While working on his new Mark 50 armor, Stark was visited by Maria Hill, who tried to convince him to call Rogers and work out their grievances. Stark briefly considered calling Rogers, but decided he needed to prepare for the apocalypse on his own. Hill then informed Stark that Vision had turned off his transponder and was off-grid. Stark became irritated after Hill made a remark that the last uncontrolled robot he created almost wiped out humanity and claimed that the world needed all Avengers. An embittered Stark sent Hill away and fired her from her position at Stark Industries. Stark presented Peter Parker with an official Stark Industries Certificate of Internship completion and the pair posed for a photo. 
Stark then framed the photograph and kept it amongst his personal belongings. Infinity War In 2018, while jogging in Central Park, Stark told Potts about a vivid dream he had where they had a child named Morgan after Pepper's eccentric uncle. Despite Stark's claims on how real the dream felt, Potts assured him that she was not expecting a child, and suggested that if he wanted to have a kid, he would not have made another suit of armor. Stark reinforces that the armor is only there to protect her and their future children, but Potts retorts by saying that the armor is not required in order to raise a normal family. Stark then declares that there would not be any more surprises between them and promises Potts a dinner date in light of their recent engagement. Doctor Strange then appears from a portal and tells Tony he needs to talk to him. Having never met Strange, Stark becomes skeptical at his statement, but Strange reiterates that the fate of the universe was at stake, bringing Bruce Banner out to stress how urgent the matter is. Convening at the New York Sanctum After meeting Doctor Strange and reuniting with Bruce Banner, Stark was taken inside the New York Sanctum. He was informed by Wong, who explained the history of the Infinity Stones. Strange named all of the stones that were known, such as the space, reality, power, soul, mind, and time. Stark inquires the enemy's name and is informed by Banner that it is Thanos, explaining that he has acquired the power in space stones, making him the most powerful being in the universe. Having learned that Thanos was the one who pulled the strings behind Loki in the Chitauri invasion, Stark realizes that he was the one who was really responsible for his fear and anxiety in the ensuing years since the Battle of New York. Leaning and stretching against the cauldron of the cosmos, Stark remarks on Strange's use of language, getting hit by the cloak of levitation, much to his annoyance. Stark suggested disposing of the Time Stone, but Strange and Wong informed him that they were sworn to protect it. As Thanos had two stones and the other two were not on Earth, the best move would be to protect Vision, who had the Mind Stone embedded in his head. However, Vision had disappeared two weeks earlier. Only the fugitive Captain America could possibly find him. Banner insisted that Stark call Rogers, only for Stark to explain to Banner that him and Rogers had fallen out, and that they were not on speaking terms. Banner convinced Stark to call Rogers by telling him that Thanos had killed their teammate Thor. However, before Stark could place the call, they were interrupted by the sound of agitation in the streets and debris flying through the air. Attack on Greenwich Village Leaving the Sanctum to investigate, the four found people fleeing and screaming in panic, as a Q-ship sent by Thanos had arrived devastating the surrounding city with powerful winds. Outside the New York Sanctum, the Q-ship was confronted by Tony Stark, Bruce Banner, Doctor Strange, and Wong. As Stark commanded Friday to evacuate the surrounding area and mobilize emergency response teams, Doctor Strange cast the winds of Watum, neutralizing the powerful winds created by the Q-ship. As Ebony Maw and Cole Obsidian arrived from their Q-ship, they demanded the Time Stone kept in the Eye of Agamotto from Strange only for Stark to rudely rebuff and command the two to leave Earth. To Stark's embarrassment, Banner tried and failed to turn into Hulk. As they didn't have time to understand why, Stark benched his friend from the fight. Stark donned his nanotech Mark 50 armor and blasted away Obsidian, astonishing Banner. As Strange began using an attack, Stark blasted off a car that was aimed at him and Wong. Ma then sent Iron Man flying into the air while directly assaulting Strange and Wong with his telekinetic powers throwing debris at the Masters. Iron Man returned, commanding Strange to also flee and get the Time Stone away from the city, but he refused. Iron Man attempted to assault Maw again, only to be engaged by Obsidian, who sent Iron Man flying into Washington Square Park, encountering Banner. While holding off Obsidian to protect Banner, Iron Man was joined by an arriving Spider-Man and told him about what was going on with the situation. Iron Man tasked him with rescuing the unconscious Strange as he held off Obsidian. As the battle continued, Iron Man was caught by Obsidian's hammer and was about to be killed, only to be saved by Wong. Once Wong trapped Obsidian from another location, Iron Man broke free and invited him to his wedding, flying afterwards. Ascent to Space After finishing his battle, Iron Man managed to locate the Q-ship and flew towards the sky while deploying Item 17A from the Avengers compound. Beginning to run out of oxygen, Spider-Man removed his mask to enable himself to breathe as much as he could. Iron Man commanded Spider-Man to let go and fall in order to catch him. Spider-Man told Iron Man that he must save the wizard as he was told by him, but Iron Man retorted that he wouldn't be able to breathe as the ship moved upwards. 
As he gets exhausted and starts to pass out, Spider-Man was nearly suffocated as the ship left Earth's atmosphere and fell off the ship as he couldn't breathe anymore. Falling down, Spider-Man was rescued by the intervention of Iron Man, who summoned the Iron Spider armor. As the suit manifested around him with nanotech particles, Spider-Man swiftly recovered with an acrobatic landing and was able to breathe and contact Iron Man. As he caught up with Parker, Stark told him farewell up on the ship and commanded Friday to send him back to Earth, using his parachute to descend into orbit. Stark latched onto the hull to cut a hole and board the Q-ship to look for wherever Doctor Strange and Ebony Maw went. Getting a call from Pepper Potts, Stark answered the call and told her that he was on the ship, only to lose reception halfway through the call. Rescue of Doctor Strange On board the Q-ship, Stark was joined by the Cloak of Levitation, which showed him to Strange in the Time Stone. As they prepared their next move, observing from above, they were surprised by the appearance of Spider-Man, who had also stowed away, much to Stark's horror. As Stark berated Peter Parker for disobeying his orders, Peter reasoned that he could not act as a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man without a neighborhood to defend. Listening to Parker's response and knowing that he can't argue against it, Stark had no choice but to team up with him and decided to assess him of the situation. Walking towards the ledge, Stark told Parker where Ebony Maw was holding Strange captive and asked for any ideas to distract him. Thinking quickly, Parker immediately suggested a plan reminiscent of a scene from Aliens. Once he listened, Stark would then follow the plan before Strange would be further tortured by Maw. As Maw continued to probe Strange for the Time Stone, Iron Man suddenly appeared behind him. As part of Parker's plan, Stark fired a missile past Maw into the wall of the Q-ship. The missile caused a hole breach, instantly sucking a screaming Maw into the vacuum of space to his death. However, Strange himself was inadvertently caught in the vacuum as well, and the cloak unsuccessfully attempted to rescue him. Leaping in, Spider-Man managed to grab Strange, and with aid from his new armor's artificial spider limbs, was able to narrowly pull him back to safety, allowing Iron Man to seal the breach using his nanobots. Stark noted that the ship was on an automated course bound for an unknown location. Strange insisted that Stark commandeer the ship to return them and the Time Stone to Earth, although Stark was reluctant. Stark suggested a proposal for an attack on Thanos' territory where he wouldn't be expecting. Although initially at odds, Strange reluctantly agreed with Stark's plan after he told of his history over the years about Thanos' discourse. After agreeing, Strange reminded Stark that he would prioritize saving the Time Stone over either Stark or Parker's lives, asserting he would let them die if it means keeping the stone from Thanos' hands. Satisfied by Strange's display of morality, Stark would then officially recruit Peter Parker to the Avengers. Encountering the Guardians Arriving at their destination, Stark and Peter Parker steered the Q-ship with an arm piece and attempted to safely land on the barren planet Titan. Despite the attempt to avoid contact with the planet's surroundings, the ship crash-landed. Doctor Strange protected Stark and Parker from the impact of the crash landing by shielding them through holographic mandalas. Stark acknowledged that he owed Strange a debt for saving their lives from the crash. Parker appears upside down and asks if there was something that could implant eggs in his chest. Stark angrily comments to him never to say anything pop culture related, but Parker was stating that something is coming toward them. Following Parker's warning, a grenade rolls into view and the three get thrown back when its energy pulse was fired. The three were then immediately ambushed by the Guardians of the Galaxy, Star-Lord, Drax the Destroyer, and Mantis, each believing the other to be working for Thanos. Star-Lord immediately starts firing at Iron Man and a chase in the air ensues. Stark launches a missile at Star-Lord while in the air, but is pinned by his gravity mine in retaliation. Escaping Quill's gravity mine, Iron Man then flies over to Drax in order to capture and pin him down. As the brief scuffle ended in a stalemate, Spider-Man was held at gunpoint by Quill. Turning off his helmet, Star-Lord then asks Stark where his missing teammate Gamora was. Agitated with his abrupt attack, Stark replied with a question that confused Quill and then asked who are the people he was attacking. Parker answered his question by saying that they were the Avengers. Eventually, once Mantis informs Stark about being acknowledged by Thor, both parties learned that they were both after Thanos and an alliance was formed between them. Making a plan Analyzing the situation and the surroundings, Stark realized that their only advantage was that Thanos was coming to them, and thus the element of surprise could be utilized. The plan was simple, draw Thanos in, pin him down, and take the Infinity Gauntlet. As Stark tried to come up with a plan to stop Thanos, Drax yawned at the middle of the plan. Star-Lord explained that listening and not winging it isn't what they do. And Spider-Man questioned what exactly do the Guardians of the Galaxy do. Mantis explained what they do in an incomprehensible statement, 
which left both Peter and Stark completely dumbfounded. Stark told Star-Lord to get his team together, and Quill expressed that while the plan was solid, he should execute it instead of Stark for a better outcome. As the plan was being formulated, Doctor Strange uses the Time Stone to view millions of different outcomes of the coming conflict against Thanos, to which he says there is only one in which they win. Battle of Titan When Thanos arrived on Titan, he was immediately greeted by Doctor Strange. Thanos recounted to the sorcerer how Titan was a beautiful planet with too little food and resources to go around for its people. When the Titans faced extinction, Thanos' merciful resolution was genocide across multiple planets. At this moment, Thanos realized too late that Strange wasn't alone, and he had lured the Titan into an ambush. Before he could react, he was immediately crushed underneath a massive piece of a spaceship hull dropped on him by Iron Man. Using the power and reality stones, the Titan freed himself by violently detonating the debris before instantly transforming the rubble into an enormous swarm of bats. The swarm quickly set upon Iron Man, forcing the Avenger to flee. Thanos was then bombarded by a renewed assault from Iron Man, who rained missiles down on the Titan. Unfazed and with the gauntlet free, Thanos activated the power and space stones. In a second, the explosive energy of Stark's missiles was absorbed by the gauntlet and redirected at Iron Man in a concentrated beam of fire, blasting the Avenger far away into a spaceship husk. With Thanos restrained, the group had executed the final step of their plan as Mantis beckoned the others to hurry before Thanos broke her hold. Iron Man and Spider-Man moved to forcefully pull the gauntlet from the Titan's hand. Flying in, Star-Lord confronted Thanos before demanding the location of Gamora. Thanos began to react in anguish with Mantis sensing that he was mourning. Nebula began to realize in horror that he sacrificed Gamora for the Soul Stone. In denial, Star-Lord angrily asked Thanos to tell him that Gamora was alive, only for Thanos to lament that he had no choice but to kill her, confirming Nebula's suspicions. Enraged, Star-Lord began to question Thanos for his actions. Observing this, Iron Man attempted to restrain him from any contact with Thanos, only for Star-Lord to ruthlessly attack him without thinking, inadvertently breaking Mantis' control over the Titan. Freed from his trance and now truly furious, Thanos quickly escaped his restraints and brutally overpowered the group. Iron Man made another desperate assault on Thanos, only for the Titan to turn to Titan's nearby moon. Using the power and space stones, Thanos immediately pulverized the moon's surface before hurling its fragments down on his opponents as a hail of meteors incapacitating Iron Man. Last Man Standing Before Thanos could finish off Doctor Strange in their brief confrontation, Iron Man, being the final Avenger standing, restrained Thanos' gauntlet using a nanotech clamp. To the Avengers' surprise, Thanos recognized and called him by his name of Stark, before noting that they were both cursed with knowledge. Unfazed from Thanos' statements, Iron Man blamed him for his existence to be a curse and attacked him first, blasting him with missiles. With Thanos distracted, Iron Man began attacking him relentlessly with his nanotech suit, kicking the Titan with his enhanced boosters before he could recover. Anchoring his feet to the ground, Iron Man immediately struck Thanos again with repulsor-powered battering rams beating him back into a wall. Recovering quickly, Thanos tore off Iron Man's helmet with his bare hand and punched him to the ground. As Iron Man reformed his helmet just in time, Thanos quickly ripped the clamp from the gauntlet and blasted him with a concentrated beam from the Power Stone. Iron Man then managed to block the blast by forming a shield. Boosting towards Thanos, Iron Man swiftly pinned the gauntlet to the ground using a foot clamp before pummeling the Titan's face with a repulsor-boosted hammer with enough force to make him bleed. Unfazed from the damage on his face, Thanos simply taunted the Avenger for giving so much labor and struggle only to shed a single drop of blood. Thanos then effortlessly ripped the gauntlet free from Iron Man's hold, flipping the Avenger onto his back. Thanos began to brutally beat Iron Man with his fists, breaking off more and more of his armor with each strike to the point where he could not defend himself any longer. With Iron Man helpless to resist, Thanos followed with a powerful punch with the Power Stone into the Avenger's abdomen sending him flying across the arena and damaging his armor. Desperate and missing much of the upper half of his armor, Iron Man attempted to hold off Thanos with his repulsors, relocating the nanites on his leg to form new repulsors. Closing in, Thanos began beating the Avenger once again, destroying his helmet. Stark attempted to defend himself with his bare hands, only for Thanos to grab and trap his left hand. In an attempt to fight back, Stark immediately shifted the nanites from his left arm to his right arm to form a sword and wildly stabbed at the Titan. However, Thanos simply tore the sword from Stark's hand and ruthlessly stabbed him in the abdomen with it, ending the fight. Cradling Stark's head in his hand, Thanos revealed his respect for Stark. 
Nevertheless, Thanos said that he hoped that those who survived when he ended his mission would remember Stark, and he prepared himself to kill him, only for Strange to intervene, offering the Time Stone in exchange for Stark's life. After Thanos took the Time Stone and left Titan, Stark healed his wound using the last of his nanites. Asking Strange why he would give up the stone, Strange informed Stark that they were now in the endgame. Thanos Victory Stark and his allies could only wait for Thanos to achieve his goals and unlock the powers of all the combined Infinity Stones. Many of his allies began disintegrating into Ash, including Doctor Strange and the Guardians of the Galaxy on Titan, much to his horror and distress. Stark attempted to reassure Star-Lord before his demise and was then told by Doctor Strange that this outcome was inevitable. Stark could only helplessly watch as Spider-Man began disintegrating in his arms. Stark hugged the boy in an attempt to comfort him as Spider-Man begged Stark to save him until he accepted his fate and emotionally apologized for failing him. In the end, only Stark and Nebula remained on Titan. As Nebula said in despair that Thanos had achieved his goal, Stark began mourning over the loss of his friends and Thanos' victory, unable to do anything but accept it as he clutched Spider-Man's ashes. Returning to Earth Directly after the snap, Stark and Nebula used the Guardians of the Galaxy's ship to get off Titan. Over the course of time they spent, Stark and Nebula discovered that the ship's fuel cells had been cracked during the climax of the Battle of Titan. Attempting to fix it, they at least partially succeeded by working around the damage, and tried to make it back to Earth. However, the ship ran out of power after only two days, and gradually began running out of air, the former of which stranded the ship. Stark and Nebula attempted to fix this as well, but they simply failed to do so, leaving them lost in space. 22 days after the snap, Stark and Nebula played a few rounds of table football in the bridge of the ship. As Nebula tried to catch one of the paper shards, Stark told her that she didn't need to do that and taught her how to play. As they continued to play more of the game, Stark and Nebula were eventually almost tied up, and he asked her if she would like to try again. Stark tried to make a goal but lost his aim, letting Nebula win the game and showed respect to her with a handshake. Stark went to the front of the ship to record a message to Pepper Potts using his helmet from the Battle of Titan. After Stark turned on the switch to record from his helmet, he told Potts that if she finds the video of this recording, she should not post it on social media due to the sad situation he is in. Stark reflected on the past days of his survival, such as meeting Nebula, getting treatment for his injuries, fixing the ion charge from the ship that saved them 48 hours of time, and eating the remaining food rations. Stark then told Potts that the oxygen from the ship would run out the following morning, and that he hoped to pull off one last surprise. Stark told her not to feel bad about his predicament and maybe just grovel and feel guilt for next upcoming weeks while he's gone. Stark began to drift off from the recording and finished by saying he would promise to dream about Potts since it was always what he dreamed about. After finishing the recording, Stark put on his jacket and drifted off to sleep before Nebula put him in the captain's chair. While deeply sleeping from the chair for hours, Stark felt a slight arc of light on his face causing some irritation. Stark suddenly awoke due to a beaming light outside and much to his surprise, it turned out to be Captain Marvel. As the group decided to head back to Earth, Danvers started to carry the ship back to Earth, locating it at the Avengers compound where Stark would resign. Getting the attention from the Avengers at the facility, Captain Marvel landed on the ground where the ship had settled. Stark would be helped out by Nebula and Steve Rogers once he got out of the ship's doorway. Stark told Rogers that he was unable to stop Thanos, to which Rogers responded back saying he couldn't as well. Stark then looked at Rogers and told him that he lost Peter Parker in the process. Before saying anything else, Stark was greeted by an overwhelmed Potts. At the Avengers compound, the remaining Avengers conversed about the possible location of Thanos. As pictures were shown from their system, Stark saw a picture of Parker as one of the casualties of Thanos' snap, leading him to look down and reminisce on his failure to protect the kid. Stark then asked the team about where Thanos was, to which Rogers responded that they had no lead. Stark looked over to Thor and asked the team what happened to him, leading Rocket Raccoon to tell him that he was guilty of failing to kill Thanos. While Rocket talked about the failure of each one trying to stop Thanos, Stark was completely surprised to see a talking raccoon, thinking he was a stuffed Build-A-Bear. When Rogers told Stark that they had been hunting Thanos for weeks and asked if they had any indications of where he could be, Stark mockingly erupted and told Rogers that he was beaten. Stark talked to the team about the vision he had that he didn't want to believe and saw it coming. As Rogers tried to tell him that he needed to focus, Stark angrily told Rogers that he needed him past tense, but it was too late to do that. As he began to fumble around the table and took his tube off of his arm, Stark then confronted Rogers, explaining that his attempt to build a suit of armor around the world was to prevent the very situation they were in. 
Stark then recalled the events of the Avengers' Civil War, as he lost without the aid of Rogers, despite Rogers saying that if they lost, they would lose together. After giving up his arc reactor to Rogers in order to stop Thanos, Stark was overcome by exhaustion and fainted in front of the team. Bruce Banner gave Stark a sedative so that he could rest and heal due to his long duration in space. While Stark was resting, the remaining Avengers found Thanos, only to realize the Infinity Stones had been destroyed, leading Thor to decapitate Thanos. Reunited Again Stark eventually married Pepper Potts and had a daughter named Morgan and relocated to a cabin in New York. Despite losing his allies and half the universe's population to Thanos, Stark began to feel a sense of peace in the five years that followed. In 2023, Stark walked outside of his cabin and began to get Morgan's attention so that she could get some lunch. After not being able to call her attention, Stark sat down and called her full name again, to which Morgan got out of the tent with her Mark 49 helmet. Stark told Morgan not to wear the helmet since it was an anniversary gift for Potts, before taking her helmet off and asking if she was hungry for lunch. Stark then asked where Morgan found the helmet before picking her up, being told that she found it in his garage. While Stark and his daughter were about to enter back into the cabin, he was approached by Steve Rogers, Natasha Romanoff, and Scott Lang, who proposed their idea of traveling back in time to acquire the Infinity Stones from the past in order to reverse Thanos' actions in the present. Stark disagreed with the group's decision to use quantum energy to mess with the time scale, or else they would never return to their original timeline. Once Lang told Stark that he came back from the past, he told Lang that his case was a billion and one chances of a cosmic fluke, thus it could not happen, being told that the group was pulling a time heist. Stark continued to tell the group that it was a pipe dream to travel back in time. However, Rogers and Romanoff told him that they could get everyone back by snapping their fingers to do it. Stark was still skeptical for not having a logical set to pull off a time heist. When Lang sat down with Stark by telling that they will follow strict rules of time travel, he reluctantly rejected his proposal with concern about following logic from Back to the Future, saying that's not how quantum physics works. Despite the group taking a stand to fix what had happened to everyone, Stark insisted on not joining the heist before Morgan was told to save him by Potts. Rogers told Stark this was their second chance, but he told Rogers that he already has one and still offers them to stay for lunch. Solving Time Travel at night, while washing the dishes after dinner, Stark accidentally sprayed an old photo of himself and Peter Parker with water and began cleaning it with a rag. Missing Peter's existence and pondering on the idea of time traveling, Stark decided to take it upon himself on testing out one of the theoretical models that would work with Scott Lang's quantum tunnel. Going to his work table, Stark began working on a space-time GPS that would enable the device that could have particle factoring and a spectral decomp to travel through the device. Despite his skepticism, Stark was in complete shock once the device had successfully rendered. Being bewildered by this discovery, Stark let out a swear before noticing Morgan sitting on a staircase, and told her that she can't swear around the house and should go to bed. Stark told Morgan that he had something on his mind to which she wonders if she wanted juice pops, much to his agreement on getting some after his discovery. After Stark and Morgan finished their juice pops, Stark told her to go to bed and sleep before being told to tell a story. After telling a quick story, Stark told Morgan that he loved her tons, before being told back that she loved him 3,000, much to his loving surprise. Once Stark got Morgan to sleep, he went into the living room where Pepper Potts was reading a book. While talking to Potts and looking toward his lab table, Stark quickly admitted on figuring out how time travel works. Much to Potts' surprise on his incredible discovery, Stark sat down with her and was told they were lucky to have survived, unlike everybody else. Potts told Stark that he can do something about his discovery, but he told her that he could stop trying to save everybody. However, Potts admits that trying to get him to stop was one of her failures. Smiling at the prospect of Potts not giving up on him, Stark admits that he sometimes feels like he should put his optimism in a locked box and drop it at the bottom of a lake so that he could finally rest. Potts then questioned if Stark was able to rest now, to which he decided on helping his team on pulling off the time heist. Realizing that the chances of survival were improbable and not guaranteed, Stark recorded a parting message to his family in the event that he would die under any circumstances. Returning to the Avengers Despite Stark's initial refusal to help, the remaining Avengers continued to research the possibility of time travel and attempted to send Scott Lang through time, but instead sent time through him, turning Lang into a baby, a child, and an old man. With no other option to undo the snap, the Avengers almost lost all hope, but just then, Stark arrived at the Avengers' compound, much to the surprise of Steve Rogers. 
Once Stark had parked his car in front of Rogers, he rightly guessed that the Avengers' first attempt to time travel was a failure. When Rogers asked Stark why he arrived at the compound, Stark got out of his car and told him that the EPR paradox had affected Lang by letting time pass through him. Rogers guessed that Stark had solved time travel, to which he admitted on inventing a time-space GPS. Stark then reconciled with Rogers, noting that resentment is corrosive and he hates it. Rogers says he hates resentment as well. Stark then talked about the conditions of his life before joining the heist, wanting the Infinity Stones to bring back the people who were dead, but not having to die trying. As they both agreed, Stark and Rogers reconcile and work on the time heist. Before they could work on the heist, Stark gave Rogers back his shield, although Rogers was hesitant. Stark further told him that his father made it for him, and he needs to get it out of the house before Morgan finds it and takes it sledding. Knowing they would get a team together, Stark walked inside the Avengers compound with equipment on him, noticing Thor's arrival and made fun of his resemblance for looking like the Big Lebowski. Stark asked Rocket on how he was working with the time machine, only to be insulted after mistakenly misnaming him. Stark then produced the advanced tech suit with the help of Hank Pym's designs and worked with Bruce Banner to send Clint Barton to the past. The operation was a success as Barton landed in his homestead at a time before the snap before returning to 2023. Following this, Stark worked with the Avengers to determine the best times and locations to travel back to. During their brainstorming session, Banner noted that they only have enough Pym particles for one round trip each, and that these stones have a lot of different places throughout history. Stark further noted that each group is going through their history, which means there was not a lot of convenient spots to just drop in every given timeline. With each brainstorming session, the team's decisions had been concluded being New York City in 2012, Asgard in 2013, and Vormir and Morag in 2014. The Avengers then decided to pull off their heist the following day, prompting Stark to use his helmet to record a message for Morgan Stark in the event that he did not survive. Additionally, he named one of his AI systems Edith, standing for Even Dead I'm the Hero, which he uploaded into one of his glasses. Believing that their efforts to resurrect the victims of the snap would be successful, Stark arranged for the glasses to be given to Nick Fury following the latter's resurrection in the event that he died, with the explicit purpose of having Fury hand it down to Peter Parker. The next day, as the team gathered around the circle, Stark and the rest listened to Roger's speech about how they lost friends, family, a part of themselves, but now they had a chance to get them back. Knowing that this plan is the fight of their lives, Stark looked at Rogers being told that they are going to win for whatever it takes. Once the team was in position, Stark told Banner to activate the tunnel. As the team finally united on the platform, Stark and his group traveled through time to 2012. Infiltration of Stark Tower The first team, composed of Stark, Scott Lang, Steve Rogers, and Hulk, traveled back to New York City on May 4, 2012, during the Battle of New York. Rogers informed the group that they all know their positions on where the Infinity Stones are. While they talked about keeping an eye on each other and get out as quickly as possible, Hulk from 2012 had smashed a Chitari soldier through wreckage, much to the group's dismay. Hulk was assigned to find the Time Stone at the New York Sanctum, smashing things along the way as to not give any suspicions. Stark and Lang went to Stark Tower to retrieve the Tesseract, while Rogers focused primarily on the Scepter. Stark climbed onto a building and focused on the Avengers from 2012 interrogating Loki. Stark told Rogers to get inside Stark Tower, noting that they were almost wrapped up on capturing Loki. Stark, with a shrunken Lang on his shoulder, quietly entered Stark Tower successfully without being noticed. While Stark watched his past self and the Avengers clearing from cleanup duty and capturing Loki, he commented on the size of Captain America's buttocks being crammed into his former uniform. After Black Widow grabbed the scepter, the strike team had entered the building, leaving Stark and Lang to hide out of sight. Stark further noted that the strike team was part of Hydra before quieting Lang's voice. Stark then flicked Lang towards his 2012 self in order to get closer to the Tesseract. Once their plan settled out, Stark proceeded to flee out of the tower and located the scepter near an elevator so that Rogers could meet up with other S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. While Rogers had to capture the scepter from Agent Jasper Sitwell, Stark managed to get a S.H.I.E.L.D. uniform and went undercover while his past self arrived on the spot where they met Alexander Pierce. Stark then notified Lang that he was in the area of where his past self was located and told him to go into 2012 Stark's shirt. While Lang went under 2012 Stark's shirt, he smelled Axe body spray, having 2023 Stark explain that he had one under his desk for emergencies. 
Under Stark's guidance, Lang entered the inside of his arc reactor and was told to pull the lever that would temporarily give Stark's past self a mild cardiac arrest. When Lang damaged it, Stark's past self suffered a heart attack. Using the distraction caused by 2012's Stark's collapse to their advantage, 2023 Stark told the security guards that 2012 Stark needs some help. While 2012 Stark suffered from pain in his heart, 2023 Stark noticed Lang pushing the briefcase with the Tesseract and began to take it, walking away to escape. Despite successfully obtaining the Space Stone, an enraged 2012 Hulk busted through the door, sending both Stark and the case flying. The case then popped open and landed at the feet of 2012 Loki, who quickly grabbed the Tesseract and escaped with it. Stark woke up from his sudden knockout, much to his shock from the brute force of Hulk. Lang then jumped onto Stark and told him that part of the plan wasn't supposed to happen, leading him to tell Lang that they messed up the plan. Stark had to go back to the alleyway empty-handed. Infiltrating Camp Lahai Lang and Stark met back up with Steve Rogers, who had been successful in getting the scepter. With only enough Pym particles for a return journey home, Lang lectured the group that they wouldn't be coming home. Suddenly, Stark got the idea of getting more Pym particles to take back the Tesseract, telling Rogers that it was in a military installation. Stark told Rogers that he didn't know the exact date, but he knows where to go, and decided to improvise on which date the Tesseract and Pym particles were there. Stark begins to set up a date as April 7, 1970, before Rogers entrusted Lang to bring the scepter to 2023. When Lang told them that if they failed, there wouldn't be a way to come back home, Stark dismissed him and began to suit up, leading the pair to travel further back in time to the date that was settled and take the Tesseract that was in possession of S.H.I.E.L.D. Arriving in 1970 New Jersey, Rogers and Stark infiltrated Camp Lahai, where they discovered a doorway holding information in plain sight. Once Stark looked at the doorway closely, he examined the inner walls with his sunglasses, knowing that they could follow them around using the elevator. Stark and Rogers then took the elevator route while a shield worker looked over to them suspiciously. Once Stark told Rogers good luck after arriving at the floor, he managed to look inside a facility where the Tesseract had been held through his lenses and eventually found it near a vault. Stark then burned the ridges of the lock and began to capture the Tesseract and put it in a briefcase that he had stolen. However, in the attempt, Stark ran into the 1970 version of his father, who was looking for Arnim Zola. Once Howard started asking questions, Stark told him that he was a visitor from MIT, covering up his identity as Howard Potts. Despite Stark's success in stealing the Space Stone, Howard engaged his alternate son in conversation, leading them to take it outside. While Rogers worked to obtain more Pym particles from the 1970 version of Hank Pym, Stark talked to his alternate father about the flowers he was carrying, being told that Howard's wife is expecting a gift from him after working so long and that a kid is coming along. Howard asked his alternate son if he was nervous when his kid was born, responding that he was in fact. As Howard followed up with further questions, Stark told his alternate father that he just raised the kid the way he learned from his father, as they share their experiences from childhood. Stark then went on to talk about what he had learned from his father, telling him that no amount of money had bought a second of time. As they both reconciled each other's fatherhood, Stark noticed Rogers by the base and noticed that he had the Tesseract locked up in a briefcase. With his alternate father ready to leave, Stark told him that it was great to meet him before hugging him, much to Howard's confusion. Stark clarified to thank him for what he had done for his country and proceeded to leave the camp, finally getting to reconcile with his alternate father. With the tools to get back home, Stark and Rogers traveled back to 2023. Death of Natasha Romanoff The entire team of Avengers had escaped from the past and had each retrieved their individual Infinity Stones. Once Stark had arrived back from 1970, Hulk made a brief statement on making sure everybody had all of the stones. Upon arriving in the present, however, Stark learned that Natasha Romanoff had sacrificed herself on Vormir in 2014 so that Hawkeye could obtain the Soul Stone. Stark, along with the rest of the Avengers, took a moment of silence once Barton had told the rest of Romanoff's death. After the team mourned Romanoff, they headed down by the lake and Stark asked Rogers if Romanoff had any family. Rogers told him that the Avengers were the only family she had ever had. Despite the team's assurance, Thor was in denial that Romanoff was fully gone, leading Stark to tell him that he just asked a question. Stark witnessed Thor ranting about getting her back using the Infinity Stones. However, Barton argued against him, considering that the sacrifice could not be undone. While Hulk was listening, he angrily threw a bench. Stark listened as Hulk said they could not let Romanoff's sacrifice be in vain before proceeding with their plan to use the stones to bring back the victims of the snap. 
Assembling the Infinity Stones With help from Rocket Raccoon and Hulk, Stark forged the Nano Gauntlet, capable of harnessing the power of the six Infinity Stones. Once Stark precisely moved all of the Infinity Stones with his holographic tech and successfully finished putting them on the Nano Gauntlet, he was glad to be finished before Rocket Raccoon startled him. After setting the gauntlet down on a table, Stark noticed that Thor volunteered to bring everyone back from the dead, only to be stopped in his tracks. While Thor had to explain to the team that he felt responsible to save the universe, Stark understood his reasoning, but noted that Thor was in no critical condition. Hulk then volunteered to wield the gauntlet, noting what Thanos did with the Infinity Stones, which almost killed him and that none of them could survive. It was decided that Hulk would be the one to wield it, and Stark specified that Hulk bring back the victims of the snap to their present and not change anything else, fearing that his daughter would no longer exist. After Stark told Friday to lock down the Avengers compound, he watched Hulk put on the Nano Gauntlet and initially struggled to wield the Infinity Stones, while the version of Nebula from 2014 modified the Quantum Tunnel to allow 2014 Thanos and his forces to arrive in 2023. Despite the immense pain that he suffered due to his use of the stone's raw energy, Hulk was then able to snap his fingers, but fell to the ground unconscious shortly after doing so. Stark used his suit to cool down Hulk's scorched arm as Ant-Man saw several birds suddenly appear out of nowhere, while Barton received a call from his wife, who had initially perished in the snap, indicating that Hulk was successful in reversing the snap. Despite their victory, however, the Avengers were unable to celebrate as 2014 Thanos' ship, the Sanctuary 2, arrived in 2023 and opened fire on the Avengers seconds later, burying the Avengers' compound in rubble and leading War Machine, Hulk, Barton, and Lang to be trapped inside, while Stark, Rogers, and Thor stayed on top. Once Stark survived the rubble, he walked toward Rogers' unconscious body on the ground and woke him up, giving him back his shield. As Rogers questioned the situation, Stark grimly commented that messing with something like time had a strong chance to cause backlash. Thanos Offensive After the snap was undone, Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor discovered that Thanos from the alternate 2014 was fully aware of his planned success in his fate and had arrived on Earth. Stark asked Thor what Thanos had been doing, to which the response was that he had been doing nothing. As Rogers asked Stark where the Infinity Stones were, he noted that they were underneath the rubble. Thor told the group that his arrival could be a trap, but Stark admitted that he couldn't care less. After Thor understood their agreement, Thor summoned his armor and wielded both Stormbreaker and Mjolnir, while Captain America and Stark confronted Thanos, who was sitting and waiting for them. As the three walked over to confront Thanos, Stark listened to his lecture about how they could not live with their failure and realize that there are those who remember what was, who are unable to accept what can be, and much to Stark's agreement, he gloated on their stubbornness to Thanos. Thanos, having seen the files from Nebula's memory and now believing that the universe would be ungrateful for him correcting it, had decided on a new plan to decimate the entire universe and start over with no one remembering the massacre. Stark watched with fury as the Mad Titan proclaimed his new goals, knowing that his universe would be born out of blood before Thanos threatened to kill him and the team. The four engaged in a fight, having Iron Man equip his hidden blade from his hand and started blasting Thanos with his repulsors. Iron Man then used his extra repulsors from his back and told Thor to blast his lightning from behind in order to increase the amount of firepower. As Thor began to charge up his lightning powers, Stark was immediately blasted with huge amounts of energy that powered up his suit, aiming at Thanos for an attack. Thanos blocked Iron Man's beams with his double-edged sword, and as he grew closer, broke out of the laser. Thanos used this opportunity to grab Iron Man with both of his hands, only to witness Thor using Stormbreaker to hit Mjolnir, which he then used Iron Man as a human shield to knock him down and threw him across the field. After he rolled on the ground, Iron Man was hit by a nearby pile of rubble which put him in an unconscious state, removing him from the fight from then on. The other Avengers had to fight Thanos without Stark, leading to one of them getting beaten relentlessly. While Captain America tried to fight Thanos with all of his might, Thanos eventually gained the upper hand and called out his entire army to the ground, such as the Black Order, Chitari, and the Outriders. Captain America stood up against Thanos' giant army alone until Doctor Strange arrived with reinforcements to battle Thanos' army. Stark then woke up from his concussion and witnessed his allies coming back from the dead, including Pepper Potts in her iron suit. Battle of Earth with the rest of the Avengers in place with all of their allies the other worlds had gathered around to battle Thanos' army, 
Iron Man dropped down to line up with them as they all began to prepare for battle. Stark landed nearby his teammates and noticed Captain America holding Mjolnir, assembling the team to fight for their planet. The entire team and the other forces began to charge, running toward Thanos' forces as he sent the Black Order, Chitauri Army, Sakaran Army, and the Outriders to kill them all. Iron Man flew across the battlefield with his allies and began to use his Unibeam to attack any nearby threats. Iron Man then teamed up with Pepper Potts, who was donning her own iron armor, and fought alongside each other in aerial combat. While attacking the many Outriders that were trying to kill him from above, Iron Man landed on the ground and blasted many incoming Outriders with his laser beams. While successfully winning his fight, Iron Man was then attacked by Cole Obsidian, landing on a piece of rubble after getting knocked down. Iron Man tried to kill Obsidian with his repulsors, but was proven to be ineffective. Iron Man was then saved by Spider-Man, who pulled Obsidian down onto the ground with his web shooters, allowing Ant-Man to crush Obsidian to death. Stark removed his own helmet to catch his breath after being almost killed only for Parker to give him a hand while he was on the ground. Parker told Stark about himself being in space and was turned into dust moments before when he passed out. Parker further noted that Strange was there with him on Titan and began to wake him up to tell the rest that they needed him. Stark, who was happy to hear Parker again, silently told the boy to hold him and hugged him afterwards during the battle that was going on. Stark flew over to Doctor Strange, who was bringing down a group of Thanos' forces onto another dimension during the battlefield, and asked him whether this was the one in 14 million futures that they win. Strange told him that if Stark knew what needed to happen, it wouldn't happen. Much to his skepticism, Stark decided to keep being optimistic, and told Strange that he hoped that he was right about the outcome. Shortly after Thanos' airstrike on the battlefield, Captain Marvel destroyed the Sanctuary too, much to Stark's surprise. After recovering from the knockout, Stark turned to Strange, who, visibly shocked, signaled to him that this was the one timeline he foresaw where they won. Finally realizing why Strange sacrificed the Time Stone five years ago to save his life and what had to be done, Stark briefly grabbed Thanos' arm, clinging onto the Nano Gauntlet, but was knocked to one side. Thanos triumphantly declared himself inevitable before snapping his fingers once more. Self-Sacrifice Despite seemingly having won over the fight for the Nano Gauntlet, Nothing happened when Thanos snapped his fingers. Once Thanos looked over to Stark, he revealed to Thanos that he had transferred all six Infinity Stones to his Iron Man armor, much to Thanos' horror. Stark bonded all six Infinity Stones onto the knuckles of his hand and felt the energy surging into his body. Once he had all of the stones at his disposal, Stark looked over to Thanos again and replied to him by saying that he was Iron Man before taking a long, deep breath. After that was settled, Stark snapped his fingers in front of Thanos as he watched all of his surrounding troops and armies turn into dust, and accepting his inevitable defeat, sat down and crumbled into ash himself. Since he was merely a mortal man wielding the powers of the universe, the devastating force of the snap charred the right side of Stark's face and body. Stark collapsed among the debris of the Avengers' compound. The physical toll from the gamma radiation and the raw energy of the Infinity Stones was too much for him to endure. War Machine met up with Stark and discovered that he was seriously injured before Spider-Man came along. Parker tried to talk to Stark while he was slowly resting and beginning to feel pain. After being told that they won the battle, Parker was taken away by Rhodes, leading Pepper Potts to try to contact him. Stark softly uttered a greeting to Potts as his last words, having her ask Friday to check his vitals. Potts told Stark that he could rest now as he began to smile at her before he died. Holding Potts' hand, Stark looked over to his right leaving his arc reactor to lose its power. Once the Iron Man armor was turned off, Stark died in peace with his sacrifice, surrounded by Potts, War Machine, and Spider-Man, with Thor and Captain America looking onward, all devastated and honored by Stark's selfless act to save the universe. Upon seeing this, the Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Captain Marvel took a knee to honor the legacy of Stark and his righteous sacrifice. Funeral and Tributes Stark's sacrifice saved Earth, therefore ensuring the continued survival of all living creatures in the known universe. However, his death profoundly impacted his friends and family. Many of Stark's closest friends were most clearly affected, having witnessed Stark's death firsthand, as they had all had defining relationships with him. A week after his death, Stark's message to his wife and daughter, which he recorded prior to executing the time heist in the event of his death, was shown to them in the presence of Happy Hogan, James Rhodes, Steve Rogers, Bruce Banner, Thor, and Clint Barton, all of whom Stark considered close family. Stark's funeral was held at the Stark Eco Compound, where he was mourned by his family, the Avengers, 
Guardians of the Galaxy, Doctor Strange and Wong, the Van Dyne family, T'Challa and his sister in general, Nick Fury, Maria Hall, Thaddeus Ross, May Parker, Barton's family, and Harley Keener. Stark's original arc reactor, the one gifted to Potts as proof Tony Stark has a heart, was placed on a wreath which was set adrift on the lake. After the funeral, Hogan asked Morgan if she was hungry, to which she answered she wanted a cheeseburger. Remembering Stark's first request upon his return to the United States from Afghanistan, Hogan promised to take care of Morgan in her father's absence by giving her all the cheeseburgers she wanted. Worldwide Impact The worldwide impact and outpouring of grief over Tony Stark's death was massive. Across the world, Stark's memory and legacy that he left behind as an Avenger was memorialized, notably in various forms of artwork, media, and merchandising. Murals commemorating Stark were found in cities such as New York, Venice, and Prague. One such tribute was A Heart of Iron, The Tony Stark Story, a biographical film about Stark and his legacy made shortly after his death. In particular, the void that Stark left as the world's most renowned superhero led to speculation as to who would succeed him, which Quentin Beck had sought to exploit. Peter Parker, Stark's protege, did his best to live up to his mentor's reputation, although Happy Hogan stated that no one, not even Stark himself, could live up to his name. Stark's necessary arrangements to anoint Spider-Man as part of his legacy were accomplished a year after his death, when his glasses, outfitted with Edith, which stood for Even Dead I'm the Hero, and AI, allowed Parker complete control of Stark Industries' weapons, drones, inventions, and the ability to hack any electronic device. Nick Fury, who had decided to take a vacation, instructed Talos to impersonate him and deliver the glasses to Parker. After Parker's identity as Spider-Man was revealed to the world, one of the articles to be released during this time mocked the idea that he could live up to Stark, dubbing him Iron Man Jr. Although Matt Murdock was able to get the legal charges against the teenager dropped, Parker's reputation was ruined, with the public split into pro-Spider-Man and anti-Spider-Man groups. Murdock also noted that Hogan was eager to defend Stark's legacy, but warned him that he would need a lawyer amid an investigation into missing Stark technology. Did you enjoy our video? Be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.